On a bright sunny day, an expensive car is quickly rushing to its destination along the street. A middle-aged man throws himself under a car, feigning a leg injury and screaming loudly. The car slams on the brakes and stops in front of a man screaming that he was almost killed, after which the driver opens the window and tells the man that he didn't even hit him. The passenger window of the car rolls down and a sickly young man named Hank Daly takes a close look at the man lying on the ground. The man mentally tells himself that he has won the jackpot, because in front of him is the youngest gentleman of the Hong family, who has incredible wealth and is in very poor health, and tells him that it will cost at least 100,000 yuan to treat his leg. Hank asks his driver to give the simulator 100,000, and he, without hesitation, hands the man a suitcase, which makes the man very surprised at how easy it was for him to get the money out. The man thanks Hank, bowing cordially in front of the stationary car. However, in his mind, the man considers Hank a fool and a fool, promising to rob him again using the same method next time, thus earning himself a fortune. The swindler's thoughts are interrupted by Hank, who notices that everything is fine with his leg. He says that the man apparently does not understand the situation, because although he likes to spend money, he prefers to spend it through fair transactions, which means he will have to fulfill his part of the deal and get injured. The man's face crosses with fear and he asks Hank what he means by these words. Instead of answering, Hank's driver takes out a bat and maims the crook by hitting his leg with force. The driver gets into the car and drives away, leaving the crippled crook lying on the ground. Driver asks Hank if it was worth the hundred thousand, adding that even though it is an out-of-pocket expense, Hank should find an economist to invest in since he spends too much money every day. Hank tells the driver that he agrees with his thoughts, after which he briefly becomes lost in his thoughts. He explains that his body is very sick and weak, incapable of even normal walking without a crutch, but recently he has become connected to a special system of extravagance that charges his body with energy by spending money. He adds that he needs to invest his parents' money into something profitable to rebuild his body stronger, but all his attempts have ended in failure. He tried to invest in a rental business, but the owner ran away with his money, and also to buy patents for inventions, but they did not bring him anything. Hank asks the driver to take him home, adding that some important guest is about to arrive at their house. Arriving home, Hank encounters a man and a girl sitting next to his parents, and his father introduces them as an old family friend and his daughter from the Tang family. Hank listens carefully to his father's story about how in the past their grandfathers solved business problems together face to face and turns his gaze to the girl. The daughter of a family friend turns out to be a beautiful young woman shyly looking around. Hank's mom introduces the young girl as Betty and says that from now on she is his bride. Hank asks his mother in surprise whether she is serious about this, to which she replies that Hank's grandfather, along with Grandpa Tang, arranged this engagement for Hank and Betty. Hank's mom adds that he and Betty will be fine and can have a good baby for the Dolly family, confusing Betty. Hank pauses, trying to comprehend the fact that he now suddenly has a fiancé. Betty examines Hank, mentally commenting that he looks relatively healthy and hopes that he won't die so soon after their engagement. Ten minutes ago, sitting in the car with her father, she told him that she did not want to marry Hank Daly, explaining that she had never seen him, and also that, according to rumors, he was in extremely poor health and did nothing but wastes money. Betty's father answered her that their family is now in a bad situation, and he cannot fix it in any way, adding that the Dolly family is very strong and only they can help them. Betty says her father is using her like a commodity, asking her what she will do if her betrothed dies soon. Betty's father replies that he has a plan and will call off the engagement as soon as their financial problem is resolved. Betty tells herself that she has to pretend for the sake of her family and for the sake of her father, adding that she can somehow handle this guy. She lowers her gaze, expressing confidence that she can fool this simpleton with her charm. Hank tells his mother that he is not interested in Betty, after which he asks her for some money for investment, thinking that the investment might not pay off, but spending on a woman is generally pointless. Betty is annoyed that Hank publicly humiliated her and tells herself that she is not at all interested in him either. With these words, she gets up from the couch and politely addresses Hank's mother, saying that since the young master is not interested in her, then she should go home, thanking her for her hospitality. 
Hank and Betty's father grins and asks the young people not to make hasty conclusions. Hank's mom tells Hank with a sincere smile that she really likes Betty, adding that if he doesn't marry her, he won't get a penny from her. Hank, after thinking a little, agrees, reflecting that Betty is not as simple as she seems, since she began to seduce him from the moment they met. Betty reflects that despite the fact that she doesn't know much about psychology, this knowledge was enough to force Hank's mother to put pressure on him. Mom tells Hank that in this case the issue is closed and gives him 300,000 yuan, saying that he would buy a gift for his fiancé with this money. A young couple gets into the car and remains awkwardly silent while the driver takes them to their desired location in the city. Hank contemplates punishing Betty for using his mother and decides to buy her the most expensive piece of jewelry and see her reaction. The couple arrives at the market where lively trade is in full swing and loud cries of sellers can be heard inviting buyers. Turning to Betty, the main character tells her that she can choose any gift she wants. Betty smiles sarcastically at Hank and says that she will definitely follow his recommendation, calling him master. After some time, she selects a modest gemstone, priced at 300 yuan, and tells Hank that she wants to buy it. Hank is surprised that she chose such a trifle and mentally tells himself that his bride is some kind of utter fool. He buys the stone that Betty chose and asks her where she intends to go now, to which she replies that they need to get to the jade store. Once at the jade store, Hank realizes that Betty gave the stone to the store owner for an appraisal and wonders what she is thinking, since, in his opinion, this broken stone cannot be something valuable. Taking a closer look at the stone, the merchant says in amazement that it is an incredible treasure and offers her a price of three million yuan, begging Betty to sell it. Hank freezes in place in amazement, and Betty triumphantly tells the jeweler that she accepts his offer. Hank thinks about how some 300 yuan pebble could turn out to be a real treasure that ultimately brought such a large income. Betty asks Hank what is on his mind, adding that she is very pleased with his gift. Hank realizes that his companion is incredibly good at making money out of thin air, which means she can help him. He tries to catch up with his betrothed and asks her to teach him her skills. He addresses Betty as his wife, to which she asks not to call her that adding that Hank said an hour ago that he is not interested in her. Hank apologizes to Betty, saying it was just a joke and offers her a deal where he will buy anything she can make a profit from. Hank says that he doesn't have the brains to make money, unlike Betty, so he's ready to buy everything that she considers promising, adding that the only condition is that he will pay for everything. Betty tells Hank that she doesn't quite understand him, but adds that she doesn't really care, but suddenly a noise nearby catches her attention. Turning towards the noise, our heroes see the hotel manager pushing ordinary residents away from the passage and asking them to go somewhere far away. The townspeople ask the manager what the hell he is doing, adding that they just came to look at the hotel, which is famous for its positive reviews. The manager tells the workers that they should know their place, since they earn mere pennies and are also dirty workers, so they can scare away the visitors of their three-star hotel after which he invites them to go to a restaurant in the opposite direction. The workers get up and leave, saying that the manager is being too arrogant, to which the manager asks them to never come back. The townspeople approach the restaurant and decide to let go of this situation and just relax in a cozy place. Approaching the restaurant, they ask the hostess to prepare something tasty for them and ask if they serve some beer. The owner replies that, unfortunately, the restaurant is officially closing as of this day, and the saddened workers ask her why this happened. The owner says that the reason for this is the three-star hotel opposite, which buys all the best products for itself, which is why her small restaurant is out of business. The workers are annoyed and say that now the reason for the arrogance of the staff of that hotel has become clear to them and they want them to go bankrupt. But they are aware that this is impossible, since business in that hotel is only going uphill. Suddenly, Hank's voice is heard behind them, who says that bankrupting this hotel is not an impossible task. Hank asks the surprised restaurant owner how much her establishment is worth, saying that he would like to buy it. The owner tells Hank that this place is already doomed and he is unlikely to earn anything, but if he really wants it, she will sell it for one million. Hank gives the owner three million, saying that one million will go towards buying the restaurant itself, the second million will go towards hiring expensive staff, 
and the rest should be spent on purchasing food for the next 10 days, where all food will be free. The hostess asks Hank in surprise about the last condition, to which he replies that everyone will be able to fill their stomach and eat as much as they want for 10 days. The landlady and the townspeople are delighted with Hank's enthusiasm and decide to call all their friends and relatives to ensure as many visitors as possible. Betty looks at Hank in surprise, telling him that she offered to buy the restaurant, but not make it free, to which he replies that he is very wasteful, so if he still loses money, he might lose a little more. These words surprise Betty, and she wonders what Hank is really planning to do. Three days later, an incredible crowd of people gathers at the small restaurant, eager to get inside. There are shouts from the crowd that it is better to stand in line for several hours here, rather than go to that three-star hotel where the managers are complete idiots. Meanwhile, at the three-star hotel, the boss tells off the manager, ordering him to go outside and beg people to come in for lunch, adding that if he brings less than three people in today, he can pack his things and leave. After some time, a moonlit night comes and Hank decides to retire to his room in his family's villa. He begins the meditation by initiating a body scan by the wasteful system. After looking at his status window, he decides to check the increases in his performance after such a productive day. Noting that all indicators have increased by 40 units in total, he admits that he has never experienced such growth, believing that at this rate he will be able to quickly return to normal life. The servants knock on Hank's door and he asks what they need, to which they answer that Mrs. Betty is waiting for him downstairs. Having gone down to his betrothed, he affectionately addresses her, calling her little wife and asking why she wanted to see him. Betty again asks not to call her that, saying that she is going to school and asks Hank if he will go with her. Hank asks Betty why he needs to go to school, to which she looks at him in surprise, asking if she is the only one who remembers that he used to go there before his health problems appeared. Hank, after thinking a little, replies that he agrees to go to school, remembering that he did not quit going to school because of illness. Betty gets up and leaves, saying that she is going home, adding that the desserts were very tasty, and Hank notes that his future wife has a great body. Betty turns around and wishes Hank good night, and he promises himself that he will definitely restore his body for the sake of such a wonderful girl. The next day, Hank, dressed in a school uniform, arrives at school with his future wife. People around them look at them and gossip that they don't believe that such a beauty like Betty Tang is hanging out with such an idiot as Hank Daly. Suddenly, our hero's path is blocked by a bully, who says in surprise that stupid Hank really came to school after such a long absence. A bully named Michael glares at Hank, and his accomplices say that everyone knows that he likes Betty, adding that Hank has the audacity to come to school with her, crossing all boundaries. Hank asks Betty who this big guy is, to which she replies that he is an enemy of the family, being the eldest son of the Leah family. Michael looks menacingly at Betty, ordering her to come to him, adding that he has been waiting for her for a long time. However, Hank calmly stands in front of Betty, blocking Michael's path, further angering him. Michael angrily asks Hank if he is looking for another fight and throws his fists at him, preparing to beat the main character. Hank notes that Michael moves at incredible speed, and just yesterday he would not have been able to evade, but today everything will be different. With that, Hank easily dodges Michael's attack, only causing him to cut through the air with his punch. At the same time as he dodges, Hank hits Michael on the legs with his cane and he flies into the trash can, unable to control the inertia of his own body. Michael's accomplices immediately fly up to their leader and struggle to pull him out by grabbing his legs. Everyone notices Michael's shame and begins to discuss how pathetic Michael looks and how cool Hank is acting. Michael grabs Hank by the collar and pulls him towards him, threateningly asking him how he dares behave like this to him. However, Hank drops his cane and theatrically falls to the ground, starting to scream desperately, astonishing Michael. Betty holds Hank down and yells at Michael, asking him what the hell he's doing, calling him crazy, and adding that Hank has a weak body, to which Michael replies that he didn't do anything, and Hank was just pretending. Hank continues to put on a mask of theatrical despair and pain, but mentally notes that he is very surprised that Betty stood up for him. Other students begin to whisper that although Hank is a fool, his family is very influential, and if something happens to Hank, they will throw Michael's family out onto the street. Realizing that his affairs are bad, 
Michael quickly bows down to Hank and asks him how he is feeling, after which he offers to take him to the hospital. Moving a little closer to Hank, Michael whispers to him that he can clearly see that Hank is faking, but he will let it go just this once, and then he will repay him in kind. Hank painfully tells Betty that Michael continues to threaten him, and she says that she will call the teacher to investigate further. Michael immediately becomes submissive and gets on his knees, begging Betty not to do this, telling her that he will do anything to spare his life. He takes 500,000 yuan out of his pocket and tells Hank that he would take it for treatment, adding that he will also pay him moral compensation. With these words, he storms off, telling himself in a rage that he has never experienced greater shame in his life until that day. Hank happily says that it was the most unexpected 500,000 yuan in his life, and Betty asks him if he is okay. Hank asks Betty why she was worried about him, despite the fact that she understood that he was faking, to which Betty, blushing, replies that she was afraid that something bad would happen to him and her father would blame her for it. Standing up, she adds that she is still very grateful to Hank for standing up for her with Michael. Hank affectionately tells his fiance that it is his responsibility as a future husband. Blushing again at Hank's words, Betty quietly calls him shameless and helps him up, heading to school. After school, Betty and Hank get into the car and Betty asks the main character where they are going today. Hank replies that they made a lot of money by investing in that restaurant and suggests they go there where they can spend the money. Betty says that Hank is indeed a spendthrift, telling him that he won't make any money by constantly spending money, adding that sometimes to make a profit you need to calm down and not look for good deals yourself, but just wait a little. Hank looks questioningly at his fiance and asks her how such a move could work. Suddenly he notices something terrible and asks the driver to stop the car immediately. Getting out of the car, he sees a girl standing on the bridge who is obviously going to commit suicide and shouts at her that she should not do this and tell her about what happened to her. The girl standing on the bridge does not hear the heroes and only quietly sings a melancholic song looking at the setting sun. Hank and Betty begin to scream louder and the girl turns her head in their direction, looking at them with tear-stained eyes. After some time, Betty and Hank persuade the girl to come down and the main character asks her to tell her what happened, offering to help. Without waiting for an answer, he assumes that the culprit is probably some man and an unhappy love, to which Betty immediately aggressively replies that now is not the best time to talk nonsense. The girl says that everything is fine, thanking Betty and Hank for their kindness, sadly concluding that they nevertheless cannot help her since she offended the person who drove her into a desperate situation. Betty says that this man is probably a notorious bastard since he almost brought the girl to such an act and asks her who it is, adding that they will definitely deal with him, to which the girl replies doomedly that they would only make him angry. Betty says that they can't pass by without helping the girl in tears and points at Hank, saying that this cripple may not have the ability to do anything serious, but he can at least piss him off. The girl says that her name is Isabel, and she is just a young unknown singer and the founder of a music group called Chasing Girls with two other singers. Betty and Hank are very surprised to hear that in front of them is not an ordinary girl but a pop singer. Isabel continues the story, saying that she simply quarreled with her boss, and the three of them were pushed into the background, so even after two years, no one saw the songs they wrote. Isabel adds that because of the contract and the impossibility of terminating it, they cannot just pick up and leave, so they are forced to simply endure this attitude and sink to the financial bottom, after which Hank notices Betty's attentive gaze and asks her why she is like this looks at him. Betty asks Hank if he has any ideas, to which he replies that he will definitely help Isabel, but does not yet know how. Betty approaches him and quietly says that she has an idea, but she is not yet sure whether it will work and Hank says that he is listening to her carefully. After some time of explanation, Hank remarks out loud that Betty smells incredibly good, to which Betty, blushing again, angrily asks him if he had been listening to her all this time. Hank replies that he listened to everything and tells Isabel that he can pay for her mother's treatment, but with one condition, which is that she and her team sing in a large stadium, which he is going to rent in three days, to which Isabel replies that she will definitely bring her group, and they will do everything in the best possible way. Three days later, at the appointed time, a concert of the group chasing girls begins in a luxuriously equipped stadium. 
A huge number of spectators come to the stadium who joyfully shout about their love for the members of this group. Our heroes take their seats and Betty asks Hank if these people around are real spectators, to which Hank replies that these are people who owe money and now they have come here to work off their debts, creating an atmosphere. Hank asks Betty if she likes being here, to which she replies that she doesn't really like noise since she has been quiet all her life. Meanwhile, the girls are finishing the final preparations for the concert and telling each other that this is their first live performance, which means they must give it their all. Having said that today they will show what kind of stuff the group Chasing Girls is made of, the girls begin the concert, igniting the crowd with their music and vocals. Spectators note that they used to buy studio recordings of songs by other artists, but they like this concert much more. People around are also interested in what is happening and begin to flock to the entrance, noticing that admission to the concert is free. Everyone, without exception, notes that this group is very good, asking for its name and inviting their friends to the concert. The next day, even more people come to the band's repeat concert, filling the entire stadium to capacity. Charged with the energy of the group, Betty, who previously claimed that she was a quiet person, begins to sing along along with the rest of the audience, pleasantly surprising Hank. A few days later at a music company meeting, Isabel discusses how much attention the group has attracted. The studio boss listens irritably to these reports and tells his assistant to call the right people and bring them to him. In the evening, when Isabel's group finish their next concert, they joyfully greet them backstage. They simultaneously bow to the heroes in gratitude, to which Betty says that this is unnecessary, adding that she is now their fan. Hank adds that they are now so popular on the internet that they will be considered superstars when they return to the company, and Betty says that they no longer have to worry about getting kicked out or being left behind. The girls admit that they do not have the slightest desire to return to the company, expressing confidence that the boss will continue to bully them. Isabel asks Hank if he can help them one more time, adding that they want to join their company as singers, but Hank sadly replies that his company is not in the entertainment industry. Betty says that the issue with the entertainment industry can be solved by buying a place, but in her opinion, the main problem will be Isabel's current contract and the cost of terminating it. Isabel says that the price for terminating the contract is 30 million yuan. Hank understands that with such expenses, he can get a lot of system experience points, but this is such a large amount that he couldn't even ask his parents, so all he can do is sell the restaurant. The next morning, Hank and his fiancée arrive at the hotel to carefully consider their future options. Betty asks Hank if he really wants to sell this restaurant to a three-star, to which he replies that he doesn't care how much money he makes from it, since he still won't be able to bring in more money than this group, adding that the hotel has been suffering losses for a long time, and the purchase of such a restaurant could bring them back into operation. The hotel owner is angrily surprised that Hank wants to sell them this restaurant, adding that because of him and this restaurant they almost went bankrupt, and investors withdrew their investments, after which he says that they do not have the money to buy the restaurant, but if Hank pays them three million, he can buy this hotel. After some time, Hank sits in the manager's chair and says that he did not expect that while trying to sell the restaurant, he would somehow acquire the hotel, to which Betty says that Hank bought it without even thinking. Their discussion is interrupted by a girl who greets Hank, calling him boss, and Hank asks her who she is. The girl introduces herself as Luo, saying that she is the hotel's secretary, adding that he is now her boss, and she will report to him about the financial situation of the establishment. After studying the reports, Hank realizes that this establishment has already lost 50 million, after which he says that now it became clear to him why he spent so little on it. Betty leaves in a huff and Hank asks her what she thinks about this, but she only asks him not to ask her about such things now. In the evening, Hank locks himself in his room again, starting the spendthrift system. Hank reflects that even though they didn't have much luck today, he still spent a lot of money to get enough points. Thanks to today's spending, the system increases all of Hank's indicators by 7, raising his level to level 2. The system also notifies Hank that he can now transfer his soul into the body of a small animal weighing up to 20 kilograms and control it. Hank is surprised that this system has such amazing abilities and decides to try it out right now. Hank wonders if there is an animal in this house that he can inhabit and decides on his mother's cat. 
having established control over the animal and realizing that he can really control it and see through its eyes. Looking around, he notices that Betty is approaching him and decides to check how she behaves. Betty approaches the cat and unsuspectingly begins to affectionately stroke his head. Hank enjoys the sensations, admitting to himself that before he didn't particularly like cats. However, having looked at his charming bride from a new angle, he adds that perhaps now he will reconsider his position on this matter. A few days later, Luo comes to Hank, sitting in the newly acquired hotel, and says that he has received an invitation. She adds that the sender is the director of the girl group Isabel, to which Hank says that it will not be so easy to convince him to spend 30 million. Luo tactfully adds that their hotel has lost popularity among guests, but they continue to operate in the red. Betty says that she used to not care about the stability and profit of this hotel, but recently she realized how much they spent it, and asks Hank if he has enough money to compensate the group. Hank irritably argues that this group is already on everyone's lips and most likely will be able to lead the entertainment industry, but they were hidden by a scumbag director whom no one can contact. Betty notes that their popularity, however, has plummeted and all articles involving them have been suppressed, adding that she feels like they were banned from joining. Hank says that since their boss is so dismissive of this group, he will take them under his wing himself, adding that he will definitely achieve this. However, from Hank's point of view, he still has no idea how to win the negotiations. Betty tells Hank that there are many different ways to negotiate. Hank looks at her questioningly, and she explains that you can simply find dirt on your opponent. Evening comes and Hank decides to visit a company that prohibits Isabel's group from conducting public activities. The driver takes Sam to the entrance and asks him why he thought it would be a good idea to break into someone else's basement late at night additionally wondering why he brought his mother's cat with him. Hank replies that it will be difficult for him to explain this right now, and asks him not to be distracted and wait here for a while, to which he calmly replies that his word is law to him. Hank concentrates, creating a mental connection with his cat, taking control of him. Having become accustomed to the cat's body, Hank jumps out of the car window and lands softly on his paws. He remembers Betty's words that all people have some dirty secrets, so if Hank can find him, then the negotiations will be much easier. Hank reasons that the cat's body will allow him to get into the director's office, adding that he'll be surprised if he doesn't find anything. From his point of view, thanks to this form, he will be able to penetrate into places where an ordinary person would never be able to go. However, the first obstacle on his way is the weight of the cat, which can hardly crawl through the windows. However, after trying hard, Hank manages to overcome the barrier and enters a dark corridor. Thanks to his cat's night vision, Hank easily finds his way around and decides it's time to find the director's office. After some time of persistent searching, Hank discovers that the director's office is on the floor above. Jumping, Hank successfully hits the elevator call button with his soft paw. Having reached the desired floor, the main character continues to carefully explore the dark corridors of the company. After a while, Hank successfully finds the desired office and looks around for guards. After making sure that no one is around, Hank notices that the front door to the office is unlocked. Carefully approaching the slightly open door, Hank looks into the office, discovering that the inside is empty. The main character goes into the office, rejoicing at his unprecedented luck. Jumping onto the office desk, Hank is surprised that no one is guarding the boss's office, after looking around, Hank finds the main computer and is already looking forward to a quick victory. Finding the computer's power button, Hank presses it with a soft paw. However, unfortunately, the computer turns out to be securely protected with a password. Hank desperately asks himself how he will find dirt on his boss without a password, believing that most likely this plan is doomed to failure. However, suddenly, thanks to the cat's keen hearing, he hears a very strange sound. Hank realizes that this strange sound came from the office, since the cat's ears and eyes still belong to him. Hank concludes that for some reason there are still people in the office at night. Deciding to scout out the situation, Hank carefully jumps off the computer desk. Approaching the source of the sound, Hank begins to distinguish from this noise a female voice, languidly asking someone to stop touching her. Coming closer, Hank notices that late at night the director of the company decided to have fun with his subordinate. Hank thanks the cat for his incredible luck and chooses the most suitable position to conduct surveillance without being noticed. 
Having chosen a position, Hank remotely activates the camera mounted in the collar. The next morning, Hank gives Luo a flash drive with a video recording, asking him to give this video to the director with the words that he would break the contract with Isabel's group. Otherwise, everyone will see this video, adding that now they can win the negotiations without paying a penny. Betty asks Hank what kind of video there might be, since it will allow him to negotiate with the director without paying a penny, to which Hank replies that there is a very exciting video there. Betty asks Hank what the video is, adding that she is very interested, to which the main character replies that he will tell her about it if she calls him her hubby. Betty turns away embarrassedly, saying that if this information is secret, then she will not pry it out. Hank decides not to torment his betrothed, telling her that the videotape contains evidence of intimacy between the director and the wife of his brother, who is a more influential person in the industry than the director of the company. Betty asks Hank in surprise how he found out about this, to which he replies that he has his own methods. After some time, the director of the company becomes incredibly furious at the incriminating evidence he saw. The director is interrogated by the head of security, asking him how they were able to miss such an event, to which the guard replies that they checked the surveillance cameras and did not record anyone except an ordinary cat. The director asks the head of security whether he really wants to say that a cat entered the office and tried to turn on the office computer, and at the same time filmed it, adding that cats are not capable of such abomination. He orders his subordinate to burn the contract of Isabel's group, adding that they would go to hell. He also asks his subordinate to find the one who decided to blackmail him, threateningly declaring that this is not the end. This evening at the opening of the Three Star Hotel, the most beautiful fireworks begin to be launched in anticipation of the concert of Isabel's group. The invited spectators tell each other that they did not know that the group Chasing Girls would be performing at the opening, adding that they are very excited. After some time, Isabel and her partners take the stage, causing thunderous applause and applause. Isabel says that they will have a mini-concert today, adding that they will not regret coming. Hank approaches the balcony and watches with interest what is happening from afar. Betty approaches Hank and hears everyone in the crowd saying that they are not particularly interested in the hotel, and they only came to look at Isabel and her group. Betty tells her betrothed that his idea is not very effective in saving the situation, since this hotel has completely lost its reputation. Hank asks Betty what could be difficult about restoring the good name of his hotel and calls his secretary Luo. Luo asks Hank what he wants to offer, to which Hank says that the hotel should throw a three-day banquet for the guests at their expense. Betty notices that Hank is spending money again, adding that this is a three-star hotel so groceries won't be cheap. Hank replies that he just likes to spend money, adding that a banquet doesn't necessarily require high-quality food. Meanwhile, the audience begins to wonder where Isabel and her band have gone, asking when the concert will start. The host comes on stage and says that it is late and the audience is probably hungry, adding that as payment for today's enthusiasm, all guests are invited to a three-day banquet located in the backyard, which will be held at the expense of the hotel. Guests are surprised by such generosity and say that some restaurants on this street also organized such a banquet, assuming that they had the same owner. Suddenly, several heavy figures appear behind the guests and order everyone to give them way. The strangers introduce themselves as the Fat Guo Brothers, saying that if a free three-day banquet is announced here, then they are obliged to come to it. Other guests say in horror that this hotel has come to an end, since these brothers have an incredibly brutal appetite and are very picky, and if they don't like the food, they can destroy everything here. The host calmly replies that they have no problems with such guests, adding that the hotel owner has provided for everything. He invites all the guests to the hotel, offering them a good meal before the next concerts, and the guests joyfully enter the hotel. Upon entering the hotel, guests are greatly surprised by what they see, briefly freezing in place. Guests will find that the main room is home to many small culinary tables where chefs serve delicious food. The presenter says that today they present the best dishes at the hotel's expense, cooked over an open fire, adding that guests have the opportunity to cook their own food. Guests approach the food, inspecting it with interest and saying that these things don't look much like barbecue. The fat Guo people say that they don't care, since they are terribly hungry and greedily stuff the dishes on the table into their mouths. Having tasted the dish thoroughly, 
The fat people say that it is an incredibly tasty delicacy, adding that it is as if they have returned to childhood. Guests, greatly impressed by the high rating from such gourmets, decide to try it too and begin to eagerly approach the tables. Hank, watching everything from the balcony, is happy to note that he finally managed to return the hotel to its former glory. Betty also decides to try the barbecue and notes that it is incredibly tasty, wondering where Hank got such knowledge of cooking. Hank mentally notes that life without barbecue is like life without a soul, so he couldn't help but offer such a great dish to the guests. In the evening of the same day, Hank again decides to check the status of his profile in the system and updates it. Thanks to the money spent, the characteristics of the main character increase even more, making him stronger. Hank's meditation is interrupted by a knock on the door, and Betty's voice answers his question about who came to him. Quickly draping the robe over his body, Hank unlocks the door, telling Betty she can come inside. Having opened the door slightly, he asks his betrothed what she might need at such a late hour. After carefully examining Hank, Betty confidently declares that he is not the real Hank Dolly, greatly surprising him. Betty says that Hank Dolly was a complete idiot, while the main character asks her who she thinks he is then. Betty comes closer to Hank and places her hand on his chest, saying that he is obviously a fake. With that, Betty presses down hard on Hank, causing him to fall onto the soft carpet. Betty sits on Hank and he asks her in surprise what she's up to. Betty says that everyone knows that Hank Daly is a stupid and sick-headed fool who invested money without thinking at all. But now, Hank has begun to calculate everything down to the smallest detail, concluding that for these reasons, she believes that Hank is fake. Hank says his dear wife was the one who told him what to invest in, adding that she was the one who told him to buy the restaurant, save the band, and allowed him to expand the hotel. Betty says that she only increased the capital invested, adding that this is not his merit at all. Noticing that Hank is reaching out to her, she intercepts it and continues to say that Hank himself made decisions about the purchase of certain assets. Hank adds that if she's going to spend more money, she might as well just call him, adding that he trusts her eyes more than his own. Betty looks at Hank carefully and stands up, saying that he can sing very sweetly. As she leaves, she says that they are going shopping tomorrow, and Hank quickly and confidently agrees with her. The next day, Hank and Betty go shopping, but due to the main character's residual health problems, they are forced to take a short break. Hank takes out the lunch he bought, saying that he is sorry that he cannot walk for so long, to which Betty replies that physical activity, on the contrary, will be useful for him. Hank offers Betty a hot sandwich, but she refuses, looking away. Hank decides not to get his betrothed and calmly stuffs the snack into his mouth. Suddenly, Betty takes his sandwich from Hank and walks away a few meters. Hank, upset, asks Betty what came over her, adding that he just wanted to get a little snack. Betty approaches the stray dog and gives the sandwich to her, saying that this baby probably hasn't eaten for a long time. Hank sadly tells Betty that he hasn't had time to eat another bite. He begins to think about where he can buy himself another sandwich when suddenly an expensive car stops next to them. A man gets out of the car and arrogantly asks Hank whether young Mr. Dolly really cares about food even for a poor dog. The man, accompanied by the girl, adds that if Hank likes food for dogs, then he will give them a couple of set meals for shaggy dogs. Hank contemptuously studies the man who has appeared out of nowhere, mentally noting that he doesn't like him at all. Noticing Betty sitting nearby, the man asks Hank if she is his fiance. The girl accompanying the man politely greets Betty, saying that she is very glad to meet you. The man says that Betty is a member of the Tang family and was supposed to marry Jonathan Daly, but has now switched to the younger one, adding that she is a cutie, albeit pitiful. With these words, he turns his gaze to his companion and says that she is still far from her, calling her cousin. The cousin ignores his greasy compliment telling Hank that a family meeting will be held in two months, asking him if he is ready, but the man does not allow him to answer, saying that Hank cannot be ready for anything, because he only deals with buying stuff. And even show up to the meeting without money, Hank decides that he has heard enough and carefully examines his companions. He asks them who they are in order to interrupt their meal, adding that he is seeing them for the first time in their lives. The man asks Hank what pills the doctor prescribed him since he couldn't recognize them, telling his cousin that he did it on purpose because he didn't want to say hello. Hank turns to his betrothed, 
asking her if she knows these people, to which she asks him in surprise why he doesn't remember his relatives. Hank sarcastically replies that he is not Hank Daly, so he cannot know them. The man replies that he will remind Hank about everything since he forgot about everything. He reveals that his father is Hank's father's fourth brother, and he is Hank's cousin, adding that he is the dream of a billion girls due to his unmatched beauty. He also introduces his companion, saying that she is a member of the Fenjong family named Lucy, adding that she is new to the world of business, and he accompanies her shopping to then feed her at a prestigious restaurant. Hank listens half-heartedly to his cousin's words, asking Lucy if he is being too clingy, adding that she seems very tired of him. Hank's cousin loses his temper and angrily tells him to mind his own business. Hank ignores his cousin and asks Lucy to tell him about the upcoming meeting, adding that due to his illness he was bedridden and his memory was slightly damaged. Lucy replies that the family meeting is held once a year, and its main task is to evaluate the achievements of family members for this year and the distribution of resources. She adds that at each meeting, three family members are chosen to give them the appropriate support and funds, and Hank becomes interested in this by asking how much money is given to the winner. Lucy replies that the most worthy is given one billion yuan. Betty and Hank are very surprised by what they hear, not believing that it is possible to get such large finances. Hank realizes that if this money is used for the spendthrift system, his level will skyrocket. Hank's cousin says that the main character wouldn't even think about it, since right now the cousin is developing in the entertainment industry, making incredible profits, adding that he recently bought out a food delivery company and hired a bunch of drivers to work for him all day and night, bringing him a net profit. Mentally calling his cousin a moron, Hank politely thanks his cousin, saying that now he knows what he needs to prepare for. Hank's cousin says that Hank might not even be getting ready because if he takes any place, it would be an incredible miracle, telling Lucy that it's time for them to get out of here. Approaching the dog, he kicks it, shouting and ordering it not to get in the way. The dog grins angrily at its offender and decides to take revenge on him for such impudence. She lunges at Cousin Hank and bites his thigh, tearing his expensive clothes with her teeth. The cousin runs away in tears, but the dog decides that her revenge has not been fully accomplished and sets off in pursuit of him. Hank, Betty, and Lucy watch everything that happens and conclude that he himself is to blame for what happened. After some time, Hank and Betty return and decide to take a walk in the garden of the city park. Hank enthusiastically says that a billion dollars as a reward sounds like a lot, and Betty asks him why he wants it so much. Hank looks questioningly at his fiancée and asks her what the big deal is. Betty replies that everyone dreams of getting a billion for free, however, in her opinion, there is a problem that Hank cannot solve, saying that last year Lucy took seventh place in this meeting, having made considerable efforts. Betty clarifies that Lucy invested her father's 20 million in startups, opening three five-star hotels, five private clubs, and 11 chain cinemas in just two years, generating over 90 million in revenue, and even then she only came in seventh place. Hank says it's incredible, lamenting that he only has a couple of restaurants, one hotel, and a band, so he'll have to give up even trying to get there. Hank says that they will have to forget about it since there are only two months left, suggesting that they go back to shopping. Suddenly a loud barking attracts their attention, dogs and people screaming. Turning around, our heroes notice how animal control officers are catching another stray dog with a net. Betty yells at the employees to stop and explain what the hell they are doing. The employee calmly tells her that they just received a report that stray dogs are biting people all over the place, so they were sent to investigate. He adds that they are sorry for the animals roaming the streets, but they cause a lot of trouble if they bite someone. Betty asks the employee where they are going to take the dogs after they catch them. The employee says that unfortunately there are no such shelters in their city, so they keep these dogs for a couple of weeks, hoping that someone will decide to shelter them. However, according to him, if this does not happen, then they quickly deal with the remaining dogs. Betty excitedly asks the employee what he means by these words, but quickly guesses herself. Turning towards the dogs locked in a cage and pitifully saying that she feels very sorry for them. She takes Hank's hand and asks him to help these poor animals, saying that it hurts her to watch it. Hank says that if he had not seen it in person, he would not have believed it. But when he saw how the poor animals were trembling right in front of them, doomed to die, he also could not leave it just like that. 
He asks Betty to provide everything to him, saying that he will pay for shelter for these homeless animals and provide them with a roof over their heads. Betty clings to Hank, saying that he did a great thing and lovingly praises him, to which Hank asks her in surprise why she reacts this way. Betty replies that she is happy that Hank is such a generous person. Hank accepts Betty's compliments with a little embarrassment, but decides not to mind and smiles contentedly. After some time, they find themselves in an unknown place, and Hank tells Betty that he has decided to buy this land for a shelter, since it has been ownerless for many years. Hank says that he spent ten million on this land and invites Betty to transform this vacant lot into a shelter. Hank notes that he again spent his earned money on this project, telling Betty that from a financial point of view, it is not the right decision. Betty says that he spent the money for good, adding that he did it at her request, to which Hank replies that if he managed to make her happy with the money, then he will consider this investment a success. Betty enthusiastically says that Hank spent a lot of money on buying a vacant lot just to please her, adding that he is an incredible person. Hank says that if he suddenly starts running out of money, he will certainly earn more, to which Betty replies that she willingly believes him. The young couple's flirtation is interrupted by Luo, who tells Hank that two people want to meet with him to discuss the price of collaborating with Isabel's group to create the soundtrack for the film. Hank turns around and listens to Luo's words with interest, sensing a lucrative deal approaching. Having finished their business, the main character and Luo go to Hank Dolly's hotel to conduct business negotiations. One of the negotiators eats barbecue from the hotel restaurant with great appetite. He says that this barbecue goes well with beer, wondering how Hank managed to come up with such a thing, adding that he had previously heard that Hank was a brainless spender. His partner says that there is nothing smart in this, since everything here depends on the artists who go to such restaurants, clarifying that the only thing they need here is to make a deal with Hank. The man tells him that he is right, adding that they will use it when they find a group to record the soundtrack, after which he says that he will reduce the price since Hank is a newbie and knows nothing about it. Their business conversation is interrupted by the creaking of doors, from which bright light from the chandeliers pours onto the men. Luo and Hank emerge from them and the secretary introduces the main character, apologizing for the delay. A man with glasses stands up and greets the heroes, introducing himself as Dong Shen, saying that he is the music director of the Peng Hang Film Company, after which he says that his partner is a famous director named Dean Harrison. Dean Harrison smiles sarcastically and says that he is very pleased to meet Hank and Luo. Having carefully examined Harrison with his eyes, Hank comes to the conclusion that he is definitely not a good person. He invites his guests to follow him and invites them into his office. Dong Shen says that they are currently preparing to film the film Wind Hunter, and the soundtrack from a popular girl group could create a sensation. He hands Hank the script for the film, saying that the most famous screenwriters have been working on it for three years. Hank studies the script carefully, carefully reading every line in it. After a while, he asks his guests about the film's expected box office receipts. Dean Harrison says expected collections are at least 1.5 billion yuan. Hank continues to study the script, asking them how much they want to buy the film's soundtrack for. Dong Shen says that their price is 500,000, adding that they can add 50,000 on top if Hank wants. Hank throws the script on the table and says he will consider their proposal, wishing them luck in their endeavor. Dong Shen asks Hank why they can't settle everything today, adding that a whopping 100 million yuan has already been invested in the film, which is the greatest investment in the history of the industry, and then asks Hank if he doesn't believe in his group. Hank replies that he is confident in his group, but doubts the success of their film, saying that they expect to earn one and a half billion from the box office with a dubious script, which means that investing in their film may be money down the drain. Dean Harrison tells Hank that he shouldn't look down on them and advises him to check the box office of their previous projects, adding that Chasing Girls is popular because of their songs and not Hank, who is a non-entity. Dong Shen asks Harrison to calm down, saying that they are here primarily for business negotiations. Hank says he's seen some of Harrison's films, but he couldn't finish any of them because they had poor plots and poor special effects and acting, so if his band recorded the soundtrack for their film then she may lose her popularity. Dong Shen says that Hank is behaving inappropriately since they came here for a business meeting, but after all that has been said, 
further negotiations become impossible. With these words, they leave, and Dean Harrison tells his comrade that Hank knows nothing at all about art and does not know how to praise worthy people. Luo tells Hank that Penhang Film is the most successful company at the moment and asks him if he is sure that he does not want to cooperate with them, to which Hank replies that they are too arrogant due to low competition, and if if such a film were released in his world, it would undoubtedly be considered terrible. Luo asks Hank what he means by his world, to which he replies that it is nothing and gives her a list of people, asking her to contact them, explaining that it contains old-fashioned movie stars, technicians and martial artists with unknowns to the public talents. Luo carefully examines the list and asks Hank what he plans to do with all these people. Hank replies that he decided to make his own film out of curiosity, so he needs a team. After some time, the scene shifts to the shooting of an unknown film. A man with theatrical tragedy asks a woman not to leave him, to which she replies that she has been in love with another for three years, so he should let go of this situation. The man with sadness in his eyes replies that he is incredibly shocked by this and is very sorry that this happened. Suddenly the filming of the take stops and the director angrily shouts at the actor. He asks the actor what the hell he is doing, saying that at this rate he will ruin the film. The director says that the character should be emotional, but the actor plays as if he has a stone instead of emotions. Poking his fingers at the other actor, he tells him to show him how to play. In the next take, the replacement actor displays an incredible range of emotions, genuinely crying with grief. He pours water on himself and frankly overacting gives a tirade about how he will never be able to love another girl. The director points to the actor's performance and says that this is exactly what is called acting, adding that if the second actor had not been underpaid, he would never have hired him. Suddenly the actor's phone rings and he decides to check what they wrote to him. The director rudely pulls the actor back, telling him not to dare to be distracted by useless things while he is talking to him. Having read the message in full, the actor exhales with relief and looks contemptuously at the director. With these words, he pushes away the annoying director and tells him that he is quitting. That same evening, a film screenwriter is hard at work in a tiny apartment. She throws out another draft, saying that she rewrote the script for three days and two nights, but it is still not good enough. In a work chat, they tell her that she has written herself off and has become too worried about meaning, and the screenwriter says that she can no longer stand such a life. Suddenly, she receives a message on her phone, and she reads the message, which says that she has great talent, which can be very useful. She also notices that one million yuan comes to her account and an invitation to come to the specified address. Meanwhile, in a country park, preparations are underway for the launch of a space rocket, the girl is doing the final touches, entering the correct launch parameters. The assembled onlookers admire the rocket and the girl with delight, but one of them says that the rocket is probably a dummy, and the girl is just posing for a video. The skeptic adds that if this rocket really flies, then he will eat the shit of a dog that is walking nearby. Having finished the preparations, the girl presses the launch button and the rocket engines begin to emit a loud roar. After a few seconds, the rocket takes off into the air and quickly flies out of the atmosphere, leaving all spectators in incredible shock. A few seconds after the successful launch, the girl receives a notification on her smartwatch and she reads what was written in surprise. Deciding that she has received an extremely tempting offer, she gets on a motorcycle and takes off, heading to the specified address. As soon as all the invited guests arrive at the meeting place, they are greeted by Hank and introduces them to each other, saying that the ambitious actor with original ideas is called Luke, adding that due to the fact that he does not want to nurse on camera, he only gets small roles that are not let it shine. He also says that the woman screenwriter's name is Janet, and she wrote many excellent scripts which, unfortunately, were stolen by other unscrupulous writers. Finally, Hank turns to a girl engineer named Stella and says that, according to her parents and teachers, he is the weakest student but no one notices her talent for inventing very interesting things from recycled waste. Hank says that their previous successes are not so important to him, since now he will be able to provide them with the necessary resources and creative freedom. He adds that together they can build their great careers, and his guests are a little embarrassed. Luke asks Hank what he means by starting a great career. Hank answers him by saying that his dream is to make a film. His guests are surprised at such a strange idea, to which he replies that he wants to make a film without following trends, 
without top actors, and without compromising the IQ of the audience, adding that he thought about this for a long time and decided that only they can help him in this matter. Stella replies that she likes his idea, however. Unfortunately, she is no longer a respected screenwriter, adding that Luke has no fans, and most likely, even if the filming of the film goes well, it, unfortunately, may turn out to be a failure. Hank says he takes on the worry of profit and loss, while his guests are not responsible for this and are only required to participate. He asks them if she agrees to such terms of the deal, to which they enthusiastically answer that they are happy with everything. Hank says that there is a month left before the filming of the film and asks Luke to pump up properly in order to look better, since they will be filming Strong Guys, to which he replies that he will certainly complete this task. After this, Hank turns to Janet saying that he has several drafts for the script, but he leaves all the details to her, adding that she can write as she wishes. Finally, he turns to Stella, saying that her task is to create props for which he will fully provide her with the necessary materials and provide clear technical specifications. After some time, Hank comes to Isabel, saying that he wants her to play in his film, to which she shyly replies that she has never studied acting and can only sing. Hank says that he is not forcing her, and if she wants, she can miss this opportunity, but he will offer the same to her friends in the music group, since he no longer has candidates. Isabel says she agrees, adding that she will still tell her friends that Mr. Hank provides opportunities to play other roles. Hank says that she can consider the problem solved, adding that they are now sought-after newcomers in the entertainment industry, and he simply cannot help but provide them with a good script. Hank says that Dean Harrison will regret his arrogance, after which Betty comes up to him and tells him that he has worked for a very long time and suggests that he take a little rest. Hank responds that he is only getting angrier every day, saying that not only does he want to make a movie, but he wants to release it at the same time as theirs, and even if it turns out to be a failure, he will be obligated to expose it. Betty says she sincerely wishes him success in his endeavors, but making a film requires a lot of money, and he recently spent money on buying land for the orphanage. Hank says that even if he has no money left, he can find investors and dials his parents' number. Hank's mom picks up the phone and kindly asks him how he's doing, after which she listens to his request to give him a billion to make a film and says that she will definitely support him, adding that she will transfer him the necessary amount a little later. Hank's father asks his wife if she will really transfer such a considerable amount to him simply because he asked, to which she replies that she is happy if her son is happy. Hank's father replies that he trusts her decision, showing her that there was news in the newspaper that a city planning company had come up with a plan to urbanize a vacant lot in the east of the city. Hank's father says that someone has invested more than $30 million in the construction of a high-quality park, which means that the area in the area will also be developed, to which Hank's mother says that this is a great business opportunity and invites him to invest. However, after reading the news further, they notice that this territory has already been bought for $10 million by none other than their own son, Hank. A month later, filming begins on Dean Harrison's film, Windchaser. Dean Harrison irritably asks why the leading actress didn't come to today's filming, angrily adding that the film has not yet been completed, to which Dong Shen asks him to control his emotions. Harrison replies that the heroine, whom he considered an excellent actress, forgets her lines every day and now she even dares not come to the set. Dong Shen says that such arrogance is normal for top-level actresses, suggesting that they use a stunt double instead, and then substitute the necessary faces in the editing. Harrison stands up irritably and orders the crew to turn on the equipment and begin the take. He requires that the doubles be rotated several times from the desired angle, so as not to place a strong emphasis on their faces. He irritably thinks that he has been working in that industry for five years, and an attractive A-list actress is supposed to lead him to victory in the annual box office competition. Dong Shen approaches Harrison and says that he just heard very surprising news. Dean listens to the news and is surprised that Hank Daly has decided to also produce his own film, to which Shen replies that Hank has always been a clueless prodigal son, and now he has started filming, using Isabel as a hostess. Harrison says that the last time he came to him was to ask Isabel for his film, 
Assuming that Hank has now learned her value and asks Shen about the cast and screenwriter of Hank's film. Don Shen replies that the male lead is being played by some newcomer to the industry, but the screenwriter is Janet Hendricks. Harrison asks Shen why he doesn't sue her with the help of a nationally recognized screenwriter, accusing her of plagiarism, to which he replies that she can easily win it, but he is still sure that Janet is untalented, so their film is doomed to failure. Dean Harrison says that even if Isabel doesn't turn out to be a very talented actress, it could definitely affect their box office, adding that he will talk to the director. That evening, he goes to a friendly meeting at the prestigious Lumao Hotel. All meeting participants propose to clink glasses and raise another toast to their meeting. The vice president of Peng Hang Film, Jordan Fay, tells Isabel's former boss, Brad, that he hasn't seen him for a long time and he looks very tired. Brad, exhausted, says that it was as if someone had jinxed him, asking him why he pulled him out of the work process. Dean Harrison says that his business in the city is also not going well, since half of the funding goes to an unknown actress, as a result of which he cannot devote himself as well to his work. Jordan Fay says his contract with Isabel is still valid, so if she were to star, the box office could be worth around $3 billion. Hearing the name, Brad asked Jordan not to say it saying that this girl hurt him terribly, after which Jordan asks him what happened. Jordan says that Hank Daly lured her away, and Jordan listens to him in surprise, mouth agape. Brad says that the damn boy found out about his love affairs and forced him to give Isabel to him, adding that he even compensated him for the losses, and now he cannot fight him. Dean Harrison says Brad is giving up too early because everyone can be dealt with. Harrison asks if he has any dirt on Isabel, adding that if he creates a scandal around her name, they won't need to make much effort for revenge. Brad replies that Harrison's proposal is very reasonable, since a pathetic girl like Isabel will not be able to oppose him, while he will be able to release his anger and make her regret it. Harrison is happy that he managed to get influential people on his side and mentally rejoices that now he will definitely ruin Hank's film. After some time at the hotel, Dolly begins an interview with the creators and participants in Hank's film. Hank and the entire crew stand on the podium, posing for a large number of photographers. Hank tells reporters that the famous Isabel will play the main role in this film, hoping that it will become a sensation in the world of show business. Photographers are actively clicking their cameras and talking among themselves, trying to find out the past achievements of the film crew. Focusing their gaze on Hank, they are surprised to note that they have not seen him in the entertainment industry before, additionally noting the extraterrestrial beauty of his wife, who could easily be confused with an actress. Betty asks Hank if he is sure he wants to be a director, asking him not to waste Isabel's popularity. Hank says that he hopes for the help of his dear wife, to which she tells him that she will definitely help, adding that they have a very strong rival, so they will have to come up with something new. Hank tells Betty that even if he fails, it won't be a big problem, since his inheritance is in the hundreds of millions. Meanwhile, Secretary Luo approaches Hank and asks for a moment of his attention. Hank asks Luo what happened, to which she replies that employees of the Disney Park Department want to set up a meeting with him to discuss issues of cooperation. Hank asks Luo if she would like to negotiate with them on his behalf, greatly surprising her. He adds that he needs someone who can help him run his business, saying that in the future she will become the general manager of the company, which means she has full authority to speak on his behalf in discussing business issues. Luo jumps up and down happily, telling Hank that she won't disappoint him and will definitely work hard. Meanwhile, Stella approaches Hank, telling him that she needs to discuss technical issues. She says that the thing he asked her to do is ready and asks him if he wants to try it in action. Hank is surprised at how quickly Stella completed her task and suggests they go outside to test her. Betty asks Hank what lifted Hank's spirit so much, to which he replies that she will soon understand everything herself. After some time, Hank, Betty, and Stella go into the backyard to test the new device. Stella places the device on the floor and begins setting it up. Having completed the setup, she turns her head towards Hank and Betty and asks them if she can start. Hank says he's ready, watching the small device closely. Stella presses the button and the device starts up, lifting the projector up. A second later, a huge monster appears in front of Betty and Hank, approaching them. Betty fearfully jumps into Hank's arms, telling him that she is very scared. 
Hank smiles and tells Betty that she shouldn't be afraid because he's not real. He adds that this is a holographic projection technology, adding that while the image is static, it can be projected in a way that makes the film more realistic and unique. Hank asks Stella how many projectors she made, to which she replies that she could only make three during this time, and Hank says that this is enough, offering her a price of one million for each piece for their film. The next day, filming begins and in the first scene, civilians are running somewhere. Civilians scream for help quickly running away along the roadway. They are chased by a huge monster, viciously showing off its toothy mouth. The townspeople try to escape by shouting pleas for salvation. The monster examines its potential victims and growls contentedly. Suddenly he notices two shining lights in the sky, rapidly approaching him. The townspeople also notice a strange glow and realize that electric hunters are approaching to help them. The hunters summon a lightning whip and wind blades and rush to attack the huge monster. However, after a second, Isabel loses her balance and begins to dangle helplessly in the air. The director commands stop and Isabel shyly apologizes for her clumsiness. Hank asks Isabel if she's okay and if she's hurt herself. Isabel says that she is a little afraid of heights, so she was very nervous and asks for forgiveness. Hank tells her that she doesn't have to apologize since they can take a short break without any problems. After this, he is briefly distracted by Janet, discussing with her the details of the script and the lines of some of the characters. Isabel gets down to the ground and approaches Hank and asks for a moment of his attention. She says that she feels that her acting leaves much to be desired and is worried that she will drag down the film's crew, asking Hank if it would be better to cast someone else to play her. Hank responds that he is pleased with Isabel's acting talents, adding that the role was written specifically for her so she can act more confidently, as if she were performing songs on stage. Isabel listens shyly to Hank's compliments, saying that she still doesn't have confidence in herself. Janet suggests that Hank film the dramatic scenes of the film first so that she can quickly get used to her role, to which Hank responds that he really likes this idea. Finally, he tells Isabel that she is the first actress with whom his company has signed a contract, which means he will definitely make her a popular actress and singer, but she will have to gain more self-confidence. Isabel is encouraged by Hank's speech and thanks him, promising to work harder from now on. Later that evening, Hank retreats to his room again to update his spendthrift system. Thanks to his improved performance, Hank strengthens his body to the point where he realizes he no longer needs the wooden cane. Hank says that he finally looks like a normal person, adding that according to current data, he could at least outspeed some Olympic champions. Betty knocks on Hank's room again, saying that something terrible has happened, so he quickly puts on a robe and asks her to come in. Betty shows Hank the tablet, saying that some anonymous person posted the news that Isabel is supported by a rich man, and she has a child abroad, adding that this news is now trending and the number of views has exceeded a billion. She asks Hank what they should do, to which the protagonist replies that she should worry because he knows perfectly well who did it and will definitely repay them. He takes the tablet and wonders who this anonymous person assumes is a rich man, suspecting that they mean him, to which Betty punches him on the shoulder and asks him how he manages to stay in the mood for jokes. Betty suggests calling the police, saying that Dean Harrison and Dong Shen from the Peng Hang film are definitely behind this adding that they are the only ones with a conflict of interest now. Hank says that this is too boring and suggests that they pretend they didn't hear anything and just continue making the movie, to which Betty asks him if he's crazy. Hank replies that she just needs to calm Isabel down and let her act in the film at ease, adding that such a scandal will only play into their hands. Betty asks Hank what he means by saying it will work to their advantage. Hank says that even if she calls the police to investigate, she will easily find out that this is fabricated news from some private media, and it will all end with them only clarifying their position of apologizing, leaving the instigators untouched. Hank says they need to let their competitors be more aggressive and eventually hit them so hard they won't get up. Meanwhile, Internet users are doing their best to spread information, saying that they are now disappointed in their idol. Users come to the conclusion that all her popularity is ensured by her rich daddy, and they say that they will never listen to her songs again. The next morning, Dong Shen comes to Harrison and happily reports that Isabel's black background is now on the list of the hottest search queries. 
Harrison replies that he also saw the news that she was recently in the film, but now her own fans are boycotting her, adding that now they don't like her. Dong Shen says that even if she wants to sue someone, she won't be able to find the culprit, adding that Heng will now regret laughing at them when they kindly came to talk to him. Dong Shen says that the situation will develop according to two probable scenarios, specifying that either Hank will give up when all the investors take their money, or he will still make the film, but the audience will ignore its release, and it will fail at the box office in the same way. Harrison says that Hank remains a prodigal son, since the second generation of rich people only knows how to spend money and does not understand anything about the path he embarked on. Meanwhile, fake news about Isabel's past continues to spread across the country, attracting the attention of more and more people. Everyone agrees that all this falls on the shoulders of Hank, who is the producer and head of the film crew. At the same time, on the set of the film The Hunt for Electricity, Isabel meets with Hank to try to explain herself. However, due to being unaccustomed to such a wave of hatred from ordinary people, she does not find the strength to say anything and begins to cry. Hank consoles her, telling her that she doesn't need to be sad because he knows it's not her fault and asks if she trusts him. Isabel says Hank got her out of a bad situation before, so she definitely trusts him. Hank says that then she should listen to his proposal, which is that she puts the phone aside and never looks at it, and also moves into his house and sleeps in the room with Betty, and Hank, in turn, will take care of that there would be no more bullying from the internet towards her family. He adds that all he demands from her is to finish filming the film, and Isabel says that she will fulfill all his requests, asking him to help her find justice. Hank says that he will definitely sort everything out, suggesting that Isabel get some rest first. Meanwhile, Secretary Luo approaches Hank and says that she has found important data. Hank studies the reports and realizes that Brad is behind all this, after which he asks Luo to set up a meeting with him, asking him to tell him that he wants to return one thing to him. At night, Hank drives up to Brad's company building and the driver asks him if he's going to go there alone. Hank says he can just wait for him in the car, adding that he'll be back soon. Approaching the entrance to the building, he says that he is very familiar with this feeling, since he has already been in such situations. Coming out of the elevator, Hank finds himself greeted by a whole bunch of beefy security guards. Hank says he's impressed by the impressive welcome ceremony and asks them if they're going to declare war on him. Brad lights a cigar and says that he has to admit to Hank that he was really looking forward to meeting him. He adds that despite the fact that they are seeing each other for the first time, he has never looked forward to meeting a person so much. Hank replies with a smile that fortunately he has met Brad before. Brad tells his guards that they will talk privately, ordering them to get out. The guards ask Brad if he is sure of his decision, to which Brad replies that some cripple cannot harm him. All the guards leave, leaving Hank alone with a gloomy Brad. Brad tells Hank to get straight to the point, adding that based on his message, he has something for Brad. Hank calmly takes out the flash drive and puts it on the table, saying that it contains the last copy of that video. Brad reaches for the flash drive, but Hank quickly intercepts it, taking it back for himself. Hank says that there is no need for such a rush, since they still have plenty of time to discuss everything. Brad mentally notes that Hank is not as simple as he seems, since he reacted quite quickly. Brad asks Hank why he is stalling, adding that he already gave him the group, so Hank is unlikely to come for the money, asking him if he has now decided to take his entire company. Hank says that no one is going to take anything from Brad, and he just wants information about something. Brad says that in this case it won't be a problem, and says that Hank can ask whatever interests him. Hank asks Brad if the people he recently had dinner with are connected to the online harassment of his group. Brad annoyedly replies that they have nothing to do with it and demands the flash drive from Hank. Hank says that he knows that Brad and his friends have talked about it, suggesting that since they have nothing to do with it, Brad is the only one responsible for the bullying, to which Brad loudly states that Hank has no evidence of this. Hank says that he really has no evidence, and Brad in a mocking manner suggests that he hire an investigator. Suddenly, Hank invites Brad to find out everything for him, to which he, stunned, asks the main character if he has gone crazy, adding that he has no reason to help him. Hank says that the flash drive is not real, and he still has the video in a secret place. Brad angrily yells at Hank and calls the guards into the room. He states that Hank has crossed all boundaries, 
and if he does not give up this flash drive now, then he will not look at the status of his family and will not be responsible for himself. He adds that no one would suspect him if Hank accidentally fell down the stairs. Hank wearily says that Brad himself chose the difficult path, and he just wanted to know if his friends had anything to do with bullying, adding that in that case, he would just give him the video. Brad laughs at Hank's words and orders his guards to capture Hank, claiming that a couple of naked photos of him will be enough for blackmail. The guards begin to approach Hank as Brad says he can't wait for Isabel to return so he can have some fun with her and then sell her somewhere abroad. However, Hank suddenly grabs his cane and stops the menacing guard, stopping the tip of the cane a centimeter from his throat. Brad angrily asks the guard why they can't even grab an ordinary cripple. Hank tells Brad that they'll take a look at who the clumsy cripple is here. Brad begins to lose his temper and angrily asks Hank what he wants. Hank says that he just needs an answer to a simple question, adding that he is sure that Brad is definitely involved in the bullying, but his target is those two. Hank adds that he, however, has no evidence and puts a piece of paper and a pen on the table. The main character asks Brad to describe how, where, and when they discussed bullying Isabel, adding that after he leaves his signature here, he will be free. Brad grins and says that he didn't expect a man with Hank's reputation to be such a treacherous guy, then says that if he did everything according to his instructions, he would betray his friends, adding that Hank himself could write a confession about how he forced him to terminate his contract with Isabel. Hank replies that Brad is the last person who can lecture him, since no one forced him to have an affair with his brother's wife. Brad loses his temper and says that now Hank is in trouble, throwing his fists at him. Brad decides to knock Hank to the ground with a powerful kick, but Hank easily jumps back, holding himself on the back of his chair with acrobatic skill. Brad notes Hank's agility, saying that he turned out to be an ordinary person and not a cripple. Hank replies that he recently found the immortality pill and ironically asks Brad whether he believes these words or not. Brad says that Hank can at least be a cultivator, adding that today will be the end for him and he won't care even if Hank's family bury him three times later. Screaming that this is Hank's last chance to get the video back, Brad attacks Hank. Hank still playfully dodges Brad's attack, saying that first he must get a confession from him. Brad says that if Hank continues to resist, then everything will be bad. Hank mentally says that he wants to test and practice how strong this body has become after being improved by the system. Brad breaks Hank's cane, saying that as a child, he was a master of taekwondo, and since Hank is healthy now, he will not spare him. Other guards ask Brad if he needs help, to which he replies that they should not move, adding that he can handle this brat himself. With these words, he throws a powerful kick, but Hank easily blocks it. The guards say that now the boy has definitely come to an end, since with this blow Brad left dents on the steel sheets, which means his legs will not survive this. Noticing that not a single muscle moved on Hank's face, they are surprised that he is not in pain, assuming that he is just not showing it. The guards begin to cheer Brad louder, telling him that he only needs to land one blow and Hank will be defeated. Suddenly, they notice that Brad's face has twisted into a grimace of pain and wonder how this is possible and what could have happened. The guards start running towards Hank, but Brad stops them, saying that he will deal with this himself. With these words, he gives up, saying that he didn't think that masters could be so young, adding that he gives up. Suddenly, he pulls a large stun gun from behind his back and lunges at Hank, telling him to cheer up a little. However, Hank snatches the weapon from Brad with inhuman speed, greatly surprising him. Hank notes that it was quite a pathetic sight, looking at the dumbfounded Brad. With these words, he stabs Brad in the back and asks him if he really isn't afraid of his family. After beating Brad, Hank after a while beats a confession out of him and Brad begs him to stop beating him, saying that he can give him a video recording of the meeting. Hank asks Brad interestedly about what kind of video he means, turning on the stun gun again. Brad says that after losing Isabel, he realized he had to be more careful, so he started carrying a recording device with him, and on the day when they discussed how they could throw mud at Isabel online, he wrote down every last detail, so that in case of discovery, his accomplices did not begin to deny everything. Hank asks Brad where the tape is, and he replies that it is in his shirt pocket, Hank takes the flash drive from Brad's shirt pocket and says that this time he will believe him. As he leaves, he hears Brad say that when everyone finds out that he is involved in bullying Isabel, then everything will be over for him. 
Hank responds that Brad can rest assured that he is only targeting those two and adds that the fake flash drive was, in fact, the real thing. Brad listens to Hank in surprise, thanking him for his generosity. Mentally, he is surprised that Hank single-handedly burst into his territory and beat him like a child and comes to the conclusion that he must remember Hank forever so as never to anger him again. The driver meets Hank and asks him if he's okay, pointing out his fresh abrasions. Hank says he's fine and tells him to head home, adding that he can't wait to celebrate his victory. The next morning, Hank decides to look at the video recording of Dean Harrison talking about his plan to plant incriminating evidence. Betty, watching this video with Hank, angrily says that she knew it was Harrison's doing. She adds that there are already three million abusive comments on Isabel's account, so they urgently need to deal with the instigators of the bullying and make them suffer. Hank says that he perfectly understands the feelings of his dear wife, but in his opinion now is not the time to retaliate, since it would be better not to make a fuss and make them his puppets, proposing to slightly adjust the video for this. With these words, he turns to Stella and asks her if she can add something to the video. Stella says that this is possible, but if they decide to conduct a professional examination, it will immediately be revealed that it is a fake. Hank tells Stella that they won't decide to do this and will just take the bait right away. In a few days, the premiere of Chasing the Wind begins, with Dean Harrison in attendance. The interviewer greets the audience by apologizing that the film's lead actor was injured during filming and could not be here today adding that the film's chief director, Dean, is their guest today, Harrison. She says it's time for questions and asks Dean if the rumors are true that after the overwhelming success of a film called The Love of a Young Daughter-in-Law, Dean Harrison spent three whole years planning Chasing the Wind, to which Dean replies that this is true. He compliments his answer by saying that he was always sure that the success of the love of a young daughter-in-law was not the limit for him, and he always knew that he could do something more successful. And for this, he had to go beyond the love drama, adding that in his, we hope his new film is his best work and will please the audience. The interviewer replies that she is sure that it will be so, because in his films, the actors in the main roles are superstars who are on everyone's lips adding that the film's rich cast of talent pays for it even before release. Looking into the audience, the girl notes that there are quite a lot of people who want to ask the director a question and chooses one of the spectators, asking him what he wanted to know. The viewer tells Harrison that she has been a fan of his work for many years and even decided to become an actress under the impression of his films, after which she complains that as a beginner she encountered many difficulties and does not know how to move on adding that she does not want to sell her body like Isabel and asks Harrison for some advice. Dean Harrison says he was asked a great question, and he knows that many people new to the business struggle and don't rely on rich producers to be honest, or they won't make it to fame. The audience applauds Dean Harrison's fiery response, saying that his thoughts are, as always, incredibly accurate. Meanwhile, at the premiere of Chasing Electricity, absolutely no one is there except Betty and Hank. Betty tells Hank that they have been sitting here for the third day and no one has come to them, despite the fact that the film comes out tomorrow, after which she adds that things have become even worse online, to which Hank replies that it is so and it should be, because interest in this topic should not subside even for a minute. The main character says that tonight they will upload the resulting video to the internet and see what show will start after. That evening, Jordan Fay, Dean Harrison, and Don Shen celebrate the film's imminent launch, saying that critics are already excited and that huge box office revenues will not be long in coming. Dong Shen happily states that there is a lot of talk online about this being Dean's greatest masterpiece, adding that because of Isabel's bullying online, movie theaters are refusing to show Hank's film in their theaters. Dean Harrison says that Hank deserved such a fate, adding that if he had been more modest, he might not have failed at the box office. Jordan says that Dean doesn't have to worry about it coming out, saying that even if they start digging under them, they will only find fake people, and even if someone gets to the truth, he will protect him, and he will remain the director through thick and thin. Jordan ambitiously declares that they will soon be able to take over the entire cinema in the country and the trio clink glasses for their future success. Their victorious drinking session is interrupted by an assistant who bursts into the office with a laptop and says that this is an urgent matter. 
Jordan asks in surprise what could have happened so urgently, to which he invites him to look it up on his own and places a laptop in front of him. Jordan, Dean Harrison, and Don Shen look closely at the laptop, trying to understand what happened. Taking a closer look, they all freeze at once from severe shock. They watch a videotape of Dong Shen telling Harrison that Hank thinks too much of himself and plans to make a movie starring Isabel. Harrison tells Shen that it's not an easy task, but he knows a good computer guy who can mount something for them, adding that they can bury his reputation. He says that they will release a video online saying that Isabel is selling her body for fame. All three look at the video in shock, not believing their eyes. Dong Shen angrily asks what this is, clarifying that he never said these words, while Harrison asks to find him the author of this video. Dean Harrison contacts Jordan, saying that the video is fake and needs to be removed immediately, otherwise his reputation and his film will be over. Dong Shen says that they urgently need to call the police so that they can arrest the author, suggesting that Hank Dolly is behind it all. Jordan interrupts his companion's panicky hysterics and orders them to shut up. He says that the video may be fake, but a similar conversation definitely took place, and if they start digging, the original recording may also surface, so for the sake of the company's reputation, they will not do anything. Dean Harrison asks Jordan what this all means, accusing him of wanting to get away with leaving Harrison and his film in the lurch, adding that Jordan was the one who started it all in the first place. Jordan replies that there is neither Jordan nor evidence against him in the video, and angrily tells Harrison and Shen that they will not be able to drag him down with them. Dong Shen and Dean Harrison look at their former comrade with surprise and undisguised anger. Meanwhile, the published video begins to spread across the internet, and viewers begin to realize that they have been deceived all this time. Heated discussions begin on the forums that Dean Harrison specifically began to harass Isabel on social networks, in order to prevent her film from being released. After this, people decide to watch Hank Dolly's film and line up in huge lines for the premiere. Sales of the film begin to grow exponentially, bringing him great profits. Betty looks at the reports in shock and says that they have already made a billion in just two days, saying that Hank was able to succeed after all. Hank notes that their film isn't really anything special, but the incident has catapulted them to the top of the conversation and most of the public now supports them, while their resentment has turned into shame for bullying Isabel. Hank adds that everything went exactly as he planned. A few months later, Betty says the film's box office gross was almost 60 billion with an average rating of nine. The entire film team applauds Hank and Betty praises him for pulling off the impossible. She looks shyly at her betrothed and tells him that she is very glad that everything worked out for them. Hank says that he did it for fun, not expecting even a small success, noting that this is not all his merit, since the entire film team contributed to this victory. Hank says that justice has prevailed and such a holiday definitely deserves a festive banquet. Meanwhile, Dean Harrison gets drunk in some seedy bar on the outskirts of town. However, even there he cannot get rid of the evil tongues that whisper behind his back that he bullied Isabel on social networks. In drunken anger, he asks himself how he managed to get to such a situation in life. Dong Shen, sitting next to him, also laments that he was set up, emphasizing that he was not even in that restaurant, which did not stop the management from firing him. He curses Isabel, to which Dean Harrison replies that she has nothing to do with it, and in his opinion, Hank Daly is behind all this. With these words, he angrily breaks his mug and swears that he will not leave it just like that. He gets up from the table and leaves, telling Shen that he will lie low for a while and asks not to look for him. Dong Shen asks Harrison where he is going, to which he replies that he will go to his older brother in the mountains, adding that he still owes some debt. Dong Shen is surprised that Harrison is still persisting in his attempts to annoy Hank and says that this time he will definitely not participate in it. Meanwhile, Hank and his future wife decide to visit their parents, Hank's mom, without hiding her tears of happiness, is happy that Hank has finally recovered and asks him how he did it. Hank happily says that his betrothed may be involved in his recovery since she takes very good care of him. Hank's mom hugs Betty tightly, saying that she is very glad that Betty became the bride for her dear son, adding that she is simply a gift from above. Betty is embarrassed by such compliments and looks at Hank, who with a gentle look lets her know that he completely agrees with his mother's words. 
Hank's father tells Betty that she did a great job and asks her to tell her father that he will help solve all his problems, because in the future they will become a family. Betty bows gratefully to Hank's parents, saying that she is very pleased to hear this. After a while, Betty and Hank sit on a bench in the night garden, and Betty says that she is a useless wife and asks Hank why he said that she helped him heal. Hank tells Betty that she shouldn't call herself worthless, because since they met, they stopped calling him the prodigal son. His business went uphill and the money flowed like a river. Betty tells Hank that he got away with it this time and thanks him for his kind words. Hank snuggles up to Betty and asks her if she would like to thank him. Betty asks Hank what he means by this, to which he replies that Betty herself knows perfectly well what he means. Betty asks Hank how he wants her to thank him, to which Hank replies that she is his fiancé, so she should know it herself. Betty smiles tenderly and gently places her hand on Hank's chest, pushing him onto the bench. She sits on Hank's hips and tells him that she is still his fiancé and not his wife and asks him if he really thought that if he said a few sweet words, she would immediately lose her head. Hank asks Betty what she was thinking about, saying that he just meant a hug and not what she was getting at. Betty leans closer to Hank and asks him if he is sure of his words, to which he asks her about what other options there may be. Betty says that Hank chose this option himself and lays down on him, hugging him tenderly. Betty says that she really likes this feeling, to which Hank replies that he is having trouble breathing. The couple falls silent for a while and enjoys the moment, listening to the sounds of night crickets, and after a while Betty tells Hank that he surprises her. Hank asks what she means, to which she replies that when she saw him for the first time, she could not even think that his chest would be so strong and hot. Hank says that this is all because he began to slowly recover. Betty says that she did not mean his body, but his inner qualities, adding that many times she heard that Hank was called an unambitious prodigal son, but after spending a lot of time with him, she realized that he was actually very smart and caring, after he says that she knows the expression that the true mind is always modest, and next to Hank she feels how even the most difficult problems can be resolved in an instant. She adds that after the Tang family got into trouble, she couldn't sleep a wink, and later because of her father's bitter plea, she agreed to become part of Hank's family, but now she can sleep peacefully at night, in complete harmony with herself, and feel safer than when she was with the Tang family. Hank says that he did not know that he was reliable, adding that he has been hearing about the Tang family's problems for quite some time, and asks Betty if she can talk about what happened. Betty sits on the bench and says that this is quite a long story, explaining that three years ago their family encountered one strange thing. According to her, her family's pharmaceutical company was founded 800 years ago and was developing miracle drugs and after hundreds of years of development, their company even entered the top 100 leading enterprises in the world. However, three years ago, a new pharmaceutical company, Shendu, emerged, which developed and produced a large number of drugs in a short period of time, and developed so quickly that it surpassed Teng's company. Betty says that the strangest thing was that all the drugs that this company produced were the same drugs that Tang developed in secret and registered patents in advance, and accused Tang of plagiarism. Hank says that according to Betty, it can be concluded that there was a rat in their company that leaked all the recipes of another company, to which Betty replies that at first they thought so too, but further investigation completely excluded this possibility. Hank says that then there is a possibility that there is a thief in their company. Betty says that Hank is right, but they encountered a rather unusual thief. She adds that since these strange things started happening, the company has installed a whole bunch of cameras to ensure visibility without blind spots, but this has not brought any results. Only once did a security guard smell a pungent odor during his shift, and while inspecting the area, he was stunned by an unknown girl with beautiful hair. According to Betty, after this incident, they concluded that all the data from the company was stolen by the same girl who came and left without a trace, which is why they had to suspend the work of the company. Hank says that he has never heard such details and asks Betty how the Dolly family can help them, saying that it can help catch a thief or attract investment. Betty says that in half a month there will be an auction where there will be one valuable thing that occurs once every thousand years, adding that it will not benefit ordinary companies, but is necessary for the Tang family. 
Betty says that because it is priceless, any other pharmaceutical company would easily waste a lot of money, so she can only ask the Dolly family for help, to which Hank asks her what this valuable thing is. Betty says that we are talking about the ancient herb Tian Yang, collected during a deadly expedition, which was later sent for processing and made into pills that can prolong life and heal any wounds. Hank asks Betty that if the thief comes to them again and takes away the recipes, to which she replies that even if she decides to steal the recipes again, they will not bring any benefit, since the main ingredient in these recipes is the Tian Herb John. Hank says that there is nothing stopping this thief from stealing this particular herb, to which Betty angrily replies that she would not dare to do such a thing. She adds that this herb is the most important to the Tang family and they will do their best to protect their last opportunity for recovery. Hank mentally admits to himself that this is the first time he has seen Betty so stern, noting that in this state she looks very sweet. Betty says that Hank's father promised to help them get this herb, after which they will definitely leave all their troubles behind. Betty adds that after she marries Hank, she will cook for him every day, noting that she is very good at it. Hank looks at Betty and coughs, chuckling a little. Betty grabs Hank's sleeve and asks him what he found funny in her story, suggesting that Hank is underestimating her, to which Hank replies that the opposite is true and he likes her plan of action. Betty tells Hank that this is how he should have spoken from the very beginning and falls silent for a second. Hank asks Betty what she is going to do, to which she tells him to be quiet and pulls him towards her. With that, she kisses him tenderly on the cheek, causing Hank great embarrassment. Having released Hank, she turns around and tells him that it was only an advance. Hank smiles contentedly, looking at his future wife. Half a month later, Betty's father joyfully greets the protagonist's family, saying that he is very glad that they came. Hank's father says that there is no problem with this, since they will become a family sooner or later anyway. Betty's father hugs his daughter and says he owes her a favor, while Hank greets him respectfully. Uncle Tang notes that Hank looks much better, to which he replies that it's all thanks to Betty, who always takes care of him. Uncle Tang says that he didn't expect Betty to be so caring, to which Betty chuckles sheepishly, saying that Hank is exaggerating. Hank's father says it's time for them to go to the auction, to which Uncle Tang says he agrees with him. The future couple, together with their fathers, enters the hall to take their seats. The other patrons watch Hank's father in amazement, surprised that he decided to show up adding that this may be due to the fact that today's product is different in many ways from previous ones. Also, one of the visitors notices Hank and wonders why his father brought his prodigal son here, to which he replies that he has long been an influential man since he secretly owns more than a dozen restaurants on a shopping street in the city center. Uncle Tang tells Uncle Dally that he only took 20 million with him, and if that is not enough, then he will have to ask for help to which Hank's father replies that he should not worry, since he also did not come empty-handed. Betty tells Hank that she needs to go to the restroom, to which he admits to her that he has the same desire and says that he will take her. After seeing Betty off, Hank enters the men's room where a strange man appears next to him, eyeing him suspiciously. Hank turns his gaze to the strange stranger and asks him what he was staring at. The stranger replies that no one has ever been able to compete with him in size and says that Hank is the first. As Hank washes his hands before leaving, he notices that the stranger continues to stare at him. Tensing a little, he asks the stranger why he is paying him so much attention. The stranger replies that Hank has nothing to worry about, since he is only interested in how he was able to achieve such an impressive size of manhood, adding that a person could not immediately be born with one. Hank says it's not congenital and could be a side effect of medications that strengthen the body, adding that he doesn't know the exact cause. With these words, he hurriedly leaves and the stranger tells him that his name is Carl Dan, asking about Hank's name. Hank is greeted by his cousin, who says that now he understands why the place started to smell like something rotten. He sarcastically asks Hank if he finished all his business, saying that he was too fast. Hank calmly asks Cousin what his name is, to which he angrily replies that his name is Stan Daly, and he is the son of his fourth uncle and is Hank's cousin. Hank says he remembers dogs chasing him, asking him how his butt felt. Other visitors, having heard this story, begin to whisper and laugh at what a fun spectacle it must have been. Stan says that he is not going to chat with Hank, 
but he knows why he and his relatives came here, asking him if they need that very Qian Yang herb. Hank calmly asks Stan how he knows about this. Stan says that it doesn't matter, because today, they don't care how much money they spend as long as they get this grass. Stan rudely pushes Hank with his shoulder, saying that they will look at their shame and leaves. Carl Dan finds Hank, and having overheard his conversation with Stan, says that he has always dreamed of meeting Hank Dolly, while Betty, approaching them in surprise, asks Hank why his cousin laughed so evilly as he left. Seeing Betty, Carl Dan recognizes her and introduces himself, telling her that she is a very happy woman, to which Betty asks in surprise what he means. Without allowing Carl to elaborate, Hank grabs Betty and says it's time for them to run away from this pervert. The auction is getting ready to start and all the visitors are seated, making a little noise. Betty gently touches Hank's shoulder with her finger and asks him what Carl meant, admitting that she is burning with curiosity, to which Hank tells her that she will find out about it later, and Betty upsetly says that she would like to see it now. The auction begins, and the auctioneer greets everyone, saying that the auction is open and inviting bidding on the first item. He points to a strange thing, saying that it is a jade cup, adding that according to legend, several thousand years ago, the emperor defeated a fiery phoenix, after which he smeared the jade with the fat of this bird and installed it in this cup, calling the starting price at 20 million. Uncle Tang is surprised at such a huge starting price, adding that the cheapest items are always put up at the beginning of the auction, and gradually the initial price increases, and the last item will be the rarest and most expensive. The bidding begins, and bidders bid at 22, 24, and 28 million, after which the auctioneer asks if anyone can offer more. Suddenly a hand rises in the hall, and a calm voice names the price for this cup at 100 million. The audience freezes in surprise, turning towards the sound of the voice, wanting to know who this rich man is. The auctioneer asks in surprise who offered such a generous price and turns his head around, trying to find this person. The rich man turns out to be the fourth master of the Dolly family, who is also the father of Stan, who proudly declares that his dad either does nothing or makes sure that everyone around him looks only at him. Stan's father looks at the cup with contempt, saying that it is just a small thing. Hank's father looks at his brother and wonders what he left there. Hank mentally notes that this must be his father's fourth brother named Ragnar Dolly, who is the only famous entrepreneur in his business, having created the number one e-commerce platform in the country. Uncle Tang turns to Hank's father and says that their affairs are bad, since next to Ragnar sits Hung Lao, who is their worst enemy and the head of that same Shendu Corporation. Uncle Tang says that Hung Lao could have called Ragnar here to buy back the precious grass, and if they succeed, they can give up on Tang's digging. Betty says that now they will definitely be able to make sure that they are stealing all their ideas, adding that now they are ready to completely destroy the Tang family. Hank remembers Stan's words and says that they really came here prepared, but it is impossible to predict in advance who will win. The auctioneer repeats the price of the cup three more times and says that the item was sold to the fourth Mr. Dolly for $100 million. The audience is surprised at such a waste, saying that last time the fourth Mr. Dolly spent $200 million on a water tripod from the times of the Warring States just to put his turtle there. The auctioneer takes out the next lot and says it's time to move on to the second item. He solemnly declares that a necklace called the Azure Heart is presented to the attention of the crowd, adding that the stones in this necklace were obtained as a result of the explosion of a distant star and the necklace itself was made by a hundred of the best craftsmen who were casting this jewelry for three years, after which he names the starting price at 30,000 yuan. Immediately, someone in the audience bids 100 million for the piece, once again causing everyone involved to turn around to take notice. This time the donor is Hank's father, who says it would be a great gift for his fiance. Hank laughs heartily, and Betty, blushing, says that this is all a very big waste. Viewers note that the entire Dolly family is gathered, which means they have almost no chance to take anything for themselves. Stan capriciously tells his father that he also wants this necklace to give it to Lucy, to which Ragnar replies that he should watch his words and not plan anything with Lucy, since she is his cousin. The auctioneer says with incredible shock that he did not expect such surprising turns at the auction. Coming to his senses, he asks three times if anyone is going to offer more, after which he sells the necklace to Hank's father. 
Hank's father invites Betty to try on the necklace to see if it suits her. He adds that since he ran into his brother today, he can't let things go unnoticed. Hank places the necklace around Betty's neck and asks her if she likes the jewelry, to which she sheepishly replies that it is very beautiful. Women at the auction are burning with envy, and some of them turn to their husbands saying that they also want such a decoration. Hank notes that his father just crossed his brother's path, adding that they both don't like to waste time on trifles and immediately go ahead, after which he wonders how far the bidding for Qian Yang's grass will go. Ragnar lazily scratches his ear, saying that this is not a significant loss for him. The auctioneer says that, unexpectedly for everyone, the auction is rapidly gaining momentum from the very beginning, adding that he is very interested in what will happen to the next item. He points to the next item, which is a three 800-year-old empress container that is inlaid with 110 unusual gems, citing a starting price of 38 million yuan. People start bidding with prices of 40 and 42 million yuan. Suddenly, someone puts a hand on Hank's shoulder and gives him a friendly pat. Turning around, Hank notices that this man turns out to be Carl and asks him what the hell he was doing here. Carl says that Hank shouldn't avoid him since he doesn't intend to harm him, but just wants to ask some advice about that very issue. Hank asks Carl what is wrong with him, adding that he should go to the doctor and not run after him, to which he replies that they cannot help him there, offering Hank a deal, the essence of which is that he will give him a prescription for the medicine, and Carl will buy it regardless of its cost. Hank tries to figure out how to explain to him that this is an effect of the spendthrift system and decides that he will have to fool him. Hank says that if Carl really wants to know this secret, then he will share it, adding that there is a medicine that was given to him by a Taoist who is searching for immortality. Hank adds that unfortunately this man only gave him one tablet and he has the rest of the medicine, but this old man constantly wanders around the world and Hank does not know his exact location. Carl says that he simply has to find this old man, to which Hank is mentally surprised that Carl would so easily believe in this nonsense. Hank tells Carl not to be sad, adding that if he meets this old man again, he will definitely ask for medicine for him. Meanwhile, the bidding for the tiara ends and he suggests paying attention to the next offer. This item is a magical weapon known as the decapitating iron, made by the most famous blacksmith Shen back in ancient times. The auctioneer puts on gloves and draws a sword, saying that this sword is razor sharp and is capable of cutting iron like clay, noting that at one time it beheaded more than 100 Japanese invaders, after which he says that his heart breaks out of his chest simply because that he holds it and sets a starting price of three million. The whole hall bursts into laughter, surprised that such an insignificant price is assigned for such a sword. Hank is also surprised at the price of the sword, mentally noting that he always wanted to buy himself a sword so that it would ward off the evil aura in his room. With these words, Hank raises his hand and offers the price of the sword at three and a half million. Stan wonders why Hank might need this sword and decides to prevent him from getting this sword at all costs, adding that he took 50 million with him to bargain a little. He also raises his hand, saying that he is ready to give 3,510,000 for this sword. Hank and Stan continue to haggle, gradually increasing the price, reaching 4 million yuan. Hank angrily tells Stan that he is betting such a small thing on purpose, to which he replies that no one forbids raising bets by 10,000. Hank raises the bet to 30 million. Stan immediately raises the bet to 10,000, adding that he really likes to watch Hank's indignation. Hank says he's offering 100 million, but Stan, with a happy face, says he's raising the bid to 100 million and 10,000. Stan mentally rejoices at how angry Hank is, planning not to raise the bid on the next offer, forcing Hank to buy the hardware for such a huge price. Hank Daly continues to be indignant, trying to figure out what price he can still charge for this sword. Suddenly an idea comes to his mind and he falls silent for a moment. After a few seconds of thought, he says that he's had enough and refuses further bidding for this lot. The hall explodes with laughter because two fools are giving 100 million for a sword, the price of which was 33 times less. Someone from the crowd adds that the last buyer was at least smart enough to refuse the auction and save a large amount of money. Stan again asks his father for help, to which he angrily asks him why he spent a lot of money on a piece of iron that is used to chop people, noting that Stan is a misunderstanding and not a son. 
Hong Lao says that he is ready to pay for the purchase of this sword, offering to consider it a small gift to the young master, adding that when they buy the sacred herb, the profit from the developed medicine will be 60-40 in favor of Ragnar. However, in his mind, Hung Lao is not happy that he had to spend money on a sword for Stan, promising himself to return this money twice as much. Betty's father tells Hank that if he likes swords so much, he can buy him a good sword from one of the respected swordsmen, to which Hank politely replies that he was just playing with Stan. Carl tells Hank that he knew all along that Hank couldn't beat him for money, adding that if he ever needed it, he could always rely on Carl to which Hank says that he was just too lazy to continue bidding with Stan. Carl says that he understands that Hank just wanted to fool him, but if he doesn't have money, Carl will always find it for him, asking in return only that he find that Taoist. Hank irritably tells Carl that he is not as poor as he thinks, adding that he made a profit of 200 million from the filming, and besides that, he has a well-developed hotel business, to which Carl replies with a smile that Hank is a tough guy. The auctioneer asks to hand over the precious sword to Hank, saying that it's time to move on to the most important thing of this auction, which is a magic herb that grew from a seed that fell from the heavenly kingdom. Hung Lao and Ragnar rejoice that they have finally waited until the announcement of the artifact they need. However, Hank and his father are watching intently what is happening, realizing that they will have to compete for this grass. The auctioneer reports that this magical herb has been buried for several millennia under the ice cover of the highest point on the planet, and finally its time has come to see the light again. Hearing some disappointment in the audience, the auctioneer says that no one should underestimate the properties of this herb, since it is incomparable to Lingji and Ginseng. He loudly announces that when customers begin to suffer from age-related illnesses that none of the doctors are able to cope with, only this herb can help them, adding that in addition to this, the appearance of the person who uses this herb will immediately look ten years younger, and physical capabilities will return to those of twenty or thirty years of age. The crowd is very surprised, not believing their ears and begin to whisper that each of them either has a dying relative or they themselves would like to regain their youth. They understand that this thing is priceless and begin to offer huge sums from fifty to eighty million. Betty notes that this herb has many more properties than she previously thought, to which Hank says that no matter how rich people are, they will all strive for health and longevity. Betty's father says that this herb is truly the universe, but unfortunately it is in a single copy, and if a pharmaceutical company manages to buy it and develop a medicine based on it, then anyone could buy it for a small price, despite several reduced effectiveness. But if it falls into the hands of people seeking profit, the price of the medicine can rise to a level unaffordable for ordinary people. Hong Lao mentally notes that raising the price to such an extent that ordinary people cannot afford it is a normal practice, since wasting the medicine on poor people would be too wasteful, adding that he would use this magic medicine to bribe high-ranking officials and in the end, make sure that they are ready to give everything to him. The auctioneer says that this herb can only survive frozen, so the expedition team had to break the iceberg and bring it here. He adds that even now he can feel the energy of this herb in the air, saying that this feeling is very exciting for him. The auctioneer invites everyone gathered to look at this miracle and pulls off the cover. With these words, he quickly tears the cover off the mysterious treasure, showing it to the public. Under the blanket is a beautiful ice sculpture of a woman holding a shining flower in her palms. All participants are breathtaking and they admit that even when inhaling the aroma of this herb, they feel how their body is filled with energy. The crowd begins to ask the auctioneer to tell them the starting price, saying that they are already tired of waiting. The auctioneer states that for the past few days their experts have been trying to set a starting price for this auction, but everyone has come to the conclusion that any amount seems insulting and rude for such a priceless treasure. He adds that because of this, they came to the conclusion that the starting price for this treasure would be zero yuan. The crowd falls silent in shock, and the auctioneer says that they heard right, because transferring the right to set the price to those present here is the highest indicator of respect for this miracle herb, since it came into this world in order to heal the dying and alleviate the suffering of the sick, and if the people here up the ante to a mind-blowing cost or only give up a small portion of their budget, it won't matter so much because they will do it for the benefit of their lives. 
With these words, the auctioneer ends his introduction and proposes to finally begin bidding. However, deathly silence reigns in the hall, and none of those present wants to set a price for this artifact. Betty asks Hank why everyone was quiet, despite the fact that they had just behaved so animatedly, to which he replies that all the people sitting here are businessmen, and it would be beneficial for them to buy an item at a low price. But such a miracle is being offered at zero price, so everyone is ashamed to offer a low price. He adds that if someone else bids, others will jump in and keep raising the bids because they don't want to lose. With these words, he raises his hand and says that he offers a starting price of $10 million for this grass. The crowd explodes with new offers, almost instantly raising the price to $21 million. Betty notes that they used to quietly put forward prices of $100, $200 million, but now almost no one raises the stakes, saying that life is important but getting the maximum benefit is even more important for them. Carl hugs Hank and tells Betty that the most important thing for people is deals with minimal costs, to which Betty tells Hank that he has a wonderful friend. Hank watches the stakes slowly rise and realizes that at this rate they will be stuck here until the morning and decides to stir them up. With these words, he again raises his hand and names the amount of $200 million the auctioneer says that Hank is ready to give an incredible amount for this treasure and asks others who will give the most. Other visitors are surprised that the price has risen so high, but understand that this medicine costs lives. Betty asks Hank how he is going to spend all the money he earns for her. Hank begins to look around and Betty asks him what he is looking for, to which he replies that he is looking for if he has another bride that he could spend money on. Betty grabs Hank's cheeks and tells him that he only has one fiancé, to which he says that he is hurt. Betty's father is surprised that someone as weak and disreputable as Hank would be the first to pay a heavy price, and notes that he originally just wanted to use the marriage to wield the power of the Dolly family. However, he notices that the Dolly family spares no expense and takes good care of Betty, giving her all their love and support, so as a father, he sees sincere feelings on his daughter's face. From his point of view, in today's auction, Shendu's company and the fourth Mr. Dolly have joined forces. And even if Hank rallies with his father, the result of the auction is still unknown. So even if his company loses in this auction, he will be calm for Betty, because she is happy now, and for him as a father, that's all that matters. At this point, Ragnar raises his hand and names the price for the grass as 500 million yuan. Everyone is surprised that the gentleman put up such a mind-boggling price with one hand. Hank's father decides that their grand competition has begun and raises the bet to 700 million yuan. Ragnar understands that to defeat his opponent he must play really big and raises the bet to a billion yuan, surprising all participants. Participants say that this is a real battle of the gods, since in just two bets the price has jumped for a billion, which in any case is an insignificant amount for them. Hank's father accepts his brother's challenge and raises the bet to one and a half billion yuan. However, Ragnar understands that he does not intend to give in to his brother so easily and raises the bet to two billion. Hank's father calmly looks at the needed grass and offers a price of three billion yuan for the grass. Ragnar decides that it's time to stop standing on ceremony with his relative and raises the bet to five billion. The bids continue to rise, quickly reaching 10 billion, and the auctioneer drops his gavel in shock. He sits down and asks in surprise what is happening at this auction. He asks in surprise whether the amount he heard was 10 billion. Hank's father raises the bet to 13 billion, still sitting calmly in his chair. His opponent responds by equally calmly raising the bet to 15 billion yuan, awaiting his opponent's next move. The auctioneer continues to be amazed at the size of these bids and says that he will now suffocate from the tension. Everyone freezes in anticipation of an answer, amazed at the amounts that the Dolly brothers are willing to spend on this grass. Betty and Hank also freeze in anticipation, realizing that something more is involved here. Hank mentally notes that this is the first time he sees the true power of his father, realizing that this is no longer a trade for goods. From his point of view, it is more like a struggle for territory between two predators, and the small animals can do nothing more than shake in fear. Hank mentally wonders what happened to his father and where his sense of proportion went. Uncle Tang grabs Hank's father and asks him to stop raising the bets, because these amounts are beyond their understanding. He adds that although this herb is precious, they cannot cultivate and grow it, so the medicine will be limited at best, and when it goes on sale, 
their profit will be about 20, 30 billion, which means the higher the price now, that they will earn less. So in the end, they simply will not be able to compensate for the expenses and costs. Hank's father hesitates for a moment and reflects on his business partner's words. Hong Lao mockingly tells Ragnar that their opponents are in turmoil, which means they will definitely win this deal. Ragnar says that he spent a lot of effort and a day, so they should reconsider their distribution method, to which Hung Lao asks Ragnar in surprise about why he is not satisfied with the 40 to 60 distribution. Ragnar says that Hung Lao is the owner of the established factory, adding that he will buy this medicine to cooperate with other factories that were robbed by people like him, so that they will then repay Ragnar with great benefits. Hong Lao shockingly asks Ragnar if he is really going to turn his back on Shendu's company, warning him that there are serious people behind them. Ragnar says that Shendu is an ordinary flawed company that doesn't have his brains, reminding them that they came to him begging for financial help, adding that he wants to take over his company even more, stipulating that either Hung Lao, we give him 90% and in addition share all the resources and connections, or he will simply swallow this grass alone. Hung Lao looks menacingly at Ragnar, shaking his finger at him, unable to say anything, shocked by the impudence of his business partner. The auctioneer excitedly asks the others if anyone else wants to raise their bids. Uncle Tang holds Hank's father's hand and shakes his head, begging him not to make a mistake. Hank irritably notes that, apparently, this grass will go to his father's brother after all. Hank tells Betty that, unfortunately, he will not be able to help her to which Betty says that there is nothing to worry about, since the fate of her family will be predetermined by Tang. The auctioneer continues to look into the room and again asks if anyone would like to raise the price. Visitors wonder where to raise the bid even higher, looking in surprise at the auctioneer and the Dolly brothers. Suddenly, a voice is heard throughout the entire hall, saying that he is ready to give 10 billion U.S. dollars for this treasure, which is equivalent to 71 billion yuan. All family members look around in surprise, trying to find the one who offered such a crushing sum. The auctioneer asks who is such a rich man who has such an incredible amount. The owner of this amount turns out to be Carl, who blithely replies that it will not be a problem for him. He adds that this amount is his pocket expenses, since his family is the owners of the largest casino in the Northern Hemisphere. Hank is surprised at how rich Carl is, to which he replies that he told him that he always has money. Hank says that people call him a spendthrift, but when he does things like that, they should idolize Carl. The auctioneer, his eyes bulging from such a sum, asks the audience if anyone wants to raise the price for this item. Stan asks his father if they will raise the bid, to which Ragnar says that this is not the price, but madness, adding that they will not participate in this bidding any further. Hung Lao looks at Ragnar menacingly, saying that he did not expect that he could not be relied upon. Stan asks his father if they will get in trouble for letting the people of Shendo's company down, to which he replies that they don't have what they need, so they don't need them. No one is willing to raise the bid, and the auctioneer sells the precious herb to Carl. The auction ends and all participants gather outside near the conference room. Hank's father sadly says that unfortunately he could not help him, to which he replies that he understands everything, since a real nightmare was happening at the auction. He adds that the main thing they need to discuss is whether Betty is worthy of becoming Hank's fiancé after their family falls into financial ruin. Hank says that he is an ordinary person, asking him if he really regretted his engagement, to which he replies that he has no regrets, since Betty is happy in this relationship. Hearing these words, Betty looks contentedly at Hank, looking at him with fascination. Hank's father says that his son has been in poor health since childhood but is now doing well and then expresses confidence that he will treat Betty well. Hank looks at his father in shock, somewhat surprised that there is so little time left before the wedding. Carl approaches Hank, asking him in surprise that he is getting married soon and congratulating him on the upcoming holiday. Hank turns to Carl and asks him if he is afraid that he might be robbed with a box worth $10 billion. Carl says that anyone who wants to steal something from him must at least be a boxing champion and throws the case to Hank. Hank manages to catch the case and asks Carl what the hell he is doing. Hank notes that this case is incredibly heavy, since it is probably filled with ice cubes, which means it weighs at least 100 kilograms, which means that Carl is not so simple, since he could hold it with just one hand. 
Hank tells Carl that it became clear to him that he is cool and asks to take this case from him, to which he replies that it was Hank who wanted this herb. Carl adds that this herb now belongs to Hank, since Carl himself probably uses it for other purposes, since it has no use for him. Betty, Uncle Tang, and Hank's father hear Carl and Hank's conversation and are surprised by what happened. Carl cannot bear the weight of this case and drops it on his foot, starting to jump on his other leg in pain. Carl approaches Hank and says that he has only one condition and asks him to bring him that vaunted medicine of the old Taoist, since he doesn't need anything else in life and gives him a business card, saying that he can drop by to see him whenever. Carl turns around and leaves, telling Hank that he can accept this as a wedding gift for him and his fiance. to which Hank replies that he will take note and offers him his business card, saying that they need to properly meet each other. Hank reintroduces and gracefully sends the card flying towards Carl. Carl easily catches the flying business card with two fingers and with a smile on his face says his full name again. Hank examines the lying case and says that he never expected a freebie in the form of an item worth several tens of billions. Turning to Uncle Tang, he says that this thing now belongs to him, to which he is surprised to note that it was worth billions of dollars. Hank notes that they came here specifically to get this miraculous herb for the Tang family, and despite the fact that everything did not go according to plan, they still ended up with this herb, which means it belongs to Uncle Tang. Betty's father says that he simply has no words, joyfully declaring that the Tang family, as well as her business, are now saved. Betty cuddles up to Hank and warmly thanks him for his help. She adds that she really appreciates his determination. Hank, smiling, affectionately tells Betty that all this is not her merit. Hank's father says that this kid just gave this herb to Hank, so part of the credit is his, adding that Carl's family is one of the top five richest families in the world and asks Hank how he managed to meet Carl, further noting that he spared no expense to purchase weed for Hank, which Hank is hesitant to answer honestly. Betty loudly tells Hank's father that she heard how Carl praised Hank for having something big and really wanted to be friends with him, to which Hank's father asks in surprise what Hank could have so big. Betty says that Hank told her that she would see it a little later, but Hank covers her mouth and says that Carl was impressed by Hank's big heart. Uncle Tang tells Hank's father that now that the herb is theirs, the company needs to start researching and producing the cure as soon as possible. Hank's father says that this is the right idea, but they should be careful so that their company is not robbed again. Uncle Tang said that their previous thefts were not due to weak security, but because of the thief's amazing ability to hide from all the established protections like a ghost. Hank says that ghosts don't exist, and perhaps the thief used some advanced technology to evade security, deciding to consult with Stella to avoid a possible repeat of the situation. The workers lift the box and begin to move towards the hero's car, while Hung Lao watches them from around the corner. He mentally asks Tang and his companions not to rejoice, saying that he will deal with them a little later. The next day, Betty's father tells Hank that they hid the herb in a safe place inside the laboratory and ordered all researchers to maintain complete confidentiality, to which Hank responds that he understands little about these matters, but hopes that they will make progress very soon. Uncle Tang tells Hank that all this was possible thanks to the actions of his great friend, to which Hank just chuckles nervously. Hank says that Betty told him that the thief was not seen on any security cameras, adding that the likelihood that their enemy used some kind of advanced technology is extremely high, and then says that among his acquaintances, there is a person who is extremely knowledgeable in technology, so he asked her to come and check everything, to which Uncle Tang said that he was ready to offer such a person a very high salary. Stella enters the room, saying that she is not particularly interested in the position and money, since one boss is enough for her. Betty tells her father that Stella is a true genius, to which he is surprised to note that she is incredibly young. Stella reports that as soon as she entered the building, she immediately saw that there were no problems with monitoring, which means the thief used the latest technological developments in the form of changing the refraction of light in such a way that the target could not be detected by the naked eye and video cameras. Betty's father says that now he understands how this thief was able to fool all the guards and go unnoticed, while Hank asks Stella if there is a way to reveal the thief to which Stella replies that she can create a special device that is sensitive to this effect for two days.
Hank mentally notes that although the body can be hidden, such tricks will not work with smell, which means it would not be a bad idea to get a small animal that reacts well to changes in the smells around it. Hank says that he will stay here until a contingency device is created, to which Betty says that there are many rooms in the house, so he can live here as long as he wants. Hank takes her at her word and asks her if he can stay in her room, somewhat embarrassing her. Stella approaches Hank, saying that she recently created a trinket and asks him if he would like to try it out right now. Hank agrees and Stella puts a bracelet on his hand, which at first glance does not look remarkable. Stella says that this device is a smaller version of a stereo projector with some modifications, to which Hank asks her how it works. Stella approaches Hank and asks him to press a button and scan Betty. The device starts up and begins scanning the body of Hank's fiance, and she asks Stella why this is needed, to which she replies that she will find out everything a little later. The device makes a characteristic click and reports that scanning the object is completed. Betty says that now everything is clear to her, suggesting that this thing is needed to project a copy of herself in three-dimensional space, like in their movie. Stella asks Hank to press another button, saying that now they will see everything. Hank presses a button saying that he has already seen stereo projectors in action, noting that they are very mysterious things. After pressing the button, the device lights up with a bright yellow light. The bracelet also creates two digital hoops that begin to move in different directions from Hank's hands, modifying it. After a few seconds, Hank's body completely transforms into Betty's body. Betty looks at the device's operation, her mouth agape in surprise, while Stella enthusiastically notes that the device works properly. Hank looks at himself, feeling strange emotions from his temporary body. Finally realizing what is happening, he screams in horror that this device has turned him into Betty. Stella says that immediately after scanning a person, he can outwardly look like him, adding that along with this, the body shape, voice, and clothing are also transmitted. Hank notes that he really likes this technology and examines his body. The first thing he decides to do is touch his breasts, and Betty asks him to stop doing this nonsense. Hank says that everything seems very realistic to the touch, and Betty shuts his mouth, ordering him to stop clowning around. Hank replies that he finally understands how girls feel when touched and tries to unbutton his skirt. Betty interrupts this circus by slapping Hank in the face. Hank says that this is one of the greatest inventions in the world, adding that it is perhaps the best, to which Betty only asks Stella how to turn it off. Meanwhile, somewhere in the city, a teacher leads a line of children singing a song, However, a truck driving down the road suddenly breaks down and is unable to stop. The driver is trying to figure out how to stop the car without injuring or killing anyone along the way. Suddenly he notices children walking along the pedestrian path and tries to shout to warn them to run out of the way. The truck crashes into the cars in front of it and, having slightly slowed down, rushes towards the small children. The teacher and the kids begin to scream in horror, accepting their inevitable and terrible end. However, suddenly someone's strong fist slams into the truck, forcing it to slow down. A girl who gets in the way of a truck stops the truck with her incredible strength, saving the children from certain death. Under the force of inertia, the driver flies forward through the windshield, but the girl intercepts him. The driver thanks her for saving the kids, but the girl doesn't answer him. The children enthusiastically look at their savior, who turns out to be a young girl with long red hair and a cold gaze. Passers-by are surprised how the girl was able to stop the truck with her bare hands and believe that she is some kind of superhero. The girl decides not to linger and throws the rescued person onto the asphalt, after which she quickly runs away to the joyful cries of the rescued children. She arrives at Shendu Tower, jumping to the upper floors using her incredible strength and agility. Going inside, she holds on to her hand, which does not stop smoking after the heavy truck stops. The girl performs several manipulations with her arm, and it suddenly separates from her shoulder. Behind her, company director Hong Lao appears out of nowhere. He says that they failed the auction, and the magic grass went to the Tang family, and adds that now everyone must be making fun of their company. But if she looks at them again and destroys the grass, their expressions on their faces will change dramatically. The girl asks Hong Lao why he wants to destroy her if she can decorate her, like everything that happened before, adding that there is nothing that she cannot have. 
Hong Lao says that this herb is known to everyone who is knowledgeable about the topic of medicine, and after the item is auctioned, it will not be available on other legal platforms, and if the herb is stolen, people will guess that Shen Du's company obtained the weed through inappropriate means. He adds that their company will have a long time to gain a foothold in the market, but if they want to do it now, they need to completely suppress Tang's company so they can't sit back and do nothing. From his point of view, the only way to kill two birds with one stone is to destroy this magical herb. The girl is surprised that Shen Du's company managed to lose the auction, despite the fact that they had the support of the Dali family, adding that she apparently was not very useful. Hong Lao says that they almost won, but from somewhere came the golden youth who bought the grass and gave it to Hank Dolly, adding that this Hank was weak from childhood and was diagnosed with necrosis of the limbs, but suddenly he turned out to be healthy as an ox, suggesting that there may be a stronger medicine in the world than this magical herb. The girl says that anything can be possible, drawing Hung Lao's attention to the fact that something is wrong with her cybernetic arm, adding that she will go on a sortie after curing it to which he replies that it is best to make a raid in a few days, so as not to arouse suspicion. Meanwhile, at Stan's house, his mother asks him why he brought this huge sword here. He adds that it's just an ordinary sword worth 100 million and it would be stupid to throw it away, to which his mother asks Stan to curb his ardor. She says that people were killed with these weapons, specifying that the Bodhisattva will be angry if this thing remains in their house. Stan's mom scolds him, saying that Ragnar told her how Stan and Hank competed at the auction, but Hank stopped in time, adding that despite Stan's statements about Hank's meager intelligence, it turned out that it was Stan who was the stupidest, who disgraced his father with his actions. Stan begins to make excuses, saying that this idea came to him suddenly, and he did not suspect that everything would end like this, accusing his mother of not protecting him, but only scolding him and calling him an idiot, despite the fact that their son is being bullied. Stan's mom tells Stan to shut his mouth and not dare to contradict his mother, adding that if anyone finds out what kind of nonsense Stan Daly is doing, then the whole family will be disgraced by him and demands that Stan get rid of this dirty thing and not bothered her during prayer. Stan comes out of his house and angrily says that because of Hank he was scolded by his own mother and decides to teach his hated cousin a lesson. He takes out the phone and orders his assistant to find him a good killer, to whom he can give a sword, with the help of which the killer must cut off Hank Dolly's leg, specifying that he only needs a professional in his field, after which he asks that the killer do the attack is not today, but in a few days. At the same time, somewhere in the mountains, a man is training the strength of his blows with his students. The man prepares for the blow and his students nervously swallow their saliva, realizing that now they will not be in trouble. The man concentrates for a while, and having gained spiritual strength, decides that the time has come to strike. The man strikes, knocking all of his students aside as if they weighed nothing. All students fall to the floor trying to get up, and the teacher restores the wasted chi energy. Having looked at the result of his blow, he concludes that his technique has become better. Dean Harrison, who observed this demonstration, calls the master the name Logan, noting that in the whole world there is no one who could compare with him in strength. Logan thanks Harrison for his praise, telling him not to flatter him, to which he asks him if he remembers their agreement. Logan replies that he remembers that in exchange for funding his martial arts center, he must kill some young man who framed Harrison. Harrison says that Logan remembers the terms of the deal correctly and asks him when he can begin the task. Logan says that he is currently suffering from hemorrhoids, so he will begin the task in a few days. A few days later at night, the owl scans the surrounding area in search of prey. She jumps from a tree branch, flying over the Tang Company house, turning her head around. Hank, who has been controlling the owl all this time, notes that so far everything looks clean. Hank reflects that after several days of careful surveillance, he has not identified any abnormalities, suggesting that the thief has decided to give up, but still decides not to let his guard down. Hank thinks that the thief decided to surrender due to the large number of guards and a change in approach to duty and better control at checkpoints. Hank stands up and is surprised that a spoiled young gentleman like him would decide to stay here to guard one thing, suggesting that his decision was definitely influenced by Betty's beauty. Betty knocks on Hank's door, saying that his favorite fairy has finally come to him. 
Hank opens the door and asks Betty why the fairy came down to his room, to which she just giggles maliciously. She hands Hank a basket of food and asks him to guess what she has prepared for him. Hank says that he doesn't have to wonder about it since he will eat everything she makes for him, to which Betty replies that Hank is great at flattery. Betty lifts the lid of the container and solemnly presents her dish. Betty says that this culinary miracle is called baking, and she will not accept any objections from Hank. Hank looks at the terribly burnt dish and is lost in the possible options to refuse such a gift of fate. Betty upsetly notices that Hank doesn't like her cooking, looking at him with tear-filled eyes. Hank says that this is not true and begins to choke on burnt pies. Barely holding back the urge to vomit, Hank tells Betty that her cooking is simply amazing. Betty says that she wanted to prank him, and she herself knew that they were burnt. But she did not expect that he would seriously start eating it, handing him a piece of candy to take away the taste of the burnt food. Hank says that unfortunately one piece of candy will not get rid of this bitterness, to which Betty says that she will now bring him some water. Hank says he doesn't need water and asks her to give him something that will make him feel much better, to which Betty asks what he means. Instead of explaining, Hank grabs Betty by the hand and pulls her towards him, kissing her tenderly on the lips. Betty briefly switches off from the overabundance of love emotions and hangs in Hank's strong arms. Having come to her senses, she gently hits him, saying that she will kill him, to which Hank only chuckles affectionately. Meanwhile, deep night falls on the city and everyone goes about their business. One of the members of the security squad tells his commander that he feels sick to his stomach. The commander is surprised at how one person can cause so many problems, noting that this is not the first time that this soldier has been asked to take time off for this reason, saying that he should not be delayed and return to duty quickly. The security guard retires to the restroom and calls his girlfriend, saying that tomorrow he will receive his salary and they will finally meet. The security guard's girlfriend flirtatiously tells him not to be distracted from his work, to which he says that his employer works day and night, so he doesn't care about them, noting that in this job he gets the easiest money in his life. Someone quietly opens the door to the security guard's booth, but he continues to say that at the beginning he was afraid that killers might get into the building, but then he realized that no killers exist in the 21st century. He barely manages to finish his words when the stranger in the suit knocks him out with one blow. The killer, armed with Stan Dolly's sword, decides to dress up as a security guard in order to get close to Hank undetected. Meanwhile, in a detachment patrolling the territory, one of the soldiers addresses the commander with the words that their colleague has not yet returned. The commander tells his subordinates not to be distracted and to contact him, to which they respond that nothing could happen to him and he is just lazy. One of the patrolmen suggests that the commander look for a blind spot to smoke, to which he replies that this is a good plan. The guards find the nearest blind spot in the surveillance cameras and sit down to smoke and begin to share their guesses about what is happening behind the walls of the laboratory. The commander says that they should not worry about this, since their task is the usual protection of the territory for a lot of money. They add that if someone comes here, they will easily punish all violators. Suddenly, strangers throw bags over the guards' heads, preventing them from screaming. They drag them into the bushes and knock them out, making sure none of it is caught on CCTV. Master Logan and his students dress up as guards, and the student asks him if they really decided to break into the laboratory in this guise and beat up Hank Daly, adding that if they make the slightest mistake, they will all be finished. The master turns to his student and asks him if he really thinks that he was just delaying the moment adding that it was not for nothing that he pretended to have hemorrhoids for several days, because after all these payments, if they just run away, their reputation will come to an end. Logan says that they need to blend in with the crowd of security officers and get to Hank Daly, after which he will beat him to a pulp and they will disappear unnoticed, completing the task. Another security detachment approaches them and tells them to stop smoking and get to work quickly. All security officers return to their posts and continue to patrol the area. Meanwhile, a cybernetic girl arrives at the building inspecting the perimeter. Hong Lao contacts her and says that she needs to sneak into the building and destroy the grass, adding that she must under no circumstances get into trouble, since he found out that Hank Dolly is in this building. The girl tells Hung Lao that he can sleep peacefully and switches several toggle switches on his cybernetic hand. She goes into stealth mode and says that no one can unlock the power of her technology. The girl jumps down, 
when suddenly a whole squad from the company security service appears in front of her. Without noticing the invisible thief even at point-blank range, they pass by, telling each other that they should not let their guard down, since now is the right time for an invasion. Meanwhile, the killer sent by Stan changes into a security guard's uniform in the toilet. He says that he expected much more from the security and is surprised that no one even paid attention to the missing employee. He comes out of the closet with thoughts that he needs to mingle with the guards and get closer to Hank Daly. He immediately runs into Logan and his students and they all mistake each other for real security officers. One of Logan's students whispers to him that this man is also a member of the fourth group, which means he can guess that they made their way here. They look at each other, and the killer also understands that the people he meets wear the same badge as him. The tense silence is interrupted by another security detachment, which tells the entire fourth group that they are fooling around again, instead of high-quality patrolling the territory. Having received a scolding, Logan and his students and the killer mix into one formation and head further down the corridor. Meanwhile, an invisible thief walks along the corridor in search of the necessary room. Suddenly, she notices a bat circling next to her. The bat uses echolocation and detects the presence of an invisible girl. Hank, who controls the bat, is happy that he has finally discovered the long-awaited thief. He turns to Stella, telling her that he has discovered the intruder, and asks her if her device is ready, to which she asks him how he knew that the thief was already here. Hank replies that if he didn't have any abilities, he wouldn't be able to become her boss. Stella says that she needs another ten minutes, saying that unfortunately the thief can manage to get into the laboratory during this time. Hank tells Stella that she can entrust this to him, since he will detain the thief. I hope that this will not cause him much trouble. With these words, he turns towards Betty to check if she is fast asleep. He notices that Betty is tossing and turning anxiously from a restless sleep. Smiling, Hank chuckles lightly and moves into position. Meanwhile, Logan, his students, and the killer continue their journey in search of Hank. Logan thinks that the person they selected from Group 4 is up to something and decides to eliminate him. Another student quietly whispers to the others to mentally count to three and attack the stranger. Having counted to three, Logan and his students rush at the killer who brings up the rear of their line. The killer assumes that he has been discovered and understands that there is no turning back for him. He takes out his sword and with one blow kills the students who rushed at him, at the same time cutting their shields and clubs. Without having time to look back, Master Logan sees the lifeless bodies of his students at his feet. Beside himself with rage, Logan shouts at the killer that he will smear him against the wall and throws a police shield at him. Taking advantage of the distraction, he delivers a powerful blow to the killer with his fist, but he manages to cover himself with his shield. The impact splits the police shield into pieces and the killer draws his sword once more. Moving a little away from each other, Logan and the killer study each other with menacing glances, realizing that this fight will not be easy. Suddenly, Logan feels severe pain in his arm, signaling that he has suffered a moderate injury. However, the killer also understands that Logan's blows were not in vain and presses his injured hand to himself. They both reflect on the fact that it was a surprise to them that the Tang family would think of hiring such a strong guard with good fighting skills. Suddenly, their attention is drawn to a noise in a nearby building, and they turn around, noticing Hank Daly in the window. The killer realizes that it's time to end this and spits out a small ball at his feet. A fallen ball explodes upon contact with the ground, creating a smoke screen. Once the smoke clears, Logan discovers that the killer has disappeared and assumes that he ran for help. He asks his students to lie here, promising to return for them later, adding that now there is no turning back. Meanwhile, the cybernetic thief continues to carefully walk along the corridors in search of the necessary room. After some time, she stumbles upon Hank Daly sitting there and is surprised that he decided to sleep in such a place. She wonders what could have forced this man to sit here. However, she immediately decides not to waste time, since in her opinion, Hank still doesn't see her. She walks a few meters when suddenly Hank asks her to stop. The girl turns around in surprise, not believing her ears, she asks Hank who he is talking to, looking closely at him. Hank replies that there is no one in this room except the two of them, and asks her if she thinks he snuck in here just to sleep. The girl asks him how he can see her if he sits with his eyes closed. Hank tells the girl that he doesn't need eyes to see her. He adds that it changes the refraction of light to achieve invisibility, but this will not work against ultrasonic waves. 
The girl says that she is not particularly interested in her explanations and draws her energy blade. She concludes that since Hank was able to reveal her, she will have to finish him off. With these words, she swings to strike, but Hank manages to scan her movements with the help of a bat. He dodges in time, ending up a few meters away from her in a split second. The girl watches in shock as Hank skillfully dodges and asks him who he is. Hank strikes a heroic pose and introduces himself, saying that today he is her main enemy. The girl is surprised that Hank turns out to be the very person she was told about. Hank says he had no idea his name had become so popular and asks her if she would like an autograph. The girl replies that she doesn't care who he is, since he got in her way and rushes to attack again. Hank scans the room again with the bat's sonar and understands the trajectory of the girl's strike. Hank notes that his reaction and speed are far superior to that of a normal human because his body has undergone various enhancements. Saying that he had already kicked a person once before, he delivers a crushing blow to his opponent's leg. He adds that none of his opponents will escape this fate and a dull metallic knock is heard in the corridor. The girl gives Hank a depressingly disappointed look and calls him a complete idiot. Hank, who had not foreseen that his opponent's body was made of metal, began to writhe in unbearable pain. He grabs his leg with both hands and says that it was incredibly bigger, accusing his opponent of being too cruel. The girl decides not to bother Hank with an answer and pierces his shoulder with her energy blade. After this blow, she stabs him in the stomach with her mechanical leg, throwing the protagonist several meters back. Clearing his throat, Hank struggles to his feet, realizing that his connection to the bat is now severed. The thief decides that it is time to end this battle and swings for the decisive blow. Hank mentally says that it's all over, since he can't see his opponent, which means he won't be able to dodge. Suddenly someone comes into the hallway, noticing Hank sitting on the ground, ready to accept his fate. This man turns out to be Master Logan, who recognizes Hank Daly and realizes that he has a good opportunity to get even with him. He prepares for the blow, mentally saying that now he will smash Hank against the wall. However, without noticing the girl, he crashes into her, pushing her forward. The girl flies forward to the other end of the corridor in which an assassin sent by Stan Daly appears. The killer notices Hank and the supposed guard, noticing that they are badly injured and decides that he has a great opportunity to cut off both of Hank's legs. He rushes forward and immediately crashes into the metal body of the invisible thief. Hank comes to his senses and notices that on either side of him there are two unconscious bodies from among the company's security guards. He frantically turns his head around and wonders where they came from. Master Logan and the assassin lie on the ground, trying to figure out what stopped them from striking. The thief rises on her elbows and wonders whether these two guards who came to Hank's aid can also see her. Meanwhile, Stella, having completed the development of her device, runs to the designated installation site for the device. She installs the device outside the complex and activates it from the built-in panel. The device is activated and the entire building is subjected to a special scan. The thief gets to her feet and is surprised to notice that her camouflage is coming out. Hank notices the girl and says that now he can finally see what she looks like, surprised that his opponent turned out to be a robot and then asks who created her, noting that he is ready to pay any money for it. The girl grabs her lower back, saying that now that he has opened it, she is obliged to finish off everyone in this room. Hank backs away in fear, ordering the lying guards to grab the annoying thief, Killer asks Hank in surprise if he is contacting him, to which he replies that he doesn't see any more guards here, saying that they pay them money for a reason. The girl looks angrily at the killer and says that she will first get rid of them with great pleasure, unsheathing her blade again. The killer dodges the thief's first blow, but she immediately overtakes him and presses him against the wall with her foot to finish him off. Hank lifts Master Logan to his feet and asks him not to stand there, but to help his squad mate. With these words, he pushes him towards the girl, and she shouts to him that he will also go to the other world, and Master Logan and the killer mentally note that this robot girl is too fierce, and they need to get out of this situation alive. They continue their battle with the cybernetic thief, while Hank selflessly stands on the sidelines and encourages them by saying that he will pay 50 million yuan to anyone who can tie up the thief. However, the girl easily copes with her opponents, throwing them to the sides. Master Logan and the assassin sent are mentally surprised that the situation has gone into a strange direction, adding that they only wanted to get to Hank Daly and finish him off. But now, for some reason, they are protecting him. 
The girl delivers a powerful punch to Logan, knocking him back. Logan breaks through the glass with his body, flying into another building from the incredible force of the robotic thief's blow. Having dealt with one enemy, the girl grabs the killer by the throat, not allowing him to resist. She lifts him off the ground, preparing to finish him off with her blade. The killer understands that if he doesn't do at least something now, he will come to an end and takes out his blade, stabbing her into his opponent's robotic joint. The girl screams that she's had enough and pushes the killer into the wall, turning her back to Hank and Logan. Logan, watching the battle from another building, angrily notes that his opponent is an incredibly evil beast. He charges his energy strike with the thought that now he will show her exactly how painful he can hit back, adding that now she will not get off so easily. With that said, he uses the key destruction palm skill and shoots an energy beam from his palm. The girl does not have time to react, and she is pierced by an energy beam, causing significant damage to her mechanisms. Under the influence of an energy strike, the girl's hand is crushed and separated from her body, and the girl angrily turns towards Logan. She points her other hand in his direction, from which a miniature rocket appears. Logan only manages to plaintively ask her not to do this, but a second later a powerful explosion throws him aside. The sound of the explosion makes the whole company perk up and the alarm sounds about an enemy invasion. Hank tries to get rid of the smoke caused by the explosion with his hand and looks around. Clearing his throat and taking a closer look, he notices that neither the thief nor the two guards are at the battle site. He wonders where everyone went and notices a robotic arm left on the floor. Betty, who jumped up from the noise, and Stella, who returned to the Tang Company building, come running to Hank's rescue. Running up to Hank, Betty excitedly asks him if he is okay and if he has any injuries. Hank tells his fiance that everything is fine with him and turns to Stella with the words that she should study this hand and find out what technologies were used to create it, as well as what it is capable of. He adds that they missed the incredible carnage between two guards and a robotic girl, adding that unfortunately these guards disappeared somewhere, although he wanted to reward them. Stella says that recently it became known that one of the guards was knocked out and his clothes were taken, so there is a high probability that there is an outsider wandering around somewhere. Hank thinks about this, noting that the two guards were looking at him rather strangely and wonders who sent them. Meanwhile, somewhere in the distance, Master Logan ponders how it all could have ended this way, lamenting that instead of getting rid of Hank Daly, he simply ran away. Dean Harrison meets him and notes that Logan does not look the best and asks him if he was able to kill Hank. Logan bows respectfully to Dean Harrison and says that he failed in the task and asks Dean to find someone else for the task. Dean Harrison yells at Logan, telling him that he helped him so much before, and now he turns away from him, angrily adding that Logan pretends to be a tough master, but in reality, he is just a pathetic charlatan. Logan's self-esteem does not allow him to tolerate such insults, and he subdues Harrison with a powerful slap in the face. He sternly tells Harrison that he made incredible sacrifices for him, which ultimately came back to haunt him in the form of the loss of two of his students, after which he adds that Harrison himself would deal with Hank Daly. Dean Harrison, upset, asks Logan why he treats him so cruelly and gets personal. Meanwhile, a representative from the Assassin's Guild contacts Stan Daly and says that unfortunately the Assassin's mission failed, adding that the Assassin has already been eliminated, but the sword is likely left at the scene of the alleged murder. Stan angrily throws the phone and begs Hank not to dare expose him, otherwise he will kill his whole damn family. At this time, Betty treats the wounds on Hank's back using special technologies from the Tang family. She takes the spray bottle and shakes it gently before using it. Betty sprays Hank's wound and it heals within seconds. Hank is surprised to note that the cure was very fast and asks Betty if she used what he thought of. Betty says that Hank guessed correctly clarifying that this is a medicine that her father and other people created based on the essence of the Tianyang herb, which promotes the rapid healing of wounds, and then says that Hank was lucky that he was the first to try it, noting that after mass production it will sell very well. She says that the crisis is over, so finally the Tang family has calm days, adding that her dad said that Hank deserves gratitude, so now Hank becomes one of the shareholders of the company, and he can receive money even just by lying on his bed. Hank is pleased to note that apparently he will again earn incredible money, after which he adds that in his opinion the time has come for Betty to fulfill her promise. 
Betty looks at Hank blankly and asks him what promise he is talking about. Hank gently touches Betty's chin and says that she herself told him that when the difficult times passed, she would marry him and cook for him every day. Betty says she forgot about it and turns around and runs away. Hank looks lovingly after his bride, thinking that Betty was in vain to give up her words. Stella comes into Hank's room and asks him for a moment. Stella hands Hank the sword, saying that she found it at the scene, and asks what to do with it, adding that it was probably dropped by the person who tried to break into the Tang Company building. Hank takes the sword and notes that it looks very familiar to him. He unsheathes the sword, remembering that it is a legendary sword that cuts through iron, noting that Stan Dolly must have had it, and wondering how it ended up here. Stella says that one security guard was knocked out in the toilet in order to take his clothes, to which Hank asks her what the person who carried out such a complex operation could need, to which she replies that, according to her assumption, the only reason could be an attempt to kill Hank. Stella says that the killer has already escaped, and the competitors are unlikely to admit that it was set up by them, to which Hank replies that he has nothing to argue with that. He concludes that it is already clear to him that his cousin is behind this, since he hates him terribly and even turned a blind eye to their family connection, adding that he will conduct his own investigation, and if it turns out that it really was him, then from Hank's point of view it would be very tactless not to fight him back. With these words, he takes out his phone and dials his assistant, asking him to find people for him and prepare the car. A few hours later, Stan Daly's residence is illuminated by the rays of the dawn sun, Stan Daly sleeps peacefully in his bed, unaware of the clouds approaching him. The peaceful sleep of the treacherous cousin is interrupted by the loud roar of biker motorcycles. He jumps up in his bed and hears a chorus of male voices outside the window, thanking Stan Daly for the precious sword. He angrily opens the curtains and asks loudly about who dared to shout under his windows at such an early hour. He discovers that a whole motorcade of bikers and one expensive car is standing in front of his windows. The passenger window of the car rolls down and behind it is none other than Hank Dolly, looking at Stan with a malicious smile. Lost for words with anger, Stan looks menacingly at his cousin. Hank commands his entourage to continue their solemn shouts and praise. Stan literally boils with anger, mentally sending all possible curses at Hank. Going down to the porch of his residence, he irritably asks Hank what the hell Hank is doing so early in the morning. Hank says that Stan need not worry adding that he came here to thank him for the powerful sword that he gave him, adding that he could not even think that after lengthy bidding and such a large amount of money that Stan had to give, he was going to give the sword to his younger cousin, thanking him again. Stan asks Hank where he got the sword, demanding it back, threatening to sue him for theft if Hank refuses. Hank says that someone found it and gave it to him today, asking Stan if he sent the sword to Hank as a gift, additionally asking if anyone wanted to harm him with the weapon. Hank angrily says that he will not leave this just like that, declaring that some impudent person stole a valuable item from Stan and also tried to harm Hank with it, adding that this is a big crime and he is going to call the police. Stan mentally notes that since the killer has been eliminated, the case is unlikely to reach him. Hank alone is a rather insidious person and may be hiding some kind of ace up his sleeve, after which he remembers that there is a family meeting coming up, so he would better avoid problems. He suddenly changes his face and tells Hank that he often rambles while asleep, adding that earlier he gave this sword to someone, and Hank can keep this sword for himself and treats it as a given gift. Hank says that since the sword was not used to harm him, there is no point in calling the police, adding that he really liked the sword, to which Stan says that he is very glad to hear that. However, in his heart, Stan notes that Hank is incredibly annoying to him, and the next opportunity he gets he will definitely finish him off. Hank says that since he happened to have Stan's thing, he also has to give him something. Stan looks at the gift, saying that it looks very intriguing, and asks Hank what is in there. Hank's assistant lifts the cloth and shows Stan the pig's head, looking at Stan with dead eyes. Stan, furious, asks Hank if this is a hint that he is a pig head, to which Hank says that it is just a friendly gift. Hank explains that the pig is a very important animal as it symbolizes prosperity and wealth, and his gift signifies his joy at being rich. Stan is seething with anger and tries to squeeze out at least some words, but nothing comes of it. After a few seconds, he says that he is not angry, saying that Hank can play with him for a few more days, 
adding that in a few days there will be a family meeting, and then the time will come when Hank will finally cry in despair. Hank responds that it's just a family meeting and he's not going to it, adding that it's just a fight for career rankings and funding. Stan tells Hank that this meeting will definitely not be like the previous one. He says that this time the head of the family wants to give up his place, which means the next head will be chosen, adding that of his father's five brothers. The eldest has died, the second does not stand out in any way, and the third lives abroad, so he will be vying for the post of head father and Hank's father. Hank asks Stan what's so special about the position, ironically suggesting that once a person receives the position, he becomes the emperor of the world. Stan replies that the position of the head is incomparable to the position of the emperor, but he can change the structure of the assets of the Dolly family and control the development of the clan enterprise, which means that if his father becomes the head of the clan, then Hank's family is unlikely to have such good resources as now. Stan says that once his family takes this place, the first thing he will do is destroy Hank's family and drive them out onto the street to give Hank a taste of poverty. Stan says that they already want to appoint his father as the head of the clan and smiles maliciously, looking into Hank's eyes. He chuckles and leaves, saying that Hank can keep the pathetic sword, which he can then sell to buy himself some food. Hank gives his entourage the command to move out and the motorcade goes to Hank Dolly's residence. Sitting in the car, he checks the performance of the device made by Stella and presses the button. After a few seconds, he turns into his cousin Stan and says that he is unlikely to face poverty. Early the next morning, Hank arrives at his father's office to question him about the upcoming family meeting and the candidacy of Ragnar Dali. The father asks Hank how he knew about such things, adding that such things are usually not talked about publicly. Hank says his cousin Stan told him about all this, Hank's father says that a unanimous internal decision is impossible, since the election of the head of the Dolly family is a public vote, so Ragnar will not be able to bribe absolutely all the relatives, adding that judging by the circumstances, there will also be some problems with the internal decision. Hank looks at his father in surprise and asks him what he means. Hank's father tells him that his first uncle is dead, the second is abroad, and the third knows nothing about business which means everything will revolve around him and his brother, adding that from a business point of view, he and Ragnar are equal, and each has an opportunity not only to earn money, but also to take care of the family. But for the family, it is necessary to take into account not only the abilities of the next head of the family. From his point of view, if it turns out that he is chosen as the head of the family, then it is unlikely that he will offer Stan as the next head of the family, because his choice, of course, will go in favor of Hank, however, due to the fact that Hank is in poor health and even was on the verge of death. None of the family members would want Hank to choose him. Hank says that now he understands why Ragnar behaves so self-confidently, as if victory is already in his pocket. Hank's father confirms his son's suspicions, saying that Stan will not be considered the ideal heir, but he is healthier than Hank adding that family members will naturally be inclined to have the fourth line of the family become the head, so it is no exaggeration to say that this is will be an internal decision. Hank asks his father what they should do, adding that Stan stated that when they get this title, he will do everything to ensure that Hank's family ends up on the streets begging. Hank's father thoughtfully replies that he doubts that Hank faces such a fate, adding that their family has enough money and influence that he could sit quietly idle all his life, but in the future their family may lose the right to speak and offers Hank next time be nicer to Stan. Hank annoyedly says that he has had enough of this life and he will not tolerate such humiliation for his family. After ten days, a meeting begins at the main estate of the Dolly family and all participants arrive there by car. An expensive sports car drives up to a luxurious garden and a woman's shoe drops to the ground. A young girl gets out of the car and examines the estate, noting that she has not been here for a long time. The girl is greeted by her cousin, calling her by name Clara, and telling her that he is very glad to see her. Relatives surround her, saying that she has become an incredible beauty and now looks like a real queen. She mentally notes that she doesn't remember any of these people since it's been several years since they last saw each other, but decides that she just needs to keep smiling at everyone. Suddenly an exclamation is heard from the ranks of relatives that the fourth Uncle Dolly has arrived at the meeting and everyone turns in his direction. Ragnar politely raises his hand, respectfully greeting everyone present. 
relatives head towards him, politely greeting him and pushing their children to show respect to Mr. Ragnar. Clara mentally rejoices that they finally left her behind with questions about life. Relatives also surround Stan, saying that he has become incredibly handsome and expressing a desire to attend his wedding. Stan understands that his relatives' flattery is due to the fact that they have all heard enough gossip that his father will soon become the successor, and notes that he really likes this state of affairs. After some time, the car of the fifth Mr. Dolly arrives at the place. Clara joyfully greets Hank's father, to which he replies that he is incredibly glad to see her. Clara asks Hank's father why he came alone and where his son is now. However, seconds later, a heavily coughing Hank emerges from the car, accompanied by his stunning bride. Betty asks Hank in a whisper why he walks with a cane again, to which he replies that no one knows that he has gotten better yet, so for now he will pretend, to which Betty aptly remarks that with this maneuver, Hank wants to knock him off. To the benefit of his opponents, sarcastically adding that her betrothed is incredibly insidious. Clara is happy that Hank decided to come, to which he says that Clara looks great today, causing her to chuckle shyly. Hank's father tells the youngsters to chat while he goes to sit down. Relatives unanimously admire Betty's beauty, mentally only regretting that such a beautiful girl is in a relationship with a man who has one foot in the grave. Stan rudely asks Hank why he started limping again. Hank, with the skill of a true actor, says that he fell for two days and his legs again stopped working, adding that the doctor said that there was nothing wrong with it, and he just needed to take medicine, after which he naturally coughs. Stan falls for this trick and reflects that with such a cough, lung cancer is just a stone's throw away, adding that Hank's disability will play into his hands because in this condition, Hank will be an extremely unfavorable candidate for heir to the head of the Dolly family. He pretends to be a caring relative and tells his relatives not to bother Hank while he is so unwell. He turns to Clara and with a tough guy face tells her that she will come with him. However, his attempt is interrupted by Betty, who says that they have found a common language and do not yet plan to stop talking, after which Clara says that she is the same age as Betty, which means she will not disappear anywhere. Stan stops pretending and says that he will not persuade her, but she must understand that this time his father has every chance of winning, so she better not be mistaken in choosing her allies adding that she knows how to do business well, but without approval and support from the head of the family, she is unlikely to be able to overcome all difficulties. Betty threateningly shouts at Stan that nothing has been decided yet, so he shouldn't intimidate others with his fairy tales. Stan says that Betty should think about his words, expressing pity that she has to be with such a non-entity like Hank, and adds that she would be much better off with him, as she would live in luxury. Betty angrily swears at Stan, to which he says that he is giving her one last chance, warning her not to cry or beg him later. He leaves, giggling quietly, and Betty shouts after him that this will never happen. Clara reflects that Hank really does seem like a real wuss, who can't say a word in defense of his fiancée, even when they are so openly trying to disgrace her. Stan's relatives begin to approach him and try to please him by offering him cigarettes, to which he replies that if his father becomes the head of the clan, then each of them will benefit from it. Hank continues to pretend that he is unwell and hears his cell phone ringing. The caller informs Hank that the article is ready and asks him if it is worth releasing it now, to which Hank replies that it is better to hold off on this for now, since he wants to give Stan some time to brag. Meanwhile, all conversations are drowned out by the noise of the helicopter blades, which begins to carefully descend onto the estate. The helicopter lands on the ground, slowly turning off its engines, and after a while a tall, strong man emerges from it. He examines the crowd of guests, saying that it has become quite noisy here. Relatives run to the man, joyfully calling him grandfather, and he sits down, joyfully hugging the children, saying that he is very glad to see everyone. Hank wipes his mouth with a handkerchief and asks Clara who this man is, causing genuine shock to appear on her face. Clara asks Hank in surprise if he is crazy, saying that this man is the head of the Dolly family and the one who created the family's great business, adding that his name is Winston Dolly. Hank looks back at his grandfather and sees how happy he is to see so many relatives around him. Hank lightheartedly replies that the illness may have begun to take its toll on him, since his memory of everything is very vague. He mentally notes that he is seeing his grandfather for the first time in his life. 
Ragnar and his wife greet their grandfather respectfully, and he nods politely to them. Hank's father and his wife greet grandfather in the same way, and he answers them just as respectfully. One of Grandpa Winston's assistants invites everyone to come inside, adding that it's time to greet Grandpa and receive envelopes. Everyone goes into the main hall and lines up in several rows, waiting for Grandpa Winston to announce the start of the welcoming ceremony. Grandfather approaches a richly decorated bench and sits down on it. Assistant Winston asks everyone in order of age to greet the main Mr. Dolly. One of the relatives tells his son to come up to his grandfather and bend down to greet him. The eldest son of the first Mr. Dolly and his son greet Grandfather Winston, saying that they wish him good health and long life. Grandpa Winston sincerely thanks his grandson and great-grandson and asks how their business is doing. The son of the first Mr. Dolly says that despite the death of his father, his family helps them, so his business is doing very well. Grandfather says that support should always be there, and it is the foundation of everything, so as long as the Dolly family does everything side by side, they will develop and exist in this world after which he asks the assistant to give his great-grandson a large red envelope. The great-grandson sincerely thanks Winston and is surprised at how huge the wallet is. Hank notes that Grandpa Winston is quite kind and seems to place great importance on the unity of the family and all relatives. However, it is still unknown how he feels about Hank, previously suggesting that it is necessary to make a good impression on him anyway. Winston's second son greets him, saying that he brought all the younger ones to greet him, to which his grandfather happily says that the second son very rarely comes to his homeland, which means each of them will receive an envelope. Hank realizes that this must be the same second uncle who lives abroad and does not return to his homeland because he has his own business, noting that all members of his family have foreign citizenship, so he voluntarily refused to be the heir to the head of the family. One of Winston's sons says that his brother set a good example for him, so he also brought the whole family to greet him, to which Winston replies with pride and respect that this son's family devoted themselves to science, and despite the fact that among them there are no heirs to his original occupation, they are dear to him just like everyone else, and he also hands them an envelope. Stan happily tells his father that now it's finally their turn. Ragnar approaches to pay his respects to Grandfather Winston, but Stan falls to his knees and slavishly greets his grandfather, bowing deeply and repeatedly. Hank and everyone else among those present look at this performance in surprise, not knowing what to say. Grandpa laughs and tells Stan that only children under ten need to bow, asking him with kind irony if he really wants to snatch his cousin's envelopes. Stan says that he doesn't need red envelopes, and he just wants to wish him happiness as big as the sea, longevity like the mountains, and boundless luck. Betty tells Hank that this flattery trick will serve as excellent propaganda for the fourth master, to which Hank says that Stan is just showing his attention, believing that it is time for him to show himself too. With that, he bursts out into another loud cough, causing Stan to stop talking and look back. All the other relatives whisper excitedly about Hank coughing like he has lung cancer. Winston's grandfather asks what happened and who got so bad. Hank quietly says that it made him feel bad and continues to cough while Betty holds his hand. Hank falls to the ground theatrically, and Grandpa Winston asks someone to urgently fetch a chair for Hank. Hank says that he hasn't seen his grandfather for a very long time and he missed him very much, adding that every time he thought about their meeting. Winston says that deep down he admires Hank, since he was an obedient child from an early age, but he cannot with a calm heart watch Hank get worse and worse. Hank introduces his fiancée to Grandpa, saying that he brought her here to meet her, after which Betty politely and respectfully greets him. Winston recognizes Betty, saying that he is a comrade in arms with her grandfather, saying that the decision about their wedding was made by them, and asks her not to offend Hank, expressing the hope that everything will work out very well for them, to which Betty replies that Hank is very kind to her, and on the contrary, she wants to thank him for this decision. Grandfather Winston says that this is wonderful news, and he is only glad to hear it, asking him to hand over the largest envelope. Hank quietly asks Betty if the pity game or sycophancy worked on Grandpa, to which Betty snorts, saying that no one asked him. Stan looks sadly at the floor, realizing that he was beaten on his own field. Grandfather concludes that he is very happy that all the members of the Dolly family can gather together today, adding that he is even more pleased to see his family becoming more and more prosperous 
then says that originally, it was supposed to be an ordinary family meeting, which is held every three years. He says that today, every young person who has business acumen but suffers from lack of finances will have a wonderful opportunity to improve his financial situation. According to him, today they will begin the real competition. But before that, his assistant will review the personal achievements of each participant. He adds that the whole family will help him determine the winner by voting for the most worthy. Grandfather Winston says that these actions are designed to help newcomers who have encountered temporary difficulties and setbacks, but hope to make progress, and those people whose business is in full swing are not participating in the competition. Grandfather says that the meeting will begin in the afternoon and invites everyone to go to the dining room and be sure to refresh themselves. The grandfather sits surrounded by his sons and joyfully talks with them about life. All relatives chat animatedly and raise toasts to each other. Hank sits with his bride and encourages her to eat and not be shy, because these tables are full of food and cannot be allowed to spoil. Stan looks at Hank and mentally curses him for stealing everyone's attention in front of his grandfather, but now he will find a way to embarrass him in front of everyone. Noticing the waitress walking, he realizes that this opportunity is now right in front of him. He trips the girl and she drops the hot pot, which flies towards Hank. Hank deftly dodges and a pot of very hot soup lands right on his table mate's face. Screams of incredible pain are heard throughout the dining room. Hank looks anxiously as his neighbor tries to remove the pot of boiling soup. As soon as he manages to do this, he looks around menacingly and asks who did it. The waitress lying on the floor says that she did not do this on purpose as she tripped. Grandpa and his sons look around at the noise, trying to figure out what happened. The traumatized relative says he doesn't believe her, to which she says she's really sorry. Stan sits in his seat, mentally glad that no one noticed his crime. However, his triumph is interrupted by a child who loudly says that he saw how Stan tripped the waitress. Stan threateningly demands from the child that he stop talking nonsense, otherwise he will beat him right here. The relative shouts menacingly to Stan that he is in trouble now and throws a plate of noodles at him. However, Stan dodges this throw and a plate of noodles flies into his sister's face. She angrily asks him what the hell he's doing, to which he replies that he wasn't aiming at her at all. However, this does not impress her and she responds to him in the same way by throwing food at him. The food flies at someone else and a fight breaks out, and the rest of the food starts flying all over the room. The entire hall is filled with the noise of a fight and flying dishes. Hank and Betty sit blankly at their desks, trying to figure out why things have come to this point. Grandfather irritably shouts for everyone to stop this farce, declaring that it is not funny. In response, a boiled crayfish flies into his face, angering him even more. Losing his patience, he lets out a scream, ordering all the guests to stop their nonsense. At the sound of his voice, the walls of the hall shake and the cutlery begins to tremble. Hank notes that it felt like there was some kind of earthquake and notes that the cutlery began to behave rather unusually. However, after a second, everything returns to normal and a deathly silence reigns in the hall. He gets up and says that if the guests don't want to eat, then so be it and orders everyone to the conference room, while Hank notes that his grandfather is incredibly cool. All participants come to the conference room and sit down, not daring to say anything. Grandpa Winston menacingly asks who started this farce and if anyone wants to explain to him what happened. The relative gets up and says that it's all Bruce's fault, to which she replies that it was Stan who poured hot water on him first. Grandpa Winston asks Stan how to understand this. Stan makes a cowardly excuse by stating that the waiter was walking by and tripped over his foot, claiming that it was an accident. The boy again says that he saw Stan deliberately trip the waitress, to which he again looks at her menacingly, threatening her with violence. The boy's mom tells Stan to watch his words and asks him if he really thinks his brother would want to slander him. Betty says that the dish initially flew at Hank, but he managed to dodge, so it flew into another person. Everyone present begins to whisper that Stan has despised Hank before, so this is not surprising, additionally noting that Stan has no conscience at all. Stan, gritting his teeth, cannot believe his failure and is surprised at how this child was able to see him. Stan's father sternly orders him to apologize to his brother now. Stan, with a pompous face, tells his father that he will not ask for forgiveness from a disabled person, adding that in any case Ragnar will be the next head of the clan, so he need not be afraid of anyone. 
Everyone is shocked by such bold words and everyone again begins to whisper about why such questions are a foregone conclusion. Those present mentally note that if Stan had the nerve to say that out loud, then maybe they should reconsider who they should vote for. Ragnar slams the table menacingly, calling his son a complete idiot. He loudly declares that the affairs of Stan's future successor do not concern him and orders him to immediately apologize to Hank. Frightened by his father's anger, Stan immediately apologizes to Hank, assuring that he did not do it on purpose. However, in response, Dally only silently sways, and Betty approaches him with curiosity to see if he has dozed off. Realizing that this is exactly what happened, she lightly hits him on the shoulder, asking him to finally wake up. Hank smiles and gives Stan a friendly wave, saying that he has already forgotten about this incident. After a second, he is lost in thought about what ultimately happened in the dining room. Looking at Grandpa Winston, he wonders what secrets he might be hiding. Grandfather says that it is normal for two brothers to fight with each other, suggesting that they forget about it for now and move on to electing a new head of the clan, adding that everyone will make their choice on a fair and impartial basis, since everyone in this family is an equal member of it. He menacingly tells Ragnar that there can be no bribery of votes and asks him whether he understood him well, to which Ragnar nervously replies that he did not bribe anyone and his son is talking some kind of nonsense. He snaps his fingers and his assistant enters the room, greeting everyone present. She introduces herself by the name Matilda, saying that she is the personal secretary of the current head of the clan and offers to start working with the young talents of the Dolly family. She says she can now read information about each candidate one by one, adding that this information is provided by the candidates themselves and is carefully checked by company employees for false or fraudulent statements. Matilda begins to read the list, and the first candidate turns out to be Bruce Daly, who three years ago took 36th place in the family ranking and received 10 million yuan for development, and currently has a middle and high-class hotel, a gym, a bath and wellness center, and his annual net profit is 2 million yuan, with revenue up 17% from three years ago. She asks Bruce to bring his plan for developing his businesses. Bruce Daly stands up and says he plans to open a private club next year. He begins to outline the details of his plan, while Hank reflects that this man is not so simple and now he understands why he was not afraid of Stan. Grandfather Winston, having listened carefully to the report, says that he likes what he heard and asks everyone to support Bruce, to which he replies that he could not have done it without everyone's support. Stan muses in his mind that Bruce is yet another worthless guy who he will deal with as soon as his father becomes the head of the clan. Matilda says that the next candidate who took first place three years ago is Clara, who currently has a five-star hotel, the best private club and shopping center with an annual profit of $75 million and a profitability rate five times higher than the starting one. Clara also stands up and asks everyone to listen to her short version of her plans for the future. Other participants admiringly note that no one expected anything less from such a beautiful and intelligent woman and share their guesses about what place Clara will take this time. Grandpa Winston tells Clara that she did a very good job and met all his expectations. Meanwhile, Matilda moves on to the 19th candidate, who turns out to be Stan. According to Matilda, Stan took 30th place three years ago and received $20 million for development and currently has a cosmetology clinic one streaming company, and a courier service with a three-year net profit of $380 million. Everyone is surprised by such shocking figures, expressing disbelief in the information Stan provided. Stan mentally calls everyone present a bunch of idiots, telling himself that thanks to the fact that he completely devoted himself to entrepreneurship, he was able to accumulate $80 million. He also adds that his father gave him $300 million, thanks to which he received such a stunning result when he compiled the financial report for this year. Grandfather does not notice any catch and offers to greet Stan with applause. Hank just coughs, not wanting to take part in this circus. Stan looks angrily at Hank and loudly asks him what he is laughing at. He says that he couldn't imagine it, arrogantly asking Hank if he really decided that he was better than him, adding that three years ago Hank was at financial rock bottom. Tactlessly addressing Matilda, he demands that she immediately read Hank Daly's financial report. Matilda says that three years ago, Hank came in last place and had dozens of investments without profit, and his net loss was $30 million, 
resulting in him being nicknamed the prodigal son. Betty listens to this report and lets out a short laugh, covering herself with her hand. Stan demands that Matilda tell her how much money Hank lost this year, adding that Hank remembers to himself before he starts laughing at him. Matilda says Hank currently has one three-star hotel downtown and ten restaurants, including the barbecue restaurant, which is particularly popular and had revenue of $2 million in the first quarter. Stan says that almost everyone present earns $8 million per quarter, so such figures do not surprise him, adding that with so many open points, a profit of $2 million is another loss. Matilda continues her report by saying that Hank also has a television company, which has its own popular girl group, with which he produced a blockbuster film, which made $900 million in profits in the first quarter alone. Stan, not hearing the exact number, begins to laugh, saying that he knew that Hank was a real idiot. However, after a second, it dawns on him how crazy a profit Hank has, and he freezes in place in surprise. Everyone present looks at Hank in surprise amazed at such large numbers in such a short period of time. Stan angrily says that Hank has nothing to do with art and could not have made this film, suggesting that all this is false information, demanding that his financial statements be carefully checked again. Hank just shrugs indifferently and Stan says that it was a sign of agreement, after which he demands that Matilda continue reading Hank's fairy tales so that everyone can hear it. Also, according to Matilda, Hank collaborated with the world-famous Disney Amusement Park Company, and together with them, they built the only five-star amusement park in China. According to her, Hank Dolly owns 10% of the company's shares, and for six months, his dividends amounted to 3 billion yuan. Even the heads of the Dolly family, including Winston's grandfather, are impressed by such information. Hank lightheartedly tells Stan that he can look up all the information on the official website if he doesn't believe him. Stan, unable to believe his ears, asks Hank where he could have gotten so much money, confidently declaring that it was all his father's money. Hank says that Disney needed land to build an amusement park, and at that moment he purchased a wasteland for $10 million to house stray dogs, adding that if Stan still doesn't believe him, he can find out about it from them by asking about what he remembers, or a dog that chased him for several streets. Stan sinks into traumatic memories and a cold sweat breaks out on his back. Everyone present says that they are very surprised that such a weak-looking guy would be so smart. Grandpa thoughtfully scratches his beard and asks his secretary if Hank has anything else. Matilda says that Hank is one of the shareholders of the Tang Pharmaceutical Company, and according to data received from the company, he has a stake in it worth $30 billion. Such information makes all participants in the meeting drop their jaws to the floor in amazement. Grandfather bursts out with sincere laughter, saying that it could not have occurred to anyone that the most wasteful member of the family turned out to be the richest. After these words, there is deathly silence in the conference room. Betty leans against Hank and tells him that he shocked everyone so much that no one even dared to applaud. Grandpa Winston says that everyone already understands that Hank comes first. However, according to the conditions, those who have already earned a lot of money are excluded from the selection, providing an opportunity to those who really need it. Grandfather asks Hank if he agrees with this condition, to which he replies that he has no questions about the decision of the head of the family. Matilda solemnly concludes that Stan took first place among this year's candidates. Everyone congratulates Stan, but he mentally notes that he is not particularly pleased with this. Grandfather Winston says that in this case we can consider this competition over, suggesting that we move on to the search for a receiver. Hank, his father and Ragnar look at each other and wait for the procedure to begin. Stan solemnly reflects that selecting young talent is a piece of cake, while choosing a successor will be the highlight of the program, because the successor will not only be able to control the family assets and employees, but also cancel or change the rules of the clan at will. And therefore, in the moment his father becomes the successor, he will be able to throw out those he does not like and leave those who suit him. Grandpa Winston begins his speech by saying that their family started with an ordinary small workshop, and to achieve the current results he tried his best, adding that there is a limit to everything, and now he wants to live the rest of his life in peace. He adds that he is very lucky that there are so many talented people in their family who can choose a worthy candidate, concluding that he has only one requirement for a successor, 
which is morality, education, and a sense of beauty. With these words, he gestures to his assistant, ordering her to begin the procedure. Matilda says that the voting will be held in three rounds, and in the first round, the three people with the most votes will be chosen, after which she adds that in the second round, three people make speeches and collect votes, after which they move on to the final round. According to her, the person with the most votes in the third round becomes the new head of the clan. She adds that photographs with the names of the candidates are already shown on the screens. Grandpa Winston says that everyone can vote by clicking on the photo of the desired candidate, adding that if a person does not vote within 10 minutes, he will be considered to have abstained from voting. Matilda adds that voting is anonymous, so participants have no fear. Betty asks Hank if she can vote, adding that she is not a member of the clan, to which Hank replies that she will soon be part of it. Betty chuckles mischievously and tells Hank that in that case she will vote for him. After this, silence reigns in the conference room again and no one dares to vote first. Grandfather looks at his relatives and asks them why none of them vote, trying to find out whether they are motivated by fear or a desire to abstain from voting. Grandfather Winston's second son thinks about how to vote and plunges into memories. He recalls that Ragnar told him that they had the best relationship, adding that he knows how difficult it was for him abroad and offers money and the best plot in Kyoto in exchange for his support in the vote. After some time, he comes to his senses and clicks on the candidacy of Ragnar on his screen, after which other relatives follow his example. The third brother remembers how Ragnar offered him half of his foreign business in exchange for his support in the vote and also votes for him. After some time, Matilda says that voting time has come to an end, saying that now the results of the first round will be shown on the screen. After a few seconds, it turns out that 52 votes were cast for Ragnar, 31 for Hank's father, and one vote for Hank himself. Stan and Ragnar happily look at the results, believing that victory is already in their pocket. Stan bursts into arrogant laughter and loudly asks what kind of fool would vote for Hank Daly, saying that he is not an equal to the first two candidates, adding that his only advantage is his manners. He asks everyone how a cripple could be allowed to participate in the elections, adding that just because Hank earns a lot of money, this does not mean that everything is allowed to him. Betty says that Hank's health problems do not make him disabled, to which Stan says that now he understands who cast that one vote for Hank. Hank asks Betty if she voted for him, to which Betty says that she gave the vote to his father, but he didn't decide much because the gap between Hank's father and Ragnar Dali is too big. Matilda says that it's time to start the second stage of voting and asks who wants to start. Ragnar gets up and clears his throat and says that he will speak first. He says that he would like to first of all thank everyone for their support, adding that for all his merits and achievements, he is grateful to his family, with whom he walks side by side, achieving high results through teamwork, after which he says that more. Before the birth of their fifth brother, they worked together with their brothers to create their own business from scratch and went through many hardships to achieve today's results. Ragnar says that he still remembers that as a child, he never ate meat, and when he went to the butcher to get some crushed bones, he turned him out the door, adding that it was then that he swore to himself that his family would become much better, stronger, and he will do everything so that every member of the Dali family lives a good life. He continues his speech with hopes that their family will achieve even greater success under the leadership of a new head, regardless of whether it is him or someone else. Concluding his monologue, he says that this time he would recommend everyone to vote for Father Hank, since he is the youngest and most promising. Ragnar adds that he is no longer young and will not be able to devote himself entirely to work, while the fifth brother is now in the prime of his strength and will be able to lead the family to unprecedented success. Stan asks his father in a whisper why he encourages people to vote for his brother, adding that he should be the head of the clan. Ragnar turns to Stan and tells him that he doesn't understand anything about politics, angrily calling him an idiot. Hank notes that the fourth uncle acted very cunningly, focusing on the fact that he and his father worked hard even before Hank's father was born although in fact, at the time of the events described, he was only five, six years old, and he could not do anything help, however, due to the fact that most of the voters are the younger generation. They know nothing about everything that happened at that time. After Ragnar's speech, all participants begin voting again. 
As a result of the second vote, the number of votes for Ragnar increased, but for Hank's father, on the contrary, decreased. Grandpa Winston notes that the gap has widened greatly and asks his fifth son if he has anything to say. Hank's father stands up and tells Grandpa Winston that he has something to say. He says that compared to his brother, he is not as competent and smart, and he has no particular desire to lead his family. He adds that in connection with all of the above, he refuses to participate in the election campaign, and the whole room whispers in surprise about what this could mean. Grandpa Winston asks his fifth son if he wants to add anything else. Hank's father says that he is asking that all of his votes be given to his son Hank and that he be allowed to run for head of the clan. The grandfather fulfills his son's request and all the votes go to Hank Dolly. Other participants ask in surprise whether such changes are possible, noting, however, that age restrictions have not been written anywhere. Ragnar angrily asks his brother if he is really going to allow young people to compete with him to which he immediately replies that he sees nothing wrong with it. He adds that Hank may be inferior in age to most of those present here, but due to his potential, no one can compare with him. So he praises him not because he is his son, adding that everyone knows that six months ago, Hank was lying in a hospital bed and his life was in the balance and he knew that he had no way to do anything to recover, while Hank's father and his wife could only pray. He says that then they would do anything to help Hank, even if it threatened them with ruin, after which he adds that suddenly a miracle happened, and Hank not only recovered, but also began to earn money himself, and in just six months he made more money than most of the people here combined. Hank's father ends his speech by saying that from his point of view it was fate, adding that God gave his son a new life and made him transform, which means he trusts not only him, but also fate. Stan says that this all sounds suspiciously similar to cult motives, adding that no one can guarantee that tomorrow Hank will not get worse and die, leaving the clan without a master. Ragnar says that his attitude towards voting offends him because it forces him to compete with an unequal contender, after which he angrily declares that since he started this game, he will play it by his rules and transfers his votes to his son Stan. Stan is pleased to thank his father for being so generous to him. The rest of the relatives begin to be indignant at what happened, saying that everything is starting to look like some kind of children's booth. Grandfather, who is also not happy with this situation, says that once the final counting of votes begins, no matter what the result is, nothing can be changed, and expresses the hope that no one will regret it later. Hank's father says that he is confident in his decision, to which Ragnar replies that he also has no reason to doubt it. Winston says that although Stan and Hank are too young to be the head of the clan, they both have limitless potential, and if one of them receives support from their elders, then they could be suitable for the role of head. Matilda says that in the second stage of voting the candidates were changed, so it starts again. Stan quickly stands up, saying that he will speak first. He turns to Hank and says that even though he is a well-mannered hard worker, he is nevertheless a cripple and will never be able to get rid of it adding that if the members of the clan chose as their leader a crippled man who goes by the nickname of the prodigal son, then this would put the entire Dolly family in an awkward position, while Stan is at least a healthy person and no one can compare with him in moral intelligence. He continues to dramatize, urging everyone to think for themselves and not choose a crippled person as the head of the clan, ensuring himself secret ridicule from other families. Relatives begin to whisper that Stan's words have some meaning, since Hank really is not the healthiest person and is unlikely to even be able to acquire an heir. With these words, votes for Stan continue to skyrocket. Stan looks angrily at Hank, mentally celebrating his victory, admitting to himself that he did not expect everything to turn out this way, but he was afraid to dream of being the head of the clan. He turns to Clara and mentally anticipates that as soon as he receives this post, he will change the rules and definitely marry her, adding that it's time for these crazy old man's traditions to go to the trash heap. Clara mentally admits that she doesn't know what to do and asks Hank to do something and justify the only vote she gave him. Grandpa turns to Hank and asks him if he has anything to say in response, but the main character replies that he has nothing to say. Stan says that there is no need to say anything, since the second stage of voting has already been completed, and adds that he is the embodiment of genius, beauty, strength, education, and wealth. 
He is already starting to celebrate his victory, saying that no one else will vote for Hank, which means his day has finally come. Matilda approaches Winston and says that some shocking news has leaked online, and Grandpa Winston asks to put it on the screen, saying that he really wants to watch it. Matilda switches the TV screen and the relatives are interested in what they want to show them this time. The TV shows a news report that a drunk young gentleman from a wealthy family has gone mad and beaten a man. In it, Stan kicks his grandfather, who sells watermelons, saying that his watermelons taste terrible and he won't pay a penny for them. With these words, with a satisfied face, he begins to shout as loud as possible that he and his father are tactless bastards. Stan, immediately changing his face in shock, asks himself whether he really did such things. Ragnar angrily asks where the video came from, demanding that the PR agency be contacted immediately. Relatives whisper anxiously that such behavior disgraces the Dolly family, noting that nevertheless black PR is also PR. Meanwhile, Betty appears on the videotape, deciding to go shopping in search of groceries. Stan walks up to Betty and slaps her on the buttocks, catching her off guard. He asks her where Hank went, and not waiting for an answer, says that if after the wedding he cannot satisfy her, she can always turn to him, adding that he will always be ready to please her. Relatives look in shock as Stan openly pesters his brother's fiance and cannot believe their eyes. Grandpa Winston doesn't say anything and just frowns seriously at Stan. Betty theatrically clings to Hank, saying that someone finally filmed it and posted it on the internet, wondering how she can now live with such shame. However, in her mind, she expresses the hope that the actor who was allegedly beaten by Hank in the image of Stan will now be fine, adding that if the real Stan had pestered her, she would have torn off his hands. Hank's father asks Ragnar how he can explain his son's behavior and asks what they were trying to achieve by doing so. Ragnar looks angrily at his son and demands an immediate explanation from him about what happened, to which he only plaintively squeezes out that he was set up, and this video is a fake. Ragnar demands that Stan stop talking nonsense and clean up everything he brewed himself. Stan screams furiously, asking Hank what the hell he's doing. Hank asks Stan what he means, adding that he doesn't see anyone on the screen other than Stan and his wife. Stan accuses Hank of setting this up to embarrass him in front of everyone, adding that Hank is an incredibly cruel and treacherous person. Hank says that Stan ordered the hitman and asks him if he doesn't think it's cruel enough. Everyone present is surprised by what they heard, saying that this simply cannot happen. Grandpa Winston looks at Stan sternly and asks him if what Hank said is true. Stan can't say anything in his own defense and only coughs slightly. He tells Hank that he just wanted to spare him the pain of having to move around. With these words, he grabs a chair and says that Hank tried to make sure that he would now die of shame in front of everyone. But now it's his turn to help Hank, adding that the Dolly family only needs one descendant which will be Stan. He jumps on the table in front of Hank and raises his hand to strike, ignoring his relatives' cries for him to stop doing this weird thing right away. Hank gives Stan a good swing, then grabs his cane, pressing a small button on it. The illusion dissipates and the cane transforms into a sword cutting through metal. Hank quickly draws his weapon and makes one lightning fast and sweeping strike. Stan discovers that his chair instantly splits into two parts without reaching the target of the blow. Hank looks at Stan menacingly and says that, unfortunately for him, he will not remain the only heir. With that, he lands a few more blows on Stan's clothes. Stan's outerwear is shredded, revealing his suspicious tattoo on his chest. Everyone present notes that this tattoo is very similar to the fascist symbols that were used in the Second World War, adding that such a worldview is inappropriate for the future head of the clan. Stan, unable to say anything in his own defense, falls to the ground, bowing his head. Hank recalls that as soon as he scanned Stan's body, he noticed this tattoo on his body, adding that Stan should not blame him for such treatment since he was the one who started this mess in the first place. Grandpa Winston orders Stan to be taken away and placed under surveillance, adding that they will only talk once the investigation is complete. Winston turns to Hank, but he wants to immediately clarify that in fact he feels much better, but due to the current circumstances, he had to pretend to be sick in order to confuse some people, adding that he had no intention of deliberately deceiving his family and friends, therefore, he asks for forgiveness for the misunderstanding. All the other relatives happily say that they have never seen him so healthy and energetic. Clara is happy about what happened, saying that Hank Dolly is an incredibly cool person. 
Grandpa Winston says he didn't think things would turn out this way, adding that they still need to finish what they started and complete the third round of voting. Matilda says that it is time to hold the last round of voting, the results of which will become the final result of the entire vote. Relatives say that Stan behaved like a real bastard, adding that everything was not resolved in the best way, but it would have been much worse if Stan's character and worldview had been found out before he was elected as the new head. The vote count ends and Hank has the most votes. Matilda announces to Hank that as of today he is the new head of the clan. In honor of the successful election of the new head of the clan, fireworks are heard closer to night. During the ceremony, Grandpa Winston calls Hank to his place for an important conversation. Hank tells Grandpa Winston that unfortunately he will not be able to become the head of the clan, since he is not as ambitious as a head should be, adding that he was embarrassed to refuse this post publicly. Grandfather says that this does not surprise him, since he assumed that this is exactly what would happen, adding that he has a good team of professionals around him who will help him. Grandpa Winston says that being the head of the clan could be good for Hank and would be an important stepping stone for his future growth. Hank says that this means more than what Grandpa Winston is talking about now, adding that he is just an ordinary spoiled child who is definitely not worthy of taking the place of the head of the clan. Winston says that because Hank has a system in his body that is different from that of ordinary people, he will not be able to live an ordinary life. Hank asks his grandfather in surprise how he knows about this system. Grandpa asks Hank if he was previously surprised that his body was so different from the body of ordinary people. Hank asks Grandpa Winston what he means by these words. Grandpa looks at Hank thoughtfully and says that it's time to finally tell him the whole truth. According to Winston's grandfather, six months ago at the Dolly residence, everyone tried unsuccessfully to cure Hank. One day he again became very worse and nothing helped him regain consciousness. Hank lay on the bed. The doctor said that there were only a few days left before his death. Grandfather Winston anxiously asked the doctors if there was really any way to help his dear grandson. Hank's father told his grandfather that they only had three days left to cure Hank. Grandpa Winston says that his illness is caused by the fact that they tried to poison Hank as a child, adding that their family cannot lose the smartest and strongest child. He vowed that he would not let Hank die and would find a way to cure him, even if it meant spending all the family's money. His assistant says that he has learned how to help his grandson, to which Winston demands that he immediately tell him about him. The assistant says that a doctor lives 3,000 kilometers from here who can help Hank recover, Winston says that they need to go to this doctor immediately. After some time, Winston, accompanied by his assistant, goes to the doctor's location by helicopter. Landing in the dense jungle, they find themselves next to a large tent. The shaman greets the guests with a mysterious grin, saying that he is very glad to see them. Winston tells his assistant that the man is more of a wizard than a doctor, to which his assistant says that either way it will either help Hank or he will die. Grandpa Winston begins to beat his assistant, saying that he is behaving worse than a monkey. The shaman asks Winston why he can't even greet him normally. Winston asks the shaman if he can save his boy, adding that if he does this, he will give him all his property. The shaman says that Hank can be saved in any case, but he will not be able to escape his fate. Grandfather asks the shaman what kind of fate is in store for Hank, to which he replies that a terrible one awaits him, destined for him by God. He asks Grandpa if he has changed his mind, adding that it might be better for Hank if he died less painfully. Winston says his decision remains unchanged and he has no other options. Grandpa lays Hank down next to the shaman, who notes that the poor guy is on his last legs. The shaman tells Winston that changing fate is a forbidden technique that can lead to changes in the world and asks him not to regret his decision in the future, to which he replies that he will not regret anything. The shaman begins the healing procedure by materializing a shiny sphere in his hands. The shaman quietly tells Hank that he is afraid for the future of his family. He touches Hank, imbuing his body with an otherworldly glow. The bed also begins to glow and Winston and his assistant look around in surprise. Upon closer inspection, they discover that they are enveloped in a ball of mysterious light. Meanwhile, Hank's skin begins to take on an unnatural golden hue. The shaman raises his hand with bracelets and tells Hank to accept his new destiny. Otherworldly pulsations begin to emanate from the hut, spreading for many kilometers. After a few seconds, these waves envelop the entire planet. Suddenly, Grandpa Winston sees an illusion of Hank being killed by a terrible demon. 
Lightning strikes the tent, punching a large hole in it. Winston clears his throat from the smoke and asks his assistant if everything is okay. He suddenly notices that his body has changed. He has become much stronger and stronger. Looking at his assistant, he is surprised that he too has changed, acquiring very bizarre facial features. The assistant looks at Hank and notes that his complexion has become much better and his pulse has returned to normal, happily concluding that the young master has been saved. Grandfather says that this is great news and asks the assistant where the doctor is now, adding that he wants to thank him. However, upon closer examination, they do not reveal any traces of the presence of a shaman. Grandfather recalls the words of a shaman he recently heard that changes in fate lead to irreversible consequences and thinks about how much the world has changed. He again remembers the illusion killing Hank and says that he will not let this happen. Grandfather ends his story by saying that in this way he saved Hank by physically changing himself and this world, adding that he is glad that he is still healthy and nothing has affected his fate. Hank asks Winston if anyone else knows that this world has changed, adding that this world must be different from the past. Winston says that many things here seem the same as in the past, but it is not as if they are in a parallel universe, adding that after that day he was greatly amazed, asking people about the changes and each time receiving the same answer that nothing changed. Winston says that everything that is happening now is confirmed by the wizard's prophecy, adding that he even tried to find him, but a long search did not bring results, which means Hank should become much stronger than now. Hank says that he can't process it all yet and he needs time to realize what's happening. Grandpa Winston says he will look for the old man, but now Hank can look at his family more easily. Hank leaves his grandfather's office and presses against the door, quietly saying that this is all mind-boggling. He says that he does not believe in this nonsense, adding that his loved ones should not die in front of his eyes. He remembers his wife and wonders if there really is no way to save himself and his beloved daughter-in-law. Lost in his thoughts, Hank does not notice Betty, who approaches him and says that everyone is waiting for him to start the banquet. Hank stares at Betty and she asks him why he is looking at her like that. Hank doesn't answer her and walks over to her, hugging her tightly behind her back. Betty asks Hank why he is hugging her saying that someone might see them. Hank is silent for a while, after which he tells his fiancée that he doesn't want her to die, to which she responds in surprise that everything is fine with her now, and if suddenly something happens, then she believes that Hank will definitely save her. Hank says that he will definitely save her and everyone else, to which Betty replies that she doesn't understand what he's talking about, but will still trust him. Hank grabs his beloved's hand and says that they need to rush to the banquet, to which Betty says that Hank's nerves seem to be off today. Hank wonders why he is acting so strangely, but quickly comes to the conclusion that he needs to become stronger and not waste time. He successfully hosts the banquet with Betty, but his thoughts remain riveted on what his grandfather told him. The main character decides that from today the real competition with fate for the right to life begins, this evening, Hank performs another system update, but this time his indicators only increase by one. Hank irritably says that in order to become better, he will have to spend more money, but this only makes upgrading more difficult. He remembers his grandfather's words that now that his enemies have learned that he is alive, they will try to kill him, so he must not only destroy the threat, he must escape from the clutches of fate. Hank asks his grandfather with interest about who wanted to poison him as a child. Grandfather Winston replies that he was unable to find a specific customer, but over the years of searching, he managed to find several families that could be involved. The first suspect from the grandfather's point of view may be the High House Company, which is one of the main manufacturers of technological prosthetics in the Southwest, adding that the main element in these prostheses was daguerre gold, which was supplied by the Dolly family, but after several loud statements by employees of this company, they stop supplying this valuable resource. Another suspect could be an organization called the Ancient Gods, which wanted to open the graves of the Dolly family's ancestors, but was stopped by people hired by Grandpa Winston. He shrugs, saying that they have many enemies that he can't even remember right away. Grandpa Winston says that at least they have a list of opponents, which means they will most likely cope with them. He adds that at the right moment the threat will be destroyed and family grievances will sooner or later be forgotten. 
Hank asks Winston how he knows that there is a special system in his body. Winston says that he realized this by looking at other people, adding that even with him there were significant changes, but all this did not come easily. Hank understands what Grandpa Winston is getting at and says that everything will have to be paid for. He thinks that everything that is happening around him now is beyond his understanding. A lot of time passes behind these thoughts, and the sun's rays spill onto the main estate of the Dolly family. Hank gets dressed and leaves his room greeting his parents. Hank's parents ask him how he is feeling, surprised that they slept for an unusually long time this time. Hank hugs his parents and tells them that he loves them very much. Hank's mom says she's very happy to hear this, adding that she never doubted it. Hank's father asks him if he would like to have breakfast, saying that he has to go to his first family meeting today. Hank tells his parents that he is no longer a sick boy who was left out in the cold and is completely confident in his future. He walks down the corridor, entering a large hall, and takes the place of the head of the clan. Everyone greets Hank, calling him Patriarch, to which he says that he is too young for this, and asks from now on to call him Lord. Luo enters the hall, respectfully greeting all participants in the meeting. She introduces herself, saying that she is the young Lord's secretary and asks for forgiveness for any mistakes. Hank says that he also just took office and invites Luo to study with him. Luo says that she will now tell the young master and everyone present about the state of affairs of state assets and the distribution of various industries in the family. She says the Dolly clan currently has 189 enterprises and 3,000 assets, including textiles, real estate, electronics, sports, and medicine, among other fields across the country. Luo adds that the clan also has 78 mansions, three cruise ships, five private jets, 10 helicopters, and 400 luxury cars. Luo says that all of the above on the territory of the Dolly clan is private property, and now Hank can use all of it at any time to which Hank reflects that Winston's grandfather clearly wants him to enjoy life. All participants are surprised by such privileges, noting that the place of the patriarch of the family is not in vain so coveted. Hank says that if they have such assets, then they can take a cruise ship for the clan and go on a trip. All participants joyfully welcome this decision, honoring the young master. Hank says that all this must come with one condition— which is that everyone must occupy their niche and not create any delays with the law, adding that they must also increase the education of the people of the capital, after which he says that, unlike his grandfather, he has no need to earn as much money as possible, so he will focus on doing as many good things as possible. Hank also adds that any member of the clan who is caught breaking the law will be immediately disabled. Grandfather observes the meeting and Matilda asks him if he would like to go down and accept a new member of the clan, to which he replies that now that Hank has become the head, he should be more reasonable and careful. He adds that he will help him from the shadows so that together they can solve the crisis. The meeting ends and the participants go about their business. One of the few left alone with Hank is Ragnar. He gets up to leave, but Hank asks him if he wants to tell him anything. Ragnar says that he may seem strange, but from his point of view, a party on a cruise ship is a hasty decision. Hank says that he will listen to his words and he can make his own suggestions, after which he asks Ragnar to take him to Stan. Ragnar says that he has no right to advise anything since Hank is much smarter than him, to which Hank tells Ragnar to behave more confidently. After some time, Ragnar leads Hank to the door of Stan's room. He adds that Stan is sitting in it and is now waiting for the end of his days. Hank opens the doors and goes into Stan's room. The main character sits down in a chair opposite his cousin and looks at him closely. Stan looks up and asks Hank if he was there to laugh. He doesn't have time to finish when he sees something incredibly shocking and jumps up in his chair. He watches in horror as his own copy sits in front of him, which is indistinguishable from the original. Stan asks his double who he is, to which he tells him that his name is Stan, and he is his double. He adds that today he is going to rob a bank, blow up 20 cars, and take 50 hostages. Stan talks about who he thinks will be shot today. Stan says that Hank should just give him the deadly poison because nothing compares to doing something like that to him. Hank, without leaving the image of Stan, tells him that he sent him killers, so there is no question of any help for him. Stan says he only ordered the killer to cut off Hank's legs, and if he hadn't done it, he wouldn't have paid him. Hank angrily swings at Stan, saying that now he will do the same to him, to which Stan says that this will not happen again, since now Hank is the patriarch, 
and he will never oppose him. Hank says that he knew from the very beginning that Stan had a very weak character. He regains his appearance, saying that the situation looked very funny, adding that this time he will spare Stan. Stan thanks Hank warmly, after which he asks him what happened to that group of killers. Stan replies that this is not a special group, but just a bunch of poor people called a special squad, who are ready to take on any job related to dirty money. Hank remembers that several people invaded their family that day, which ruined their plan, and assumes that he will need to deal with one, and then he can destroy the rest. He takes Stan with him and gets into the car for a drive around the city. He asks his driver to stop near the hangars and gets out of the car. Stan approaches him, after which Hank asks him if this is the squad's headquarters, to which he replies that this is where they are. A man runs up to Hank, greeting him and saying that they knew he was coming and immediately sent security. The man says that everyone calls him a multilingual for his talent to speak several languages at the same time, expressing the hope that this will not scare Hank. He adds that he was one of those who wanted to kill him on Stan's orders. Stan hits the polyglot with force, telling him that he is completely out of his mind. Hank moves on while Stan continues to beat out the bad temper and obnoxious killer. Having entered the hangar, he encounters several killers, each of whom has supernatural talents and a unique appearance. A woman with a snake body crawls up to Hank and says that he looks pretty good, which means he will taste very good. She starts laughing, unbraiding her hair, adding that she hasn't warmed up in a while. A second later, she completely turns into a snake and says that if you look closely at Hank, he has really thin skin and tender meat, which means it would be a big mistake to just swallow him. Hank says that the girl inspires fear without any doubt, but fortunately for him, she herself came within striking distance of him. With these words, he takes out his sword and strikes her in the face, leaving a minor wound. The snake screams in pain, surprised that its defenses were broken. A man with stone hands attacks Hank, saying that Hank is clearly tired of life if he behaves so impolitely. The fight is interrupted by Politong, saying that they need to stop immediately for the sake of him and the young master. The man stops and asks the polyglot which young master he is talking about. The man says that they may not believe him, but Hank is their boss from this day forward. The killers ask the polyglot in surprise if he is talking nonsense and their leader appears from the shadows. The men with animalistic features ask Hank where he came from, adding that first he needs to defeat their real master. The stone-handed man and the snake woman happily welcome this decision. The polyglot says that they should not dare to be rude, adding that if they offend the young master, then in the future I will greatly regret it. Hank says that he does not want to solve all matters by force and invites them to listen to him first. He adds that he is well aware that they have tricks up their sleeves and won't listen to a little boy like him, before adding that he does, however, have something they don't. Hank says that he is incredibly rich, emphasizing that they have no idea how big his fortune is. The killers are not impressed by this kind of bravado, and they recommend that he leave while he is still alive. The gang leader says that anything less than a million is not money for them, and advises him not to push his luck. With these words, he turns into an anthropomorphic wolf, and says that if he doesn't get out of here, he will tear him to shreds. One of the killers suggests that the leader take his time and listen to him first. The leader angrily waves away his henchmen, saying that he is in charge here and no one can buy him for money. Other members of the squad express dissatisfaction with such absurd behavior of the leader of the mercenary squad and decide to listen to Hank's proposal. Hank chuckles and gives the command to his assistants to bring money to the hangar. With these words, a van drives into the hangar, an enormous amount of money pouring out of the doors. The snake girl and the stone man joyfully look at such wealth asking in surprise whether all this really belongs to them now. Hank says that if they all become more respectful to him, then all this finance will go to them, and then asks if they agree to the deal. The mercenary leader decides that he will act more cunningly and simply kill Hank, after which he can take the money. He delivers a powerful blow with his clawed paw, but Hank easily dodges it by moving back. Hank picks up his cane and delivers a powerful blow to the leader in the dog's face. The leader stops briefly to plaintively accuse Hank of animal cruelty. However, a second later he shouts that he will not forgive him for such an insult and again rushes to attack Hank. Stan and the polyglot screams for someone to stop this mad dog, while Stan mentally notes that the leader of the killers should be more careful. The snake girl suddenly goes over to Hank's side and binds the werewolf's legs with her tail. 
She drops him to the ground and then says that Hank offers them much more than he does. The stone man attacks his former boss, saying that he is ready to give his life for a lot of money. With the words that he will answer for his rude words, he further strengthens his hands and hits the leader in the gut. He throws the werewolf into the air so that the other members of the squad can deal with him. The cowboy quickly takes out his revolver, taking good aim. He opens aimed fire, completely shooting off the ear of the rebellious mercenary leader. The pterodactyl man quickly flies up to the stunned werewolf. Saying that he himself will destroy him, the pterodactyl man hammers the werewolf into the stone floor with a powerful blow. The former leader lay on the ground, clearing his throat and calling his allies a group of traitors who dared to come against him. Looking up, he sees all the mercenaries standing next to Hank Dolly. Hank looks at him reproachfully and asks him if he's finally ready to talk. The werewolf decides not to give up and leaves a smokescreen behind him, saying that he, as a lone wolf, can handle them on his own. Stan falls to the ground in fear as the rest of the mercenary squad rushes to attack. Hank coughs from the smoke as the werewolf moves closer to him. The pterodactyl man says that he cannot find anyone in this smoke and decides to blow it out with his wings. With these words, he begins to energetically flap his wings, slowly dispersing the smoke. Suddenly, a huge piece of concrete flies towards him from the smoke. The mutant does not have time to dodge, and the concrete block knocks him out, dropping him to the ground. The stone man looks around, saying that throwing a smoke screen wasn't the stupidest idea. Suddenly, from the smoke, he receives a powerful blow to the stomach, losing his balance. The stone man falls to the ground, leaving a large crack due to his weight. He sits up coughing violently from his injuries and his inability to breathe properly in the smoke. The cowboy covers his face with his cloak and looks around carefully, holding his pistol at the ready. However, he fails to detect the werewolf in advance and approaches him unnoticed, his red eyes glowing. Hearing a rustle at the very last moment, the cowboy sharply turns his hand behind his back, aiming at the werewolf. He mentally tells himself that no one can escape his reaction and cocks the hammer of his revolver. The werewolf says that the smoke screen also has the effect of anesthesia and dizziness, adding that he is finished. With these words, he grabs the cowboy by the leg, preventing him from making a shot. He swings at his victim, telling everyone not to bury themselves, because he is still a true alpha. The snake girl clears her throat of smoke, loudly saying that she will kill the damn dog. However, in the smoke and heat of the battle, she does not notice how a cowboy flies in her direction, knocking her off her feet. Hank continues to cough from the acrid smoke, covering himself with a handkerchief. The werewolf approaches Hank and begins to laugh evilly, saying that he should have killed him as a child to reduce his troubles. He says that earlier in his childhood he suffered a lot as a werewolf, adding that he also had to fight for a foreign country. The werewolf tells Hank that he himself has the right to decide when Hank dies, adding that if he wants, he can kill him right now, get his money, and get rid of the obnoxious traitors. Hank does not answer the werewolf, and only gestures to express his disagreement with his position. The werewolf becomes enraged, charging at Hank, screaming that he must be suicidal for acting so arrogant. However, as soon as the werewolf's clawed paw almost overtakes Hank, he suddenly disappears into smoke. The werewolf screams in anger that he can still feel Hank and asks him how he could disappear right before his eyes. The day before these events, Stella presented Hank with updates to the bracelet, saying that she had now installed new covert scanning capabilities in it, causing pure delight on Hank's face. She adds that in addition to stealth, she added functions for copying characters from films, specifying that a character looks better the more data there is about it. Currently, Hank checks the energy meter and activates the projection mode. The smoke behind the werewolf suddenly begins to pierce beams of bright light. The werewolf turns back, saying that he senses a presence behind him. Looking closer, he observes with horror the silhouette of a huge creature standing right in front of him. The pterodactyl man clears his throat, saying that he was almost killed and flies into the air. He begins to flap his wings again, dispersing the smoke mess away. The mercenaries, seeing the creature standing in front of them, open their mouths in surprise and curse loudly. The creature standing in front of them turns out to be a giant monster with three eyes and a huge spear. The werewolf does not immediately realize what has happened and turns around, asking where this damned boy went. Seeing a giant monster in front of him, the werewolf also becomes speechless and freezes in place, his eyes bulging. The monster lets out an incredibly loud roar, shaking the ground with sound waves. 
The mercenaries grab their ears, saying that this sound will make their heads explode. The werewolf says in surprise that because of animal fear, he cannot even move his legs. The monster raises its spear and once again lets out a loud roar, letting the werewolf know that these are his last moments. The werewolf, tail between his legs, begins to quickly run away, screaming for help. After making sure that the werewolf is out of sight, Hank deactivates the device, returning to his human form. Hank says that this time it worked, but if he appears again, then this method may not be effective since it is only a projection of the image. The polyglot falls to his knees in front of Hank, saying that he is incredibly glad that he is alive, adding that he could not defeat this dog since he runs too fast, to which Hank replies that he understands everything. The stone man approaches Hank from behind and calls out to him, causing him to turn around. All the mercenaries say that they are ashamed that they could not protect him and bow their heads guiltily before him. Hank says they shouldn't worry, adding that they did a good job and should do better next time. The mercenaries happily dive into the money, glad that they can finally say goodbye to poverty. The polyglot falls to his knees again, saying that despite the fact that he only met him today, he did not deprive him of money, after which he says that he will serve him faithfully. The mercenaries continue to roll in the money, thanking Hank and claiming that the god of luck has finally descended on them. Hank looks at his potential comrades and smiles slightly. He sits down on a concrete block and asks them to introduce themselves and tell about their abilities. However, the mercenaries turn out to be too keen on enjoying their own wealth. Hank suddenly turns from mercy to anger and orders his new subordinates not to anger him. The mercenaries suddenly calm down, unanimously asking Hank for forgiveness. Hank annoyedly says that they should call him Young Master and be loyal to him, as well as immediately carry out all his instructions and orders, adding that if they are only interested in money, then he does not need such people. The polyglot, in his usual manner, falls to his knees in front of Hank and asks for Hank's forgiveness, saying that he wants to serve him and do his bidding, adding that none of them dare challenge him. The mercenaries mentally wonder why Hank was so angry at them over such a small thing. However, they all bow before Hank, again asking for forgiveness and saying that they will listen to his orders. Hank says that in that case they should pick up where they left off and asks who wants to introduce themselves first. The stone man introduces himself by the name Jonas, saying that he used to practice hardening key, and now he is able to strengthen his hands so much that they are in no way inferior in strength to metal. The cowboy introduces the name Arthur, adding that he does not have any special skills, but he can hear the steps of an ant a hundred meters away and hit her from this distance. Pterodactyl Man says his name is Morgan, and he used to perform in the circus with a pair of false wings, but one day he woke up with a pair of real ones. Hank says he suspects it all happened about six months ago. The mercenaries say that everything happened exactly as Hank described, adding that before that they did not have any abilities. Hank mentally notes that, based on his grandfather's story, some kind of glitch occurred six months ago, due to which they became superhumans. He turns to the snake girl and asks her what her name is. The girl introduces herself by the name Sasha, saying that she used to be a snake dancer, but now she has become a real snake girl. Hank notices a cut on Sasha's face and takes out the spray, treating her wound. A second later, Sasha's wound heals and she enthusiastically says that this spray is a real miracle. Hank throws this spray at her, saying that there should be no wounds on the girl's face, adding that she just saved him, so she deserves this treasure to which Sasha enthusiastically replies that she is very grateful to him. Their acquaintance is interrupted by a strong earthquake and our heroes, with the exception of Sasha, can barely stay on their feet. Meanwhile, on the lake under the force of this earthquake, ships begin to crash due to strong waves. The source of these waves is a huge monster that has been dozing until today at the bottom of the lake. The mercenaries say they don't remember earthquakes ever happening here. After some time, the tremors slowly subside and the mercenaries decide to find out what it was. Stan decides to check the news and asks Hank to take a look at what he just managed to find. He hands Hank the phone and he watches the live broadcast from the scene, which shows that abnormal waves have been recorded on Lake Sen and many ships have been wrecked. Hank says that Sand Lake is inland and wonders how this is possible, to which Stan replies that some kind of monster could be the cause. 
Hank distributes communications equipment to his new subordinates and orders them to quickly go there and reconnoiter the situation, simultaneously providing immediate assistance, to which the mercenaries immediately agree. After this, he turns to the polyglot, saying that he will need him here, and in the future he can become his trump card, which will allow him to recruit as many people with supernatural abilities as possible, to which he replies that he will do everything in the best possible way. Hank reflects that you can't achieve everything in this world by relying only on yourself, so a capable team can come in handy. Stan says that Hank is a very skilled manipulator, so he believes in his success. Hank says that he can't buy the mercenaries' loyalty, but a little kindness and caring will help him make friends with them, after which he tells Stan to stay here and wait for new information to emerge. Stan asks Hank what he should do, suggesting that he will entrust him with some task. Hank says that Stan understood everything correctly, since he has something special for him, which he will announce a little later. Meanwhile, ship passengers who have fallen into the water beg for help, floundering on the surface. They shout that most of them cannot swim and hope that someone will come to their aid. Rescuers say they only have two boats, but there are simply an incredible number of people in the water. One of the victims desperately raises her hand above the water, fearing that in just a few seconds she will go under the water. However, Morgan manages to grab the unfortunate woman, calming her down, saying that they will definitely help everyone in trouble. Meanwhile, Jonas grabs the tilted ship with his hands and turns it into the correct position. People in and around the court rejoice at their salvation, climbing onto the stern. Arthur goes to the water luggage and dips his listening device into it. He tells Sasha that he heard a human scream at a distance of 205 meters and a depth of 9 meters, after which Sasha immediately takes off his hoodie. She rushes into the water and easily finds the drowning man quickly approaching him and hugging him with her body. She floats up, giving the drowning man access to oxygen and telling him that he will be fine. She returns the child to the mother and she cordially thanks her, to which she replies that it's all nothing. The rescued passengers ask the mercenaries who they are, stating that they want to thank them. Sasha replies that their names are not so important, clarifying that they should thank Mr. Hank, who sent them here. The townspeople talk about how familiar this name is, remembering that this is the name of the new head of the Dolly family. The townspeople begin to celebrate Hank and his family, chanting his name joyfully. However, the solemn gratitude is interrupted by a new earthquake, which crashes huge waves onto the pier. Arthur listens and tells Morgan that there is definitely something at the depths of the lake, to which he incomprehensibly asks what he means. Arthur says that it sounds like something big, adding that this creature flutters and howls as if it is in unbearable pain. Sasha tells Arthur that she can dive to a depth of 1,000 meters and hold her breath for at least half an hour, but Arthur tells her to slow down a little. He adds that they must coordinate their actions with Mr. Hank and tries to contact him. Hank is talking with Arthur and is surprised at how a giant monster could end up in Lake Sen, to which Arthur replies that he does not know such details but the presence of a monster at the bottom does not raise any doubts in his mind. He says that Sasha can go underwater and scout the situation, asking Hank for permission to proceed, but Hank asks them to wait for his arrival, adding that he will arrive in a few minutes. After a short period of time, Hank reaches the dock and gets out of his car. The mercenaries greet him and Hank tells them that they all did a very good job. He says that he called for help, but before he can clarify, a motorcycle with two girls drives up to him. The girls turn out to be Stella and Betty, who greet Hank. Hank asks his fiancée why she decided to come, to which she replies that she heard that something very interesting was happening here. The main character affectionately asks Betty if she is sure that she wants to stay here, to which she replies with a smile that nothing will change her intentions. Hank introduces his bride to the mercenary squad, saying that her orders are in no way inferior to his own, after which Betty notes that Sasha's tail is very long and cute. Stella tells Hank that she has brought him special underwater goggles with a camera that can withstand pressure at depths of up to 5,000 meters, additionally equipped with a stereo scanning function. She adds that these glasses can transmit an image to another projection device in real time, and Hank says that this is exactly what he needed. Hank passes the glasses to Sasha, saying that only she can scout the situation adding that she must put her own safety above all else, and if there is serious danger, she must retreat. 
Sasha says that she understood everything perfectly and quickly dives into the water. Sasha turns on the flashlight and quickly goes into the depths. She sinks lower and lower, cutting through the darkness of the lake abyss with the light of a lantern. Arthur keeps in touch with Sasha, saying that she needs to dive another 150 meters. He adds that he doesn't hear anything further, so she will have to rely only on her own strength. Sasha notices air bubbles rising from the abyss and decides to study them in more detail. Suddenly, Sasha begins to shake violently due to new tremors. The tremors are felt even stronger on the surface, and everyone unanimously asks Sasha to return as quickly as possible. Sasha tells them that she is fine and can continue swimming. Hank is surprised that Sasha can talk underwater, adding that she is a snake, not a fish. Sasha says her tongue is extremely flexible, so she can make sounds with just the vibrations of her tongue, adding that this is an incredibly cool trait. All the men in the squad unanimously note that this is simply an excellent quality, but none of them dares to say it out loud. Betty, unfamiliar with the peculiarities of male nature, asks them why they all suddenly turned red, but does not receive a clear answer. Sasha reports that she has already dropped several hundred meters, but she still does not see anything. Stella tells Sasha that these glasses have a built-in bioscanning function, so as soon as something living gets into the radius, they will begin to make a characteristic sound. After a few seconds, Sasha's glasses begin to emit the described signals and she freezes in place. In front of her is a huge rock in front of which, however, the glasses emit the loudest signals. She launches a stereo scanning system and pierces the rock with sonar waves. Stella says that according to her fears, this is not a rock, but the very monster they were looking for. She displays an image saying that it was originally a rock, but this is just a cover. The scan completes, and Hank and the rest of the mercenaries are surprised by what they see. Looking closely, they notice a huge monster stuck between the rocks. Hank is out loud surprised at how such huge turtles can exist in this world. The turtle lets out a howl, and the coast is again covered by a wave of earthquakes. Sasha listens to Hank's conversations and is amazed at how such a huge turtle could end up at the bottom of the lake. Taking a closer look, she notices where the turtle's muzzle is and decides to swim closer. However, she is interrupted by new tremors, after which she has to dodge stones that have broken off from an underwater rock. The turtle pulls out its huge paws and tries to push off from the lake bottom. Sasha notes that it feels like this turtle was crushed by the rocks, and now it is trying to get out. Hank says that if this continues, the earthquakes will continue, so they need to calm the turtle down. Jonas suggests brute force will resolve the issue, but Morgan says that using violence against animals is unacceptable. Betty says that maybe they should talk to her and convince her that they can help her, to which Hank expresses doubt that the turtle can understand human speech. Sasha says that she can communicate with the turtle in the form of a snake, and Hank approves of this decision, wishing her luck. With these words, Sasha takes off his glasses and turns into a huge snake. She swims closer to the giant turtle, and it calms down briefly after noticing her. Sasha introduces herself and asks the turtle if she understands what she is talking about, the turtle looks at Sasha very carefully, however, without answering anything. Sasha sadly concludes that apparently a normal dialogue will not work out. However, suddenly the turtle hides its neck in an improvised shell and becomes silent for a while. A second later, a snake head on a long neck pokes out from there, greatly surprising Sasha. Hank is surprised that the turtle has two heads and suggests that it is something divine. The turtle begins to talk to Sasha, introducing himself as Xuan Wu, Sasha tells the turtle that he can finally understand her. Xuan Wu says that she once made an oath to the spirit of the sky, according to which she would stay here for a hundred thousand years. But now that the oath has expired, her body has become fused with the rocks, and she cannot get out. Sasha tells Hank that the turtle introduced himself as Xuan Wu, wondering that animals from ancient myths could exist in this world, after which Hank asks Sasha to tell her that in a few days they will find a way to get her out. Sasha tells Xuan Wu that her master asked her to be a little patient, adding that they will definitely get her out of this trap. Xuan Wu crawls into her shell, saying that she has already waited a hundred thousand years so she can wait a few more days. Hank says that now that the monster will not bother them for a while, Sasha can safely return, after which Jonas asks him how they can help the mythical turtle, to which Hank asks him how much an atomic bomb might cost. Betty says that Hank, in his typical manner, rushes from one extreme to another, adding that in this case, along with the mountain, 
most of the city will be destroyed. Hank approaches Stella with a question about whether she can do something less destructive, to which she sharply responds in the negative, adding that she would not even dare to begin work on such technologies. Hank says that he has no one else to turn to, to which she replies that there is only one place where they could help. Hank happily asks Stella to tell her where they need to go so that they don't waste a second. Stella turns her head and sadly replies that this place is her family's home. She adds that she is a member of a family of famous inventors called the Gao, which owns the High House Company. Hank says that on her resume she had a different last name, to which Stella says that it is her mother's last name. Hank says that this last name goes well with her name, adding that it is time for them to move forward. With that, they gather their things and head to Hank's car. Having infiltrated Gao's company, Hank notices that they are offering very expensive and high-tech prosthetics for sale. On their way, they encounter a man who joyfully realizes that he can finally feel his hand and feel touch. One of the managers approaches Hank and asks him if he also wants to buy a prosthesis. Noticing Stella, he changes his face and contemptuously says that he recognizes her, adding that this is the same girl who can only create children's toys, which is what earned her expulsion from the Gao family. Stella hesitates to answer him, but Hank gives him a menacing look. The manager continues to insult Stella, saying that at the last annual meeting, all the members of the Gao family presented their inventions, and only she brought some stupid bracelet that could only broadcast a picture. Jonas decides to stop the senseless flow of dirt from the pathetic manager's mouth and grabs him with his hand. He says that the manager has a simple task in providing services to Hank and orders him to immediately shut up before he goes to the next world. Hank orders him to take them to the company boss, adding that he is tired of his chatter, after which he threatens that if he dares to insult any of his people again, Hank will make him shut up forever. Jonas throws the manager to the ground, and Hank asks them to wait for him here, adding that he will go there with Stella. The manager looks up at him and, looking down, invites them to use the elevator. Hank heads to the 13th floor of the building, hearing loud metallic noises after the elevator doors open. He watches as a futuristic-looking device floats in the air thanks to jet technology. The AI assistant announces that the test of suit number 101 is about to begin and begins the countdown. After three seconds, the flamethrower releases a wave of flames onto the suit, melting it into a metallic slurry. Stella's brother and sister turn in her direction and wonder why she dared to come here, a year after she was expelled from the family. Hank turns to Stella and notes that her family doesn't seem particularly friendly, to which she replies that she's gotten used to it a long time ago. Hank apologizes to Stella, saying that if he hadn't asked her, she wouldn't have to listen to these taunts. An elderly man appears on their way, lighting a cigar and saying that he did not expect to meet Stella here. He asks Stella where she disappeared to, adding that everyone at school has already searched her. Stella calls the man father, but he cuts her off, irritably demanding not to call him that. According to him, she ran away from home without saying anything, thereby demonstrating her disrespect for him as a father. He adds that her bracelet is just a pathetic misunderstanding compared to her brother's work, to which Stella says nothing and only lowers her head, not looking up at her father. Hank decides it's time to take matters into his own hands and tries to cheer Stella up by gently patting her on the head. He approaches the man, saying that in fact it was he who wanted to meet him, and Stella simply showed him the way. Stella's father says that he knows who Hank is, since their families have been cooperating for a long time, and adds that he can only offer him marriage with his daughter, emphasizing that although she is not very capable, she is still part of the Gao family. Stella's brother and sister say that they will only be happy to increase the size of their family, but this marriage will cost Hank ten tons of rare gold, which their family has stopped supplying them. Stella irritably asks her relatives what kind of nonsense they are talking about. Hank says that he will not give such a valuable employee to anyone, but at the moment he has come to discuss more important matters, asking the elderly man if he has a quiet place where he can calmly discuss everything. Stella's father invites Hank into his office, ordering the others to wait outside. Stella asks Hank if she should still go with him, to which he replies that he will be fine and she doesn't have to worry. Hank and Uncle Gao enter the office, after which Uncle Gao decides to get comfortable by taking off his shoes. He puts his feet up on the table and invites Hank to discuss the matter that made Hank come here. 
Hank says that he would like to purchase a weapon that can level a mountain and asks if Uncle Gao has something similar. Stella's father says that such a task is only needed for something truly grandiose and warns Hank not to drag his family into this adventure, to which Hank replies that he has not even thought about it. Hank adds that he just wants to know if Uncle Gao has such a weapon, emphasizing that responsibility for the consequences will fall entirely on his shoulders. Stella's father grins and presses a special button on his cybernetic arm. He says that he has such a weapon, and he wanted to finish it many times, but each time he abandoned it halfway. The curtains in Uncle Gao's office open, and he continues the story, saying that he could not finish it only because he did not have a suitable source of energy. Hank examines the weapon closely, marveling at its size and supposed power. Uncle Gao says that this electromagnetic gun shoots compressed energy and also has incredible throughput, but the only drawback is the inadequately high energy consumption which prevents its use. Stella's father says that this weapon has been lying idle for a very long time, so if Hank can find a source of energy in sufficient volume, he will give it away for free. He adds that he has read many legends about a form of energy produced by a huge explosion and wandering through the stars, which, however, turned out to be impossible to find. Hank thinks about Uncle Gao's words and suddenly gets an idea. He abruptly jumps up from his chair and Uncle Gao looks at him questioningly, wondering what has him so alarmed. Hank clarifies the terms of the deal with Stella's father, asking whether he will definitely give him this gun for free if the conditions are met. Uncle Gao says that he said it loud and clear, adding that if he can suddenly find a suitable energy source, then he can come here at any time. Hank says that his fiancée is now sitting in the car, adding that he will now call her and show her something very interesting. After some time, Betty appears in the office and asks Hank why he called her. Hank introduces his fiancée to Stella's father, and Betty greets him respectfully. Stella's father greets Betty and asks Hank what he wanted to show him. However, glancing at Betty's neck, he freezes in place in surprise. He closely examines the same necklace, bought at auction for 100 million yuan, and comes to the conclusion that this could just serve as a source of energy. Hank confirms Stella's father's guesses, saying that there is absolutely nothing surprising in this. Uncle Gao drops his cigar and says in shock that this simply cannot happen. He sadly shouts to the whole office that the gods must be joking with him. He adds that he spent a huge amount of money and time searching, but did not find even a milligram. Uncle Gao says that the power of this necklace is enough to level all the mountains to the ground, and a grain of this crystal is enough to fly an airplane for 10,000 years. Betty asks those present whether wearing this necklace is dangerous for her life. Stella's father says that this energy is very stable and absolutely safe, adding that it can explode only under certain conditions that cannot be reproduced in everyday life, after which he says that with this he will be able to create not just a weapon, but a whole set of armor like Iron Man. In a fit of enthusiasm, he slams his hand on the table and tells Hank that he only needs one gram of this crystal, adding that he will pay any price for it. Hank says that his price is a sincere apology to Stella from her father and all her relatives, as well as love and support in the future. Uncle Gao wonders why Hank cares about Stella, adding that her inventions are just absurd nonsense. Hank says that Uncle Gao is very mistaken, adding that for him she is a real treasure. With these words, he turns into a copy of Stella's father, stunning the old man. Hank tells him that if he doesn't want to apologize, he'll have to make copies of him. Uncle Gao realizes that he doesn't have much choice and begins to laugh quietly. After a few seconds, he begins to laugh out loud and gives Hank his word that his request will be fulfilled. Meanwhile, Stella's brother and sister make fun of her inventions, saying that they are nothing new. They also add that Hank Dolly was previously considered the dregs of high society, after which they say that they complement each other perfectly. Stella's patience runs out and she punches her brother in the chin. The brother scatters curses, promising Stella that he will teach her a lesson. The conflict is interrupted by Stella's father, loudly ordering everyone to be silent. The brother immediately complains about Stella, saying that he just wanted to talk to her, and she attacked him with her fists. Stella turns and notices that her father is already standing behind her. Brother and sister Stella unanimously begin to lie, saying that she just attacked them, adding that all her inventions are garbage and Stella deserves only full exile. Stella proudly replies that she will not explain herself and she doesn't care how they treat her. 
However, instead of scolding Stella, her father kneels in front of her. He pauses and then says that he asks her for forgiveness. Stella does not understand what is happening here and is silent for some time, trying to comprehend what is happening. Stella's father says that all this happened because he was up to his neck in work and completely forgot that children should be treated absolutely equally and not compared by their skills. He adds that the blame for what is happening lies solely with him and sincerely asks for forgiveness from his daughter. Stella's brother and sister open their mouths in surprise, not believing their eyes. Stella turns her head back towards her father and sees Hank, who gestures to her that his father's apology is sincere. Emotions overwhelm Stella, and she looks away so as not to show her tears to anyone. Unable to bear it, Stella decides not to hide her real feelings and approaches her father, hugging him tightly. She tells him that everything is fine and she is not angry with him, to which her father responds that he was able to appreciate her invention, noting its genius and ordering the siblings to apologize to their sister. Stella's brother and sister are stubborn, arrogantly declaring that they would rather die than apologize to her. Stella, anticipating that this will happen, carefully activates her bracelet. At that moment, a huge demonic version of Uncle Gao appears in front of her brother and sister, who orders them to apologize to Stella now. Stella's relatives apologize to her, and her father laughs heartily, saying that she chose a very suitable image for this prank. With these words, he hugs her again, saying that she has done a very hard job, worthy of praise. Stella is happy that her conflict with her father is over, and she thanks him, smiling for the first time in a long time. Sometime later, Uncle Gao tries to remove a small stone from Betty's necklace. After a few minutes of painstaking work, he manages to get it out and solemnly raises it above his head. Betty falls dramatically and Hank catches her, asking what happened. She upsetly tells her future husband that she has never been so hurt by losing a hundred million, to which Hank says that only a small piece will be extracted. Meanwhile, Stella's father approaches the launcher, holding a charged crystal in his hands. He inserts the crystal into the slot to receive energy sources, activating it. The weapon begins to move and Uncle Gao says that everything is ready for testing. The uncle adjusts the dashboard, admitting to himself that his childhood dream is about to come true. Hank approaches Uncle Gao and asks him how they can test the power of this weapon. Uncle Gao replies that he has provided for everything and pushes the walls of the testing room apart. The walls move completely apart and the cannon is in an ideal position to shoot at the rock. Uncle Gao says that he specifically bought this mountain to test the power of his weapons. He notes that other energy sources were only enough to produce minor scratches, inferior to even an ordinary grenade, but now they will be able to experience the full potential of this weapon. Hank smiles at Uncle Gao and says that he is looking forward to seeing the results of the test. Uncle Gao orders everyone to wear glasses so as not to damage their glasses from the bright light. The AI weapon assistant begins a countdown until the safety is removed and the full energy charge is accumulated. Once the countdown ends, Uncle Gao presses the red button, initiating the shooting procedure. A powerful energy shot cuts through the air and reaches the target in a split second. Once it hits a mountain, it instantly dissipates, leaving no visible damage. All test participants peer at the mountain, trying to understand what happened. Hank disappointedly says that he is extremely dissatisfied with the result, to which Uncle Gao annoyedly says that the problem cannot be in the weapon suggesting that the coke that Hank bought was a fake. Suddenly, the mountain begins to shake violently, making a loud noise. Hank and Uncle Gao fall silent after hearing a loud crash and peer intently at the mountain once more. Rays of light begin to ooze from the cracks in the mountain, and Uncle Gao loudly commands everyone to quickly put their glasses back on. A split second later, there is an incredibly bright flash, followed by an explosion. Hank and Uncle watch the explosion of unprecedented power and notice that the mountain was completely destroyed. As soon as the smoke clears, everyone looks at the flat wasteland in the place where a minute ago there was a mountain. Uncle Gao falls to his knees in front of his creation and says that now that he has finally completed this project, he can die without regretting anything. Hank says that the result of the research is simply magnificent, adding that now they will need to deliver the cannon to the lake. Uncle Gao says that it is not so simple, since such a structure will be difficult to deliver to the bottom of the lake, adding that only he can control it. Hank asks Uncle Gao what they should do, to which he replies that he needs several days to build the submarine and transport it, emphasizing that it will cost a lot of money. 
Hank says that he is ready to cover all of Uncle Gao's expenses if he completes this submarine on time. Stella's father asks her to stay, saying that he will really need her help, to which she happily agrees. Meanwhile, Hank takes the elevator downstairs to check on his subordinates left on the first floor. He approaches Jonas and Arthur, telling them to stand here like a rock and not let anyone in. Jonas replies that since they started working for the young master, they have been trying to be as competent as possible. Arthur says that they are looking forward to new orders from Hank, adding that they are hoping for the most serious and important assignments. Hank says that they shouldn't worry, as he will only give worthy tasks, adding that while they are here, they can choose the equipment they need. Suddenly, his attention is attracted by a noise a few meters away from him. He turns his head to the side and notices the familiar silhouette of a girl with whom the company manager is talking. The same girl who previously tried to rob Hank demands that she have a new arm installed, but the manager says that she does not have money even for the cheapest components. She grabs him by the shirt and says that if he does not agree to help her, then she will be forced to take the implants by force. Hank recognizes her and shouts that this is the same girl who tried to kill him not so long ago. The girl, hearing a familiar voice, turns her head and looks at Hank, twisting in surprise and rage. She tells Hank that she is only in this position because of him. With these words, she points at him with the finger of her remaining hand, saying that for this, she is obliged to finish him off. Hank asks her in surprise about how he offended her, adding that she almost killed him, but he did not take revenge on her or even pursue her. However, these words do not have the desired effect on the girl, overcome by despair, and she aims a handheld rocket launcher at him. Jonas and Arthur cover Hank, asking him to urgently take cover, adding that this cybernetic girl has many built-in weapons. However, instead of a shot, there is a misfire and the girl irritably says that her systems are too damaged. Hank breathes a sigh of relief, admitting to the girl that she scared him to death. With these words, he orders Jonas and Arthur to capture this girl alive. The girl unsheathes her energy blade and says that she will never let anyone live. Suddenly, the front door of the Supreme House Company is blown open by the force of a powerful blow. Following the door, a cybernetic thief jumps out into the street, doing a somersault to soften her fall. She gets to her feet and begins to quickly run away, saying that Hank Dolly will never be able to catch her. Jonas and Arthur chase the thief, ordering her to stop. Arthur quickly takes out his revolver and fires a well-aimed shot to slow down the fleeing girl. The bullet pierces the thief's body, but she does not slow down for a second. Arthur annoyedly declares that he will not be able to stop the metal girl with ordinary bullets. Jonas says that in this case they will have to deprive her of her arms and legs and calls Morgan, who is patrolling the streets, for help. Morgan flies up to Jonas and asks him what happened, to which Jonas replies that Hank instructed them to catch this girl alive, adding that she is a cyborg. Morgan says that he likes interesting puzzles and sets off in pursuit of the girl, trying to overtake her. In a few seconds, he catches up with her and asks her if she can do something to counter his speed. The girl gives Morgan an icy look and draws her blade, stunning her pursuer. The cyborg girl performs an acrobatic trick, combining it with a blow, but Morgan barely dodges it. He falls to the ground anyway, noting that the girl just nearly cut him in half. The girl stops, looking at her opponent, and Morgan tells her that she won't be able to escape anyway. The girl asks Morgan how he is going to stop her and rushes to attack. Thanks to his increased agility, Morgan once again dodges the cybernetic enemy's attack. Seizing the moment, he grabs her leg with his paw, saying that now she's definitely caught. He flies up into the air with her, shouting that he managed to immobilize her, and now she definitely won't be able to get out. The girl says with disgust that Morgan is a complete non-entity. With that, she activates a hidden launcher in her leg and fires a small projectile at Morgan. The projectile hits Morgan's weak spot, causing serious damage. 